The Midnight Club A Billionaire Romance by Michelle Love Narrated by Google Play Auto-Narrated Voice Michelle Audio Copyright 2023 BFA Publishing Note, all of Michelle Love's books have happy ever afters and no cheating. Blurb They are smoking hot, damaged, and forbidden. Meet the billionaires from the Midnight Club. These five naughty bad boys are attractive AF and are ready to devour you completely. They are pleasure seekers and they have one rule. To never let a woman come between them. This rule becomes harder and harder to keep when they meet the women who could change their lives. Despite the recent murder of Viola, Alex's fiance, the friends don't know that any woman they meet from now on could also be in terrible danger. Now they have to look for the killer, who will do everything to keep the Midnight Club exclusive. Does the threat come from outside, or is one of the Midnight Club members the vicious and ruthless killer? Dusk. She was tied to the chair, shivering and terrified, but determined not to show him how scared she was. He'd stripped her down to her underwear now, and his hands roamed freely over her skin. So soft, he cooed in a sing-song voice almost tender. She could almost believe him to be that caring, if it wasn't for the crossbow in his other hand. He saw her looking at him and grinned. He brought it up and leveled it at her. Point blank. Tell me you love me, he said tenderly, and she looked him straight in the eye. No. Her voice was strong. Defiant. He smiled. What a waste of such beauty, he said, and fired the bolt deep into her body. The pain was unimaginable. Venice, Italy, March 14th, a year previously. Alex Milland was the first to arrive in the floating city Galleria, and immediately he went to find Maceo. The art gallery may have been small, but its position overlooking the lagoon afforded wonderful views across the city. One whole wall was glass, the rest of the walls were painted a stark white. The effect was to make the works of art hanging on them stand out. It worked. Alex nodded to himself approvingly. He smiled to himself, as he noticed a few harassed-looking but very attractive assistants scuttling around. He wondered how many of them Maceo was screwing. Dumb question, he said to himself. Maceo would have screwed them all at their first interview. Maceo himself was in his office on the third floor. Alex knocked on the door and didn't wait for an answer. Maceo looked up and grinned. Alex, how good to see you. He got up and the two men bear hugged. Maceo, his green eyes a contrast to his dark curls and swarthy skin, studied his friend. How are you? Really? Alex sighed inwardly. He would be getting this question a lot today. I'm fine, Maceo. It's been months since Viola died, and not that I will ever get over it, but I have to try and function. So I need this. I need to celebrate something good. The place looks incredible. Maceo nodded, grinning. Humility wasn't in Maceo's playbook. Thanks, Alex. I admit, it does look spectacular. And you should see who we have exhibiting at the moment. He rattled off a few names, and Alex was impressed. Some of the biggest names in modern art, he had to admire Maceo's work ethic. He doubted anyone said no to the young man in front of him. Young man. Alex shook his head, smiling. He and Maceo were the exact same age. Alex just felt like the granddad of their group. The club. The Midnight Club. In truth, he had always considered himself the oldest of them, except for maybe Seth. But then again, he and Seth were as close as twins. Maceo was the young puppy of the group, passionate, confident, a visionary. Maceo gathered up a pile of papers and yelled, Lucia! A gorgeous blonde girl walked in and Alex smiled at her. She nodded back, friendly but professional. You have an intercom, Maceo. Don't scream at me, she snapped at Maceo who grinned unrepentantly. She took the papers from him, and as she was walking away, she looked back over her shoulder. 
I have to duck out for a couple of hours. Personal errand. Your other friends are waiting downstairs. Maceo hooted his delight. Good. Come, Alex, let's go see them. And he bore his friend away back down the main gallery. Orianthi Roy stood outside the airport arrivals feeling lost. Lucia was late, and Ori wondered if she should hail a cab. Italy was new to her, and the flight had tired her out. Now she felt discombobulated as people pushed past her, meeting their loved ones, loudly talking and yelling everywhere. This was meant to be a break. A quiet break, she muttered to herself, then felt a flood of relief as she saw Lucia waving at her. Her friend hugged her. Gosh, I'm sorry, Ori. The traffic was insane. Is that your case? Come on, I'll get you settled at home. Lucia drove them back into the city. Ori was surprised. I thought it was all canals. Lucia grinned. Not yet. We're still on the mainland. Listen, I have to tell you, my boss is having his grand gallery opening tonight, and so I have to work. But I have arranged for you to be on the guest list. Don't worry, it's an invite-only thing and won't go too late. But I would really like you to come. Damn it, Ori thought, but kept a smile on her face. Love to Luce. Listen, I can't thank you enough for letting me stay. I just needed to get away from all the craziness back home. Lucia looked at her with sympathy. I knew it was bad, Ori, but I have to tell you, you scared me when you called me the other night. What has Yannick done now? Ori felt sick at the mere mention of his name, Tyson Yannick III, congressman and her stepfather. Recently outed by the mainstream press as screwing a lot of his colleagues' wives, he had been forced to step down, but even now was working to retake his position. The fact that he was doing it by calling in favors, from people who were less than respectable, didn't matter to Tyson Yannick. He didn't care who he stepped on or who he destroyed. When he had married Ori's mother, Ori had been ten years old and in deep mourning for the father she had lost. Ori's mother, Catherine, after being disinherited from her father's newspaper fortune, had married the charming and handsome Tyson and had given birth to Ori's younger half-brother, A.J., soon after. A.J. was the best and only good thing about the marriage, as far as Ori was concerned. Almost as soon as Tyson had married her mother, he started to abuse Ori. At first it was insidious, the odd touch here and there that could be explained away. But on the night of her twelfth birthday, her mother was asleep when Tyson came into Ori's room. That night he raped her for the first time. That night he threatened the life of her mother, her baby brother, and Ori herself for the first time. It didn't stop until Ori left for college. She never returned home. Tyson persuaded her mother to write Ori out of her will, leaving her penniless. Determined not to take a penny from Tyson or touch the small amount of money her mother had left AJ, Ori worked in retail stores, bars, restaurants, diners, all to make enough to pay her rent and keep food on the table. At college she excelled and graduated from her arts program with honors. It was only when she started to be offered places in graduate programs that Tyson started to interfere again. Suddenly Ori would be turned down or rejected for places she had initially been offered unconditionally. Tyson broke into her apartment one night and told her that she would never be free of him, that she belonged to him. When her mother died five years ago, Ori had taken the still teenage AJ and moved away from New York, hiding out in Arizona and putting AJ through state school. Tyson had found them within weeks and, threatening Ori with arrest, had taken his son back to New York. Unwilling to leave AJ, Ori had reluctantly followed, knowing that as long as AJ was underage, Tyson had them. He raped her again on her 25th birthday, and this time he beat her too. Leaving her bleeding and bruised, he got dressed and grabbed her by the throat. Try and leave me, Ori. Just try. They won't be able to identify your body for weeks. But living in a world of terror can make the strongest person break. Ori quit her job and stayed at home for three months, not speaking to anyone. In the end, it took a concerned ex-co-worker to come find her and pull her out of the mire. Lucia had been over from Italy to see her parents, Italian immigrants to New York, 
and had been horrified to see Ori so depressed. She had told her then to come to Italy to escape. Three years after that final rape, when Tyson's scandal erupted and the press was all over their family, AJ checked himself into a facility for depression, and Ori called Lucia. It had been her one chance to escape Tyson. Now that she knew AJ was okay and that he was safe where he was, it was time for her to look out herself. Hey, Penny for them. We're here. Lucia nudged her, smiling. Lucia's apartment was huge. Her guest bedroom looked out over a canal and had a little balcony where Ori could sit and sketch or just sit and watch the day. She looked around the bedroom. Huge bed, vanity, ensuite bathroom. A small table and chair for her to work at. Ori smiled at Lucia gratefully. Luce, this is amazing, thank you. Lucia hugged her. I hoped you'd like it. Now, everything is handled. I've even taken the liberty of getting you a few clothes. Now, I know you hate dressing up, but believe me, try it just for an evening. I've bought you plenty of jeans and t-shirts, too. Ori laughed. I don't know how to thank you, Luce. I want you to relax. Be yourself. Don't worry about money or anything. I have too much as it is. Maceo's a shit, but he pays exceptionally well. Ori was curious about her friend's boss. Why is he a shit? Lucia chuckled, rolling her eyes. Don't get me wrong. I like him a lot, but he's a whore. A complete and utter man slut. He's already worked his way around my staff. You? Hell no. I've had my fill of Maceo's kind, I'm happy with my boyfriend. And get this, Maceo has four friends all gorgeous, all billionaires. All of them exactly like him, she told Ori about the Midnight Club and Ori laughed. Cavemen? Some of them. A couple of them are okay. Seth and Alex. Alex just lost his fiancé a few months ago. He's a wreck, but trying not to show it. Anyway you'll meet them tonight, no doubt. Lucia left her alone to rest, and Ori walked slowly around the room, feeling the soft white voile curtains and the firm mattress of the bed. She curled up on it now, phone in hand. AJ had messaged her. How's Italia, sis? She smiled. Beautiful, but wish you were here too. She checked the clock. A quarter of two. She wondered if AJ would be in one of his group meetings about now. She didn't hear back from him, so she assumed he was and closed her eyes. Just five minutes sleep. Within minutes she was dead to the world, as outside her window Venice basked in the early afternoon sun. Maceo Bartoli said a few words at the beginning of the reception. Then with a flourish, he cut the ribbon and the gallery was open. He felt a certain pride as his guests chattered excitedly and sought him out to ask questions. He especially enjoyed the attentions, of the beautiful women who drifted around the room. He glanced up and saw his four best friends huddled against the back wall, grinning at his easy flirtation with the guests. He managed to make his way over to them and gratefully took a glass of champagne from Seth, the tall Canadian. Dude, congratulations. A triumph. Maceo raised his glass. To us. Lysander, the brooding Argentinian fashion designer, nodded at some of the exhibits. Nice showing of South American art. Thank you, Maceo. Maceo grinned. If I could only persuade you to allow me to hang some your design sketches, Sander. Benoit, an elegant Frenchman, flicked his dark brown eyes across the room. An architect, he nodded approvingly at the gallery's design. This is a good space, Maceo. A very good space. Maceo grinned at him, his green eyes shining. Enough about that. He raised his glass. Happy birthday, my brothers. Later, he was talking to a local artist, assuring the man that he would champion Italian art above all else. The man, although talented, had awful dog breath, and so Maceo was edging away from him slowly. Finally, with a sigh of relief, he managed to escape to one of the balconies. He stepped out into the cool Venetian air and heaved a sigh of relief. 
He didn't see the young woman sitting on one of the stone plinths until she gave a small embarrassed cough. He turned to see a small brunette in a dark mauve cocktail dress. She had long dark brown hair pulled over one shoulder, and her cheeks were adorably flushed pink. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to startle you. She was American, with a soft melodic voice and eyes the color of the ocean, dark green and large. She had thick, thick dark lashes and a rosebud mouth. Maceo felt his tool twitch, and he immediately went into seduction mode. He'd exhausted his supply of assistance, and he was damned if he was going to sleep alone tonight. He ran his eyes over her body, taking in the curve of her waist, full bosom and shapely legs. He could already imagine that lush pink mouth around his tool. He smiled at the young woman. It is my pleasure, miss. She looked wary. Orianthe. Miss Orianthe. No. She chuckled slightly, that's my first name. It's beautiful, he said without missing a beat, his eyes locked on hers and holding out his hand. She shook it. Maceo Bartoli. Did you like the exhibit? Very much. You have a hopper on loan, I see. He's my hero. I also liked the Mamani Mamani selection. Maceo's eyebrows shot up. You know your paintings. Ori nodded. I majored in art, and I worked for a while as a curator. Maceo was impressed, but he was still distracted by her body. He could smell her scent, perfume, soap, clean laundry, and fresh air. He wondered how her friend would taste and how it would feel. He shot a quick look in through the French windows. Could he take her here? Suddenly being inside this beautiful woman was all he could think about. He blinked, trying to concentrate on what she was saying. He smiled as she stammered to a halt, suddenly noticing his scrutiny. Orianthe, would you care to have a late supper with me tonight? She grinned, and her smile made his member thicken painfully. She really was gorgeous. But she shook her head. Mr. Bartoli, I should tell you. I'm staying with Lucia Fernando. She and I are best friends and let's just say, your reputation precedes you. Thank you but no. She nodded, half smiling, and went back inside, leaving Maceo staring after her. Remind me to fire Lucia, he thought to himself, knowing that ah he would do nothing of the sort. He couldn't function without Lucia running his business, and b, that whoever she was, the girl called Orianthe had just laid down the ultimate challenge to Maceo Bartoli. Get her into bed or die trying. Maceo grinned to himself and went back into the gallery to rejoin his friends. They say the first time is the hardest. They say it gets easier the more you kill. Yes, he had found that to be true. Killing Viola had been life-changing along with that surprise in her eyes as he shot the crossbow bolt into her at point-blank range and the horror. Then there was her blood, carrying her lifeless body to the edge of the river and dumping her in, watching her blood mix with the water. He had never felt such peace. And now he knew he would do the same to any woman that the Midnight Club grew attached to or fell in love with. He would kill them all. He stared at the girl in the mauve dress. She looked like Viola too, dark, sensual, curvy. He hoped she would stay away from the club and away from them all. Otherwise, it would be her death sentence. Alex Milland rolled over onto his back and sighed. No sleep again. 3 a.m. He considered, then grabbed his phone. He knew one of his friends would still be up. Well, he knew Maceo would also be up and doing some hot girl he'd picked up at the opening. Alex grinned to himself. Maceo was a machine. He could turn his feelings off. Maceo was an expert at that, and Alex envied him for it. No, he could call on Seth, the calm center of their group. Quiet, fiercely intelligent, and with an empathy that somehow the rest of them lacked, Seth was Vancouver's answer to Bill Gates. He was a brilliant mind, but Alex knew also a solitary one. And to Alex's own benefit tonight, Seth was also an insomniac. He sent Seth a text message, and sure enough, a reply came back almost immediately. Bar is still open. He found Seth sitting at the bar, nursing a glass of scotch. He looked exhausted, 
but smiled at his friend, sliding a bottle of Johnny Walker Blue over to him. How are you doing, Alex? Alex shrugged. Existing. Seth nodded in sympathy. I'm sorry, man. I can't even imagine. They still haven't a clue who murdered Viola? Alex sighed. No. I can't get my head around it, Seth. I just don't get it. I just don't know what it would take for someone to do that to Viola, man. She was kind and loving to everyone. Such a freaking waste. I hear you, brother. Alex took a slug of scotch. I tell you, man, never again. No more long-term things. I don't think my heart could cope. Seth studied him. Alex, you can't let this stop you from being happy ever again. Alex gave a humorless laugh. Look who's talking. That's different, Seth said shortly. Irina cheated on me. Not the same at all. I just haven't the time for relationships. I can get a quick bang whenever I need it, why bother with the rest? Cold. Not cold smart. Alex sighed. Where are the others? Not being smart. Alex chortled. Gosh, you really did get up on the wrong side of the bed today. Seth rubbed his face. I just want some damn sleep, man. I know how you feel. Seth put his arm around Alex's shoulders. I'm sorry, buddy. You must miss her. We all do. An hour later Alex was back in bed, listening to the rain fall outside. He closed his eyes, but he could only see Viola's pale gray face. Dead. Her body so still on the mortuary slab. The detective asking him to identify her. Alex pushed the thought away and finally rolled over at 6 a.m., falling asleep. Ori stood under the spray of the shower, trying to shake the dream she had just awoken from. Not that it was a nightmare, far from it, and it was a change to have such a pleasant dreams for once. Ha, she thought. Pleasant is hardly the word. Try hot. Try sensual. Try the sexiest, most erotic dream she'd ever had. And of course, it had to be about that damn Maceo Bartoli, didn't it? Ori closed her eyes, and the water poured over her body. For a second she indulged in the remembrance of the dream, the part where Maceo Bartoli ordered everyone out of his gallery except her, then made her stand without clothes in the middle of the floor while he circled her, watching, studying her, and describing everything he wanted to do to her. Ori! Lucia yelled through her bathroom door. Ori's eyes snapped open, and flushing guiltily, she shut off the water and stepped out of the shower. Wrapping a towel around herself, she opened her bedroom door. Lucia looked apologetic. Hey, sweetie, I'm sorry. Maceo's called me into work, so we'll have to postpone our shopping trip. Ori was disappointed. Oh. Well, that's okay, I can just wander around and get to know the place. We can shop another day. Lucia smiled at her gratefully. Thanks, darling, I am sorry. Look, I have a handy travel guidebook that I've left on the table, it was invaluable when I first moved here. Just be vigilant. Oh, look what I'm saying. Is there a place in the world where we women don't have to be vigilant? Ori laughed. Can't think of anywhere, but yes I will be. I'll keep to the tourist traps. After her friend had gone, Ori dressed in jeans and a loose flowing white shirt. She pulled her long dark hair into a messy ponytail. Sliding her feet into her old battered Chuck Taylors she grabbed her bag, shoved the guidebook inside and headed out. This year Venice in March was unseasonably warm, and soon Ori had lost herself in exploring the place, taking water taxis, letting herself drift down small passages. She ended up on the island of Guadeca, and found a small bar trotteria to have lunch in. She ordered a small tuna salad and ate with pleasure, a glass of wine on the table, watching the people as they passed on the street. She got lost in daydreaming, so when the man who appeared by her side spoke, she started in her chair. Maceo Bartoli was smiling down at her, and gosh if a beat didn't start pulsing between her legs. He was gorgeous, all scruffy charm and confidence and very, very tempting, but Ori knew his type. 
Once he'd had her, she would be old news, and she didn't think her confidence could take that kind of hit right now. I'm sorry, she said coolly, I didn't hear what you said. Without being asked, Maceo sat down in the chair opposite her and signaled to the waiter. I said, if I pretend that you agreed to have dinner with me, I can count this as our first date. She glared at him. Did you follow me? Maceo laughed. Gosh, his smile really was something else, no? Do not fall for it, she told herself sharply. I wish I were that sneaky, Maceo admitted. But no, I promise. Coincidence. A happy one for me, at least. You. Ori hid a smile behind her wine glass. She had to admit his confidence was amusing. And being flirted with by a stunningly handsome man? Not too shabby. But she'd be damned if she'd let him know that. I haven't made my mind up yet. He laughed again, and something fluttered in her belly. Maceo took out a cigarette pack, offered her one, and when she declined, stuck one in his mouth and lit it. He blew out a lungful of smoke, away from her she noticed with gratitude. He was studying her. Tell me, Orianthi. Ori. Just call me Ori. He inclined his head gracefully. Tell me, Ori. What are you doing in my city? She hesitated, only a beat. I'm taking a vacation. A sabbatical. Are you working? Not currently. Why did that always make her feel like a waste of space? Maceo did not seem phased. I think sometimes we need to take stock and reevaluate. A sabbatical is good. Ori blinked. What was his game? Agreeing with her about everything? She narrowed her eyes at him. Are you making fun of me? Quite the contrary. I, myself, am a workaholic. I love the adrenaline rush, but I too have thought about taking an extended break. Ori smiled at him. And what would you do, Mr. Bartoli, on your break? He smiled. I would dedicate myself to finding out the best way to do you, Ms. Roy. What you liked, what you didn't. I'd use my hands and my tongue to pleasure you until you screamed my name loud enough for the whole of Venice to hear. Then, just when you thought you couldn't take any more. Until you begged me to stop. Ori, her breath caught in her chest, stared at him. What the hell? Was he serious? However angry she felt was belied by the fact she could feel herself getting esseted as he spoke, wanting him to take her there, who cared who saw, just do me, please. Instead, she pulled herself together. I imagine that there are some women upon whom that honesty would work, she said rather primly, gathering her bag and scrabbling around for some cash to pay for her lunch. I, however, am not one of them. Goodbye, Mr. Bartoli. Leaving him grinning after her, she stalked off and caught a water taxi back to Lucia's house. Of all the insufferable, egotistical assholes, she stomped into her room and flung her bag against the wall. Yeah, but you can't help thinking about him, can you? Shut up, she told herself. Gosh, she needed a distraction. She grabbed her phone and went to sit on the little balcony. She found the number of AJ's facility and waited. After a moment, the receptionist answered and soon AJ was saying hello. His voice sounded dull. Hey, boo. Ori said gently, knowing her brother's moods were erratic. Hey, funny face, he said and sighed. It's good to hear from you. When are you coming back? Ori's heart twisted. Sweetie, I? No, sorry, don't answer that. I don't want you to come back yet, I'm sorry. I'm just a little down today. Have you been taking your meds? Like I promised, sis. You heard from dad? Ori grimaced. No. Not a word. Have you seen the latest then? On the news? Some more women are coming forward. Seems Papa really can't keep it in his pants. AJ's voice was so dead, flat, and lifeless Ori could have cried. That his father didn't give a crap about Ori was one thing. That he ignored his only child was unforgivable. Look, boo, I can come back whenever and bust you out of there. She tried to make a joke out of it and she heard A.J. give a soft chuckle. 
You know, sis, here was a good idea. This place, I mean. It is helping, obviously, some days more than others, but I do feel at last like I'm getting my head clear. Ori gave a sigh of relief. That is good news. Look, when I come back, we're going to go someplace where he can't touch us. I promise. That sounds like a plan. When she ended the call, she felt calmer. AJ was making progress, and that was all that mattered now. Her younger half-brother was the love of her life, and she knew she would do anything to protect him. When he'd been diagnosed as having bipolar disorder at 14, Ori had been beside herself, terrified that he would kill himself with drugs or alcohol. Pinnegap Rehabilitation Center was only the latest in a long chain of rehab places, but he seemed to be thriving there, most days. She hoped Tyson would stay away. Just keep paying the bills and leave him alone, she thought to herself now. She considered, and then burrowed in her bag for her other phone, the one whose number Tyson would call her on. She kept it mostly off, unless AJ was unreachable. Then she turned it on in case of emergency. Out of sheer masochism, she turned it on now. Her voicemail was full. Cursing herself, she listening to a few of the messages, all from Tyson. Some of them were rants about her disloyalty, others were disgustingly lewd. The latest were short and sweet. Where the heck are you, Orianthe? Do you think you can hide from me? She deleted every last one of them and then cursed. Why did she do that? It was evidence. Dumb stupid girl, she snarled at herself, then stopped. Evidence. Was she that convinced that one day she would need evidence against him? Fuck, she was messed up. She pushed the thought away and went to make some dinner for Lucia. She had bought fresh ingredients for seafood linguine, and as she cooked, she could feel all the tension leach out of her. She chopped, diced, and steamed, and by the time Lucia got home from work, there were two plates piled high with pasta. Lucia swooned over the hot, buttery food, garlicky ciabatta on the side to soak up the creamy sauce. You are wasted as an art curator, Lucia told Ori afterward, when they sat outside on the balcony with a half-empty bottle of wine between them. You should retrain as a chef. Ha! Huh. Ori smiled, one good dish doesn't make a chef. They chatted easily, and then Ori, not being able to help herself from talking about him, mentioned she had seen Maceo out on one of the islands. Lucia rolled her eyes. I wondered where he'd gotten to. I had buyers waiting. He seemed very pleased with himself when he got back. I hope it wasn't awkward. Not at all. You're right, though. He's trouble with a capital T. Big, big trouble, Lucia agreed, then stared at her. Oh gosh, you haven't got a crush, have you? Because he'll trample all over your heart if you let him. Don't be ridiculous, I don't know the man. Who needs to know a man when he looks like Maceo? Sounds like I'm not the one with the crush, Ori chuckled at her friend's horror-stricken face. That is not what I meant, Orianthe, and you know it. But I'm not blind, I can see that the man is delicious. He's just too sure of himself. Ori tapped Lucia's wine glass with her own. That's what I think. But later, in bed, she allowed herself to fantasize about what it would be like to be screwed by such a man. She imagined his lips against hers, her hand sliding down. Just like every time she came, though, afterward the tears would come, the release of tension too much for her, and she sobbed quietly until she fell into an uneasy sleep. You're still here. Alex was surprised. Benoit and Lysander had already flown home to Paris and Buenos Aires respectively, but Alex had stayed to hang out with Maceo. Now he saw that Seth was at the table too. The tall Canadian smiled at him. I was persuaded to stay another night, he said, nodding at a grinning Maceo. Just one more quiet meal with friends, Maceo explained. But sadly, Ben and Sander had to work. The never-ending toil, he said dramatically, and the other two laughed. Maceo was undoubtedly the joker of their group, but Alex knew that sometimes his friends, the stoic Ben especially, found him a little too much. Tonight, however, he was in good form. I must tell you, friends. 
I believe I have finally met my match. Ha, Seth snorted. I'll believe it when I see it. No, no, really. This girl is special. They all are until you screw them, Alex said dryly. Maceo threw up his hands but laughed. You have a fair point, my friend, but no. This one, she has something else. She will not be so easily had. Oh, she is different, Seth nodded sagely. She has taste. Maceo laughed, taking the ribbing in good heart. All three friends enjoyed the meal, joking and laughing. It wasn't until they were leaving the restaurant that the conversation turned serious. Maceo looked at Alex steadily. Alex, my brother, will you be okay? Seth told me this morning that the Figlio di Patana, who killed Viola, is still out there? Alex nodded, his eyes clouding over. A part of me wants to find him first, so I can end this the way Viola deserves. He gathered himself, as his two friends looked at him sympathetically. I'm sorry, guys. I'll get to the bottom of it, I swear I will. Later, Maceo himself drove both Alex and Seth to the airport. Hugging them goodbye, he made them a promise. We will meet soon again, yes? As he made his way back to the car, his attention was caught by a man in a long dark coat and sunglasses getting into a long black limousine. Sunglasses at night? Maceo grinned to himself. What are you hiding from? He soon forgot about the man, channeling his thoughts more pleasurably into his latest project, Orianthi Roy. He could not stop thinking about her, to the point where he had actually called Lucia into his office earlier that day and asked her about her friend. You leave that girl alone, Lucia had said immediately. She is not one of your conquests. Maceo grinned now. No. Not yet. But he hadn't said that to Lucia. Out of all his colleagues, she was the one he was actually wary of, probably because she was amazing at her job and had turned him down flat when he tried his usual shtick on her first day at the gallery. That, she had said bluntly, grabbing his member through his jeans, isn't going to get anywhere near me. It does not interest me. Now, she had released him. Can we get back to work? Maceo laughed out loud now. He honestly could not imagine his business without Lucia. So could he risk her friendship just for the sake of screwing Orianthi? For once, Maceo knew he would have to tread very, very carefully. If only he could stop thinking about Ori's lush curves or her pink warm mouth. Are you sure you're going to be okay? I can always tell Johnny I can't make it this weekend. Ori rolled her eyes at her friend. Lucia's boyfriend, a race car driver, had called at the last minute, asking Lucia to fly to Monaco to see him. Ori could tell she was excited. I'll be fine, as long as you don't mind me pretending that this amazing place is my own for a week. Lucia laughed. Not at all. I know you, Miss Homemaker. I'll come back to brand new drapes and exquisitely crafted baked goods like in college. Gosh, doesn't that seem a million years ago? It does, Ori followed Lucia into her bedroom and sat on the bed while she packed. I found this great little cafe today, overlooking the lagoon. It's quiet, and I can write there. Lucia, this city is growing on me, I have to say. As well as the obvious beauty of the place, I like the people and the serenity. Ha! Huh. Lucia snorted from the depths of her closet, wait until it's carnivale time. Then you'll change your mind. She dragged a huge suitcase out of her closet and opened it. You, is that a mouse? Ori peered in. No, it's half an earmuff, you loon, she threw it at a relieved Lucia. How's the Bartoli Bonefest going to cope without you for a week? Rich boy's going to have to get his own coffee. Ori grinned at her friend, as Lucia tried to look disapproving. You are so mean. Haven't you been the one to warn me away from him? Just because I don't want a nice girl like you to get hurt by Maceo doesn't mean I'm not very fond of him. Under all the bullshit, well let's just say I think still waters run deep. Ori was surprised, but didn't say anything else. She'd spent the past few nights dreaming of Maceo Bartoli, if nothing else he helped the nightmares stay away. 
Lucia left a couple of hours later, with hugs and kisses and promises to call. And then Ori was truly alone. She felt weird banging around in the big apartment by herself, and since it was too early to call AJ, she decided to take her computer and go do some writing. She went to the small cafe she had discovered and ordered coffee and gelato. Opening her computer, she launched her browser and checked the news in the States. Her stepfather was front-page news again. Ori ignored the gnawing terror that Tyson Yannick's handsome face gave her every time she saw it, and read through the story. More women coming forward with intimate assault claims. Gosh, the man was a monster. Her eyes scanned the rest of the story, stopping when she saw her name mentioned. There are few people in this world whom I trust, Yannick told a press conference, but I know I can count on the support of my daughter, Orianthi, and my son, Adam James. They are the closest people to me, the congressman appeared emotional. I love them with all my heart, they truly are the best of me. Prick. Ori whispered to herself. Gosh, he really was repellent. How much would it shock the world now to find out he was a rapist scumbag? Yannick was entirely responsible for AJ's staggering lack of confidence and his depression. Ori was angrier for AJ than for herself. AJ was Yannick's biological son for Christ's sakes. She slammed the lid of her laptop down, a little too hard, and took a deep breath in. AJ is safe and well away from him, and so are you, Orianthi. So are you. She finished her coffee and settled down to work on her project. It was near dusk when she looked up from her work. She stretched and packed up her stuff. Home, a bath, food and a good book. Sounds like the perfect evening. She was smiling to herself as she walked back slowly through the city. Her cell phone rang just as she reached the apartment. Lucia. Sweetie, I'm so sorry to ask you this, Lucia sounded panicked, but Maceo is having a meltdown. One of his customers is saying a painting Maceo sold him is fake. Is there any chance you could go to the gallery and help him out? Ori saw her perfect evening go up in smoke. Of course, honey. Don't panic. I'm not a hundred percent sure what I can do, though. I'm not an expert. That's the thing. Ori, we have this happen to us all the time, and when it does, I usually act the part of the art expert. Most of the time it works, and we don't have to fly our real expert in from Geneva. So if you could, you know, pretend. Ori started to laugh. You are kidding me, right? Lucia chuckled. I wish I was. Ori sighed. No problem. Look, if I'm going to look the part, can I borrow your work clothes? I can't show up in jeans. Of course, anything you need. Thanks, Ori, I owe you one. That was how, 45 minutes later, Ori, dressed in a black skirt and jacket with her hair pulled back into a severe bun and her spectacles perched on her nose, marched into Maceo Bartoli's gallery. She was gratified to see Maceo's eyes open wide in surprise and saw him suppress a smile. He turned to the middle-aged man, who was eyeing Ori both suspiciously and appreciatively. Ori knew immediately that this would be easy. In less than a half hour, the man went away that satisfied his painting was the original, it was. Ori knew an original Kala when she saw it, and Maceo was grinning broadly as he poured them some drinks in his office. He handed her a flute of champagne. Thank you, Ori. Anything to help Lucia, she said smoothly but with a grin and he laughed. He indicated her suit. That works. She rolled her eyes. If you have a secretary fetish, keep it to yourself. Maceo shrugged good-naturedly. Fair enough. But seriously, thank you. Man, you'd think my reputation alone would be enough to convince these people that I don't trade in counterfeit goods, but there it is. Ori considered. Mr. Bartoli. I'm just guessing. Some of these men who come back to your gallery angry and bitter, would they happen to have attractive wives? Maceo's grin was wide and completely unrepentant, and Ori had to laugh. Oh, you really are a Casanova. Glad to help, Maceo, but next time keep your pecker in your pants. She got up to leave, but Maceo put up his hands. 
Wait before you go. Lucia tells me you've become fond of our city. Ori sat down again. I have. It's beautiful and restful and serene. Maceo laughed. Not during Carnevale. Ori grinned. That's what Lucia said. What's your point? Maceo sat back. Ori tried not to look at the open neck of his shirt or the swarthy skin of his chest. I want to offer you a job, Ori. I need a curator to work ahead of our current schedule and line up exhibits months, even years in the future. You have contacts at MoMA and the Guggenheim, right? Ori nodded, her interest piqued. All of the big guns, plus a lot of the small galleries. Contacts like those are invaluable, Maceo sighed, his handsome face serious for once. Ori, we put together the exhibition we have now by the skin of our teeth. We simply don't have the time to fill our schedule at the moment, which means we miss out on the best pieces. I need someone like you, not just for the big names, but as a scout finding new talent, as well as negotiating with galleries worldwide. Ori was speechless for a moment. Maceo Bartoli, whether he knew it or not, had just described her dream job. Actually, dream job didn't even begin to cover it. And this man, this charming, gorgeous, yet completely untrustworthy man, was offering it to her right here, right now. She narrowed her eyes at him. Forgive me for asking. You know if I work for you that there's even less a chance of me sleeping with you, right? For a moment, she wished she could take back the words because maybe, just maybe, she saw a little hurt in his eyes. But a second later Maceo smiled, and the cocky businessman was back. So does that mean that until you start work for me, there is a chance? Ori couldn't help but chuckle at him. Absolutely none. Can I think about the job? Maceo smiled. Of course. May I at least take you to dinner to say thank you for tonight? Gosh, it was tempting, but if she let him wine and dine her, there was no way she'd be able to resist that smile, that body, those green, green eyes. I can't. But thank you. He nodded. Then let me call you a water taxi. He kissed her hand before she got into the water taxi, and as she was driven away through the canals, she looked back toward the dock. He was still there, watching her. He raised his hand, and unthinkingly, Ori did the same. Before she even made it back to her apartment, she knew she would tell him yes to the job. And not just because it was her dream job. Ori never saw the man in the shadows outside the apartment. He watched her go in and lock the door after herself. Then, as lights came on in the first floor window, he smiled to himself. He walked a little down the street, so he could not be seen or heard if she came out onto the balcony. He hoped she would, the girl was a looker all right. He pulled his cell phone out. It's me. Yeah. You can tell him it's confirmed. His stepdaughter is in Venice, as we thought. What does he want me to do? He listened carefully and began to smile. Yeah, okay. Twenty-four hours. He shut off his phone and stared up at the balcony. Come on, Juliet. Show Romeo something here. He grinned as Ori, now changed into a slouchy sweater and pajama pants, stepped out onto the balcony, a cup of steaming tea in her hands. Her dark hair tumbled over her shoulders. The observer felt his groin tighten. No wonder Yannick wanted her found. He almost felt sorry for the girl. He was absolutely sure that Yannick didn't have good things planned for this little beauty. Not good things at all. Ori leaned her hot forehead against the cool tiles of the shower. The water spray was hot against her skin, but she barely felt it, concentrated as she was on imagining Maceo Bartoli's hands where hers were now between her legs, relentlessly massaging her, until her vision exploded with stars and she gasped through her O. Oh. She panted for air, reveling in the sensation. Damn you, Maceo Bartoli. Her dreams had been full of him mostly a continuation from last night. Him stopping her before she left his office, reaching around and freeing her hair from its bun, tugging open the white blouse, tiny white buttons flying everywhere. Her pushing him into his chair and straddling him. Oh goddamn you Maceo Bartoli, she whispered as another orgasm ripped through her. 
She'd woken up hornier than she had been in years, maybe even ever. For a second now, as she panted her way back to sanity, she wondered whether she should just go ahead and do him. Tell him no strings, no need to call. Just a sensational, mind-blowing bonk. She laughed out loud. What is the matter with you, girl? She dressed quickly in sweats and set out to clean the entire apartment, distracting herself. Mid-morning, she heard her phone beep and checked it. Made up your mind yet? She grinned. About the job? Yes. I'll take it. Thank you. Good. See you Monday, unless I can persuade you to join me for dinner tonight. Yes, yes, yes. Mr. Bartoli, I don't think that is a good idea. Take a risk. Ori felt her heart beating hard against her ribs. Oh, I want to. You don't know how much I want to, but she knew enough about powerful rich men like Maceo to know that once she gave in to him. I can't. Another time. She was both grateful and regretful that he didn't try to persuade her. Later, after the apartment was clean and she was filthy, she took a long soak, reading her book, then went out to the market to buy fresh fish and vegetables for her supper. While she was cooking, she called AJ and was happy to hear him sounding upbeat and positive. She went to bed early, falling asleep just after 10 p.m. It was quiet outside, and she could hear the lapping of the water on the sides of the canal. It lulled her to sleep, but at a quarter of eleven, she awoke with a start. Someone was in the apartment. She could hear them moving in the other room. She slid out of bed, looking around for a weapon. She grabbed a vase from the dresser and stole to the side of the door, peeking out. She held her breath, but the fear was almost overwhelming, the memories of years ago when her stepfather was creeping down the hall to her bedroom. Never again. She drew in a deep breath then, and with a banshee howl, darted for her intruder. He picked her up easily, her size no match for his, and threw her across the room. Adrenaline made her leap back to her feet, and she ran at his midsection, hearing a muffled oof as her head connected with his belly. Freaking bitch. His hands were around her throat then, squeezing, squeezing, until nothing. She could breathe again, and his weight was being pulled off her by someone else, someone shouting, a familiar voice. Maceo. The two men struggled as Ori tried to catch her breath. Then with a roar, Maceo threw the man out into the hallway and her attacker took off, cursing. Maceo locked the door behind him and came to her, wrapping his arms around her, calming her. Confused, scared and discombobulated, Ori let him hold her until she had calmed enough to meet his gaze. Maceo opened his mouth to speak. Instead Ori, driven by terror, lust and chaos, pressed her lips to his hungrily. He took her face in his hands as he kissed her, and they only broke apart when they ran out of air. Maceo, his green eyes full of desire but at the same time questioning, spoke softly. Are you sure? Ori nodded, her body curving around his. In one easy motion, Maceo swept her into his arms and carried her to the bedroom. Ori didn't care that she was in her old ratty but comfortable t-shirt and shorts combo, all her attention was on the man above her. Maceo pulled his t-shirt off in one easy motion, and Ori saw the finely honed planes of his body and his thickly muscled arms. Maceo pushed her t-shirt up, pulling it over her head. And then his mouth was on her until she was moaning, his hands slipping inside the waistband of her shorts to stroke her. Oh gosh, it was even better than she had fantasized about, the rhythmic stroking of his long, strong fingers making her skin electrified by his touch. Her hands fumbled on his jeans. She could feel him hot and hard against the denim, and when she finally managed to make her trembling fingers free it from his underwear, she stroked the length of it, feeling it shudder and thicken under her touch. Ori. His eyes were fixed on hers, the desire in them making her head swim. Ori stroked his face. Don't wait, Maceo, please. He ripped her shorts from her and hitched her legs around his waist. Ori felt him nudge at her then, as he plunged into her. She gasped at the sensation of their bodies rocking in perfect symmetry, his lips against hers. Right this minute, she didn't care about anything else but being with this glorious, glorious man. 
He drove himself into her, both of them delirious with desire, until they both finished, crying out, his hands pinning hers to the bed. He barely let her recover before his tongue was lashing around, driving her crazy. Maceo Bartoli made Ori come four times before he finally let her catch her breath. Panting, she smiled up at him. That was just a thank you, Mr. Bartoli, for you know, saving my life. He grinned down at her. Well then thank you back. They rested for a while, Maceo's arm around her, her head nestled on his shoulder. Then he moved away, propped himself up on his elbow and looked down at her. Ori, who was that man? She shook her head, her smile fading. I honestly don't know. I woke up, and he was in the apartment. I attacked him first, so I could argue that he wasn't violent until I was, she sighed and sat up, rubbing her eyes, totally at ease with being naked with this man. She smiled at him and touched his cheek. Thank you, Maceo, really, but can I ask? Why were you here? Maceo looked sheepish. Call me old-fashioned but knowing you were here alone, it bothered me. So I just took a late-night boat ride. I've been alone for a couple of days, did you do that last night too? He nodded, looking up at her from beneath his thick dark eyelashes in a way that made her belly quiver with desire. Forgive me. Ori wasn't sure how she felt about his vigilance, but she couldn't deny that tonight it had saved her life. Maceo sat up now and kissed her shoulder. I'm not sure this is the safest place for you, he murmured, his lips against her skin. His long fingers stroked her belly, making it vibrate with desire. Why don't you come back to mine? She was tempted, sorely tempted, but she shook her head. I don't think that's a good idea. I mean, I don't want to give the impression that I can't look after myself. Tomorrow I'll go get a deadbolt. Maceo sighed, running a hand through his dark curls. Simpler to stay with me. She looked around at him and smiled. Maceo, on Monday morning you'll be my boss. I don't think it's advisable to be sleeping with the boss. Maceo was silent, his lips still on her shoulder, his light green eyes fixed her hers. Goddamn, he really knew how to work that whole smoldering Italian thing. Fine, he said suddenly. But I'm staying tonight. Ori was strangely relieved. Thank you. I'd like that. He pulled her back down onto the bed, on top of him. And also, I'll get my people to find out who your intruder was. If you like, we can go to the Polizia. But I warn you, a case like this, they won't spend a lot of time on it. That's just the way things are here. He was trailing his fingers up and down her spine, which was distracting Ori so much that she agreed without even listening, and soon his mouth was on hers, and he was rolling her onto her back. They made love long into the night, and Maceo was both tender and rough, attending to every part of her body, challenging her to do things she had never dreamed of. Ori knew in her heart that she'd probably never have another night like this, with a man who awoke in her a primal need and a feral desire such as this. Maceo Bartoli deserved his legendary swordsman status. Making her crazy, and she gave herself up to him entirely for the rest of the night. Ori's attacker, humbled and bleeding, knocked on the hotel suite's door. He'd ignored the curious stares of the staff at reception as he had limped towards the elevator. The night manager had approached him, but he had warned him off with a don't mess with me stare. A bald, gigantic henchman opened the door of the suite, smirking when he saw the man's wounds. Got your ass handed to you by a girl, did you? Shut the hell up, moron. Is he here? Ready and waiting. The man walked into the suite's living room. Tyson Yannick was impeccably dressed, even at this late hour, in a Seville row suit, a heavy glass of bourbon in his hands. He stood with back facing the room, but turned as the man greeted him. His steel-gray eyes were cold. Where is my stepdaughter? She attacked me, and then her boyfriend got involved. I thought it best to back off and reevaluate. Yannick's face was expressionless. My stepdaughter does not have a boyfriend, Mr. Harrison. Are you telling me that there was a man with her tonight? Harrison nodded. Yannick put his glass down on the table. Filthy little tramp, he whispered almost to himself. 
He was silent for a few long moments, then looked back at Harrison. Find out who the boyfriend is and end him. Harrison, who had no trouble killing women but balked at taking on men twice his size, looked alarmed. Sir, I think that might be a mistake. Yannick looked faintly amused. You do. Harrison kept his mouth shut, knowing this look of old. It was the calm before the storm. Yannick would appear amused, then from nowhere would explode into a rage which made Hurricane Katrina look like a brief rain shower. Yannick picked up his glass. So, she has a boyfriend. I knew the blessed little pristine act wouldn't last, he considered, then glanced back at Harrison. Fine. Keep watching them, but I want to know everything about the boyfriend. Harrison was relieved. Consider it done. When he was alone, Yannick brooded, nursing another drink. He had come to Italy after a mutual friend had told him he'd seen Ori in the city. Alone, the friend had told him. Tyson Yannick had seen his political career collapse because of his affairs with the wives of his friends, but he was convinced he could turn things around in a year or two. After all, who would honestly care about it after the initial scandal? How many times had JFK screwed up? And yet he was still considered a god. Tyson went to his bathroom now and stripped off. At 55, he was still hard-bodied, and had the handsome all-American good looks that had propelled his career so far. Even now, so near to the scandal, people were already whispering that he was so good-looking, who could blame those women for falling for him? Who could blame a red-blooded male for taking advantage of what was thrown in his path? Once Catherine had, fortuitously in Tyson's opinion, died young of cancer, he had been able to focus all of his attention on Ori. On those nights he used to go to her room, force the door open, and see her cowering on her single bed, there was no one to hear him and stop him then. Nor would there be now. When she left home, practically the day she turned sixteen, Tyson had lost some of that control over her, but while AJ was still under his parentage, he knew he could still be sure that Ori would not tell anyone about Tyson's particular peccadilloes. Now AJ had left home, and Tyson no longer had that assurance which was why, regrettably, his beautiful Orianthe would have to die. He stepped into the shower, cranking the hot water on. As he stood under the spray, he imagined the leverage that a tragic death in the family would give him. All sins would be forgiven, as the courageous, devastated congressman bravely vowed to find out who murdered his beautiful stepdaughter. And now that she had a boyfriend, he suddenly realized, he had someone to pin it on, to frame when they found Ori's broken, brutalized body. Tyson grinned to himself as he shampooed his hair. Perfect, he thought. Perfect. Now he just had to pick the perfect time to kill her. Harrison was willing, if not eager to do it, but Yannick had turned him down. As much as I admire your bloodlust, Harrison, I will be the one to end Orianthe's life. He couldn't wait. When Ori woke in the morning, the bed beside her was empty. For a long moment, she fought with both disappointment and acceptance. It's for the best, she told herself. Maybe Maceo understood that this could not be a thing if they were to work with each other. She pushed the sheet back and swung her legs over the side of the bed just as she heard the door to the apartment open and his voice calling, Good morning, beautiful. Ori flushed, her heart leaping with joy. She padded barefoot into the living area to see him dumping fresh breakfast rolls onto a plate, a jug of orange juice already on her table. Maceo switched her coffee pot on and grinned at her. She laughed softly. Domesticated. Maceo laughed. No, just a hungry man. I need some energy after last night. Come here to me, he held out his arms but Ori backed off, grinning. Two seconds to brush my teeth, I have morning breath. He held up his hands. I don't care, but okay, go do what you have to. Ori scooted into the bathroom and brushed her teeth, trying to get a handle on what she was feeling. Thoroughly and professionally screwed for one, she grinned to herself now as she rinsed her mouth. Her thighs ached and geez, even thinking about it made her feel pleasure again. Her smile faded when she noticed the bruises on her neck and the clearly defined fingerprints. Geez, what a whirlwind. One minute I was being murdered, 
the next screwed to within an inch of my life. Who the hell had broken into her apartment, and why had he tried to kill her? An image of her stepfather flashed into her mind. No. He had no idea where she was, did he? Surely now that he was in disgrace, a lot of the contacts he could have used to find her had vanished, mostly because he'd screwed their wives. A wave of nausea hit her, and she gripped the side of the wash basin to steady herself. Are you okay, Bella? Ori looked up to see Maceo watching her with concerned eyes. She smiled weakly at him. I think the break-in just hit me. He came to her then, his fingers brushing her bruised neck. I won't let anything happen to you, Ori. I promise, gosh, she could get lost in his green eyes. Maceo brushed his lips against hers. He tasted of fresh air. Ori closed her eyes and reveled in his kiss, his tongue gently massaging hers, his hands dropping to her waist and pulling her close to him. What this man does to me. She gave a little moan, which seemed to spur him into action. They devoured the breakfast rolls hungrily afterward, and Maceo told her some more about her new job. I think we will be working together very closely, he said with a wicked grin. I need someone to travel the world with me, to go and scout the cities while I deal with the red tape and business side. It is regretful that I cannot make the time to see all the galleries, that is my first love, but it's not what made me a billionaire. Ori was curious. Do you come from a rich family? Maceo shook his head. My mother looked after me on her own and gave me a good upbringing, but we did not lead a wealthy life. It made me determined to give her everything. I am glad I got to spoil her before she passed. Ori felt a wash of sympathy. I'm sorry she's gone, Maceo. He nodded, comfortable with his emotions. What about you? Ori shifted in her chair. My mom died a few years ago. I have a younger brother, well, half-brother, AJ, he's the love of my life, really, she was grinning now, thinking of him, and Maceo smiled at her. I can see that. Lucia tells me your stepfather is a politician. Ori's smile faded, and unconsciously she touched the bruises at her neck. My mother is dead. He's no longer my stepfather. Maceo covered her hand with his. I understand, Bella, he leaned over to kiss her. Now, by your own logic, I'm not your boss until Monday morning, and it just so happens that I have the weekend free. Would you spend it with me, Ori? I would like to show you my Venezia. Ori smiled at him, grateful for the change of subject. Yes, Maceo, I would like that very much. A little while later, when Ori had excused herself to use the bathroom, Maceo pulled out his cell phone. In a low voice, he instructed his private detective to find out everything he could on Tyson Yannick. I want to know where he is, what he wants, and what the hell he's been doing to his stepdaughter. Mr. Milland, would you come this way? The police captain came to greet him personally and led him to his office. After they had been seated, the captain gave him a sympathetic look. Mr. Milland, I know this has been hard, but I assure you that we are doing everything we can to find Viola's killer. It's been weeks and no new leads, Alex said. Surely there must be something. Can you trace the crossbow bolt? Unlikely, the captain said. Mr. Milland, can you think of anyone or anything, no matter how seemingly inconsequential that might make? Someone fire a crossbow bolt into the abdomen of the woman I loved? No, Alex was snippy now. Viola had no enemies. None. And to do that to someone, why? The police captain hesitated. Mr. Milland, our police psychologist has been asking the same questions. And? The manner of killing, the way she was tied before being shot, he seems to think it was a sexual motive. Alex leaned forward. Aren't they all? Viola was a beautiful woman, Captain. I assumed it was sexually motivated from the beginning. The question is, who? The captain tapped his pen on the desk. Mr. Milland, how long had you and Viola been in a relationship? Two years, five months, and seven days. Why? Is it possible she had a lover? Or lovers? 
Alex felt the blood drain out of his face, but he sighed. It's possible. I spent long days and nights away on business. We sometimes argued about it, he turned hooded, haunted eyes to the captain. Am I a suspect? We can't rule out anyone at this point. Alex nodded. I understand. Do you know of anyone close to you who might have had the opportunity, I'm not saying they did anything untoward, but had the opportunity to be alone with Viola? Alex rubbed his head. Yes. I have a group of friends with whom Viola was friendly, and I know when they were in town and I wasn't, they would sometimes have dinner or drinks with her. But none of them would do this, Captain. They are my brothers. It would be good to talk to them, Mr. Milland. Alex shook his head. No, I won't believe any of them had anything to do with this. You're looking in the wrong direction. Still, Mr. Milland, I'd like to have their names. Just to be thorough, the captain's voice had taken on a hard edge and Alex, seeing how seriously he was taking this, couldn't think of a way to dissuade him. Please don't harass them, he said and sighing began to recite their names. Lysander Duarte, Benoit Vo, Seth Cantor, Maceo Bartoli. After a weekend of sightseeing and screwing, sometimes both at the same time, or he finally sent Maceo home on Sunday evening. I don't want anyone to know we've been together, she said firmly. I need to make my own first impression. I don't want to be known as the girl who screwed her way into her job, Maceo. Maceo had no choice but to honor her wishes, but he insisted on making sure the apartment was intruder-proof before he left. Ori didn't mind that at all. Seeing Maceo working with his hands, fixing deadbolts to the door, installing an alarm, especially when he could have just paid someone to do it, was a huge turn-on. She thanked him profusely in the shower afterward. Now, as she sat outside on the balcony breathing in the cool night air, she missed him. His crazy infectious energy was like a bomb to every bad thing. Yes, she knew that she was unlikely to ever be able to trust him completely, but when had she trusted anyone anyway? Even her beloved mother had let her down the one time Ori had gone to her and told her what Tyson had done to her. You must never ever say anything like that ever again, child, never. And haunted by the fear on her mother's face, she hadn't. Maceo Bartoli, he had gotten under her skin in a way Ori had never experienced before. She was under no illusions that they were dating, they were merely screwing, no commitment, no relationship, and that was fine with her. But she couldn't stop thinking about the way his lips felt against hers, or the clean scent of his skin, and the way his gaze fixed on hers as he thrust into her. She could still feel the way his dark brown curls felt as she slid her fingers through them. Gosh, stop thinking about him, she told herself fiercely, even dreaming of him turned her on. She went to bed early, setting her alarm for 7 a.m. She had a water taxi booked for 8, she wanted to be early on her first day. Her work clothes, a simple burgundy dress and heels, hung on the back of her door. Ori got into bed and switched off the lamp, scooching down. She felt optimistic for the first time in a long time. A new job, a new life. A new love? Her cell phone beeped with a text message. Good night, sleeping beauty. I will see you in the morning. Sleep well, Em. Ori smiled to herself and replied. You too, boss. She put a smiley face on the end of the message and shut off her phone. Soon she was asleep, the cool Venice air drifting in through the window. She had no idea how soon her happiness would be shattered. Tyson Yannick stood on the small boat as it pulled up alongside the jetty outside Ori's apartment, but he made no move to get out. Instead, he stared up at the open window of where she had to be sleeping. So close. So she'd scored herself a billionaire boyfriend then? Maceo Bartoli. Tyson's murderous jealousy had not been helped by what Harrison had discovered about the man. He was 39, an art dealer and gallery owner, involved in something called the Midnight Club. Bartoli was powerful, had friends in the Italian government, and was a ruthless businessman. But all that was nothing, compared to Bartoli's almost legendary status with women. If he wanted them, he could have them, 
His devastating good looks made sure that the world's most beautiful women hung on his every word. And now he had Ori. My Ori, Tyson seethed, but he did not show it on his face. He wondered if Bartoli would be unhappy when Ori died, or if she was just another random screw for him. No. From the personality profile he had on the man, Bartoli might be a harlot, but he treated all his castoffs royally. He was passionate and caring, even if commitment wasn't his thing. Tyson had to admit, he probably suited Ori. Ori had always hated being tied down, Tyson smirked to himself and literally too. He nodded to the boat captain, who backed the small boat away from the jetty and out into the lagoon. No, Maceo Bartoli would mourn Ori, Tyson was sure. But he'll mourn her from the confines of a jail cell. Ori walked into the gallery at a quarter of nine, nervous but excited. She saw Maceo already there, talking to a group of people gathered around one of the paintings. Clients, she guessed, and hovered in the background, not sure of what to do. She watched Maceo charm them, making them laugh, the women all tucking their hair behind their ears and standing a little straighter. Ori hid a smile. Man pro in everything, she thought without malice. She could see the danger of him, so easy to fall for, so difficult to let go. Maceo noticed her, and a huge smile spread across his face. He excused himself politely and came to her. And early too. That's always a plus, he kissed her cheeks, his green eyes twinkling at her. Come meet some people, and then we'll get to organizing you. The morning flew by, as Ori didn't have the time to worry as Maceo steered her through meeting clients and getting to know the staff. He introduced her as a friend of Lucia's, she was glad, it saved her a lot of nervousness. Maceo, his hand on the small of her back, was professional all the way, and most of the young woman greeted her as an old friend. Ori wasn't stupid, she knew Maceo had probably screwed half if not more of them, but to his credit, they all seemed to be on friendly terms with their boss. Only one woman, Cassie, the other American, Maceo had chuckled, a blonde with a sweet face was cooler to Ori, her eyes searching her face, then resting on Maceo. A small smirk hitched up at the side of her mouth. Ori flushed, but Maceo didn't notice anything. Saz, can I get you to show Ori somewhere she can dump her things? She'll be hot-desking mostly for now. Ori, please excuse me for a few more moments while I show my clients out. Of course. Cassie took Ori up a flight of glass stairs. A large open-plan office lay on the second floor, but Ori was amused to see huge tables filled with art materials as well as the usual desks. It was messy and colorful and Ori loved it. A few of the women working up there looked at her curiously. Cassie showed her a desk in the corner, a view out to the lagoon a welcome sight to the cramped space. You can use this one, Cassie told her. Maceo doesn't care how you personalize it as long as you're happy, but it doesn't sound like you'll be using it a lot. I hear you're to be our new scout?" Ori detected an undertone to her words, but decided to ignore it. She didn't want to fall out with anyone on her first day. Apparently so. I'm excited to start. Cassie took her through the computer and phone system, then showed her the bathrooms and kitchen, making them both a rather weak coffee. Ori sipped it, grateful despite the taste. Her nerves had only gotten worse since she got to the gallery. Cassie left her alone at her desk, and Ori took the chance to catch her breath and survey her surroundings. A small dark girl waved at her from across the room, and Ori smiled at her. The girl came over and sat on Ori's desk. Hello, I'm Serena, Maceo's intern. Anything you need, just ask. I love your scarf. Ori smiled at her. Serena had a warm, friendly face and merry, twinkling eyes. I will thank you. They chatted easily for a few minutes, before Maceo reappeared and spirited Ori away to his office. She was glad to see that the door had no window in it, because as soon as it was shut, Maceo pushed her up against it and kissed her. She responded to his lips, but then gently pushed him away. Maceo. I don't think this appropriate at work. Mace grinned good-naturedly and steered her to the couch. Fair enough although seeing you in that dress, damn. 
He leaned across to nuzzle her neck, and she couldn't resist the feel of his lips on her throat. I want to be inside you, Ori. Her moan of desire gave her away, and in one movement she was under him. Mace pushed the skirt of her dress up as she fumbled with his fly and in seconds he was thrusting into her. It was a quick hard dirty screw which left them both laughing and panting for air. As she tidied herself up afterward, she rammed her legs together and gave him a disapproving look. You just broke all my rules. Maceo was grinning and unrepentant. Bella, you have this effect on me. I cannot help how I feel. Now. He sat down behind his desk and pulled her down onto his lap. Tomorrow you and I fly to Paris. I have meetings set up for us all day at the George V, potential new clients, all of them. Then the next day, we will scout some Parisian artists. My friend Benoit is already looking forward to seeing you again. Maceo, or he was discovering, worked at breakneck speed. Paris? Tomorrow? Maceo grinned. I told you this would be an exciting opportunity. We fly at 10 a.m. Ori stepped out onto the balcony of their hotel suite. Paris, its lights twinkling in the dusk, stretched out before her. She breathed in the cool night air and listened to the sounds of the traffic drifting up from the streets below. They had been here for two days, and it had been a dream. Meeting prospective clients had been nerve-wracking, but she found Maceo could charm anyone. He was aware of her nerves and guided her through the meetings, giving her tips on what the clients liked and what they expected, and soon she was finding her footing. They had dinner with a couple of Maceo's oldest and most loyal customers, and then Maceo had taken her back to their suite and screwed her brains out all night long. Ori laughed to herself now. She couldn't describe it any other way. Maceo, his grin broad and confident, had taken her on the floor against the wall, in the shower, even when the night was darkest, out here on the balcony, muffling her cries of pleasure with his hand so they didn't draw attention to themselves. She shivered now, reliving the pleasure driving into her, his strong hands on her body. She started as he slid his arms around her waist now, kissing her ear, her neck, her shoulder. Miyokaro, he whispered, his fingers splaying out on her belly, warming her skin through her thin cotton dress. Don't turn around. Ori felt him ease her legs apart and lift her skirt from behind. She gazed out at the night as he slid gently into her, and then she sighed as he began to move, one hand cupping her throat, his lips on her neck, the other hand finding her and kneading and rubbing until she was shuddering. She knew instinctively that this was not the time for screaming, but a slow, sensual journey to ecstasy. She shivered through one, two, three happy endings as he murmured what he'd like to do to her, and she felt him stiffen before hot semen pumped into her belly. She leaned back into his big strong frame, breathing hard. Maceo kissed her cheek. Are you okay? Ori laughed. Gosh, Maceo, how can you even ask? You're amazing. As are you, Mio Caro. Come, let's sit a while, we still have time before we have to change for dinner. They were going out to eat with Maceo's friend Benoit, and a date, and Ori was nervous and excited to finally see another part of Maceo's life. Maceo lit a cigarette and gazed at her. Caro, would you do something for me? Of course. He leaned forward. Would you strip for me? Ori was taken aback but smiled. If you'd like. She stood and slowly peeled her dress off, followed by her bra and panties, and stood before him. Maceo ran his eyes slowly over her body. You are perfect. Do you know that? Ori laughed, embarrassed at the compliment but not about her nakedness. She could not feel shy with this man, he made her feel like a goddess. Your eyesight may be failing you, old man, she joked, and Maceo grinned. If anything, it's improved. Come here to me. He held his arms out and she slid onto his lap, curling up in his arms, totally vulnerable. How is it no one has snapped you up, taken you to their castle and hidden you away? Ori felt a jolt. An image of her stepfather flashed across her vision, binding her, holding her down, imprisoning her, and she suddenly felt exposed and ridiculous. She extracted herself from Maceo's arms and slipped her dress back on. Caro, did I say something to upset you? 
His eyes were curious and concerned. She shook her head. It's not you, Maceo. She tried to smile at him, but he leaned forward. What is it? She shook her head. Please, Maceo, let's not spoil our evening by talking about my past. Another long pause. As you wish. After they had changed for dinner, mostly in thoughtful silence, Maceo took her hand. I hope you will get to know Benoit better, he said. He is one of my oldest friends. Ori asked him about his and Ben's friendship. We met in college, he and I and our other friends, Lysander, Seth, and Alex. All five of us were driven and knew what we wanted. And by and large, twenty-odd years later, we all have it. The press calls us the Midnight Club because we all share a birthday, same time of day as well as date and year. Ori's eyes opened wide. That's an incredible coincidence. Isn't it? We were obviously meant to be friends. When is your birthday, Mio Caro? November 13th. I shall remember. Start thinking about where you would like to go. Ori stopped him. Maceo. I know how the game is played. You don't have to say such things. I'm not looking for a commitment here, and I know you're not. There was an expression she couldn't read in his eyes. I'm not. She kissed him. It's okay, Maceo. It really is. I'm not naive to the world, especially the world of a drop-dead gorgeous extremely eligible billionaire like you. Why would you commit when you could have anyone? All I ask is that you're honest with me. The elevator door opened as she finished speaking, and Maceo, all humor gone from his face, was silent as they walked to their waiting cab. In the car on the way to the restaurant they didn't speak, but Maceo held her hand, his fingers knotted between hers. Ori glanced over at him, as he stared out of the window. Maybe he'd never had a woman say that to him, and that's what was throwing him. Ori knew she had made the right decision to say what she had, it was a way of protecting her heart, because God knew, Maceo had been battering down the walls that she'd spent years building around it. She could not risk falling in love with him. She would not risk that. At the restaurant, Benoit and his date were already waiting, and Maceo, his mood seeming to lighten, introduced her. Ori was touched by the note of pride she heard in his voice as he introduced her. Benoit Vo was in the same league as Maceo, she decided, charming, ruthless, and devastatingly handsome. The two men shared the same brooding quality, but Benoit seemed more serious than Maceo. His date, Marcella, was an Audrey Hepburn look-alike, all grace and elegance but a very sweet nature. Ori chatted happily with her, as the two men talked about business. You have certainly made an impression on Maceo. Marcella told her, smiling, I can't remember the last time he introduced us to a date. Ori was surprised but kept her counsel. How long have you and Benoit been together? Marcella smiled. Oh, we're not together in that sense. I mean, we do spend time together, shall we say, but we're not a couple. Just very good friends. Benoit does not have the time to commit to a full relationship. Ori frowned. Like Maceo. Marcella looked taken aback. No, I don't think so. Anyway, my dear, to answer your question, Benoit pays very well for my company. Not that I wouldn't do it for free, you understand, but he insists. An escort. This glamorous, elegant, intelligent woman. Marcella chuckled. The expression on your face is why I love to tell Americans the truth about Benoit and me, about what I do. He's quite open about it, you see? We're consenting adults. Ori grinned. Hey, no judgment here. As long as it's consensual, have at it. Being an escort is my choice, Ori, but it is not my occupation. I do it because I enjoy sex with handsome men. At the same time, I prefer to live alone. They chatted a little while longer, then Ori remembered something. Do you know anything about someone called Viola? I believe she was one of Maceo's friends. The smile faded from Marcella's face, and she sighed. Poor girl. She was murdered horribly too, shot with a crossbow. Ori felt sick. Gosh, who would do that? 
They haven't found anyone responsible yet. Benoit broke into their conversation, and Ori realized the two men had been listening to them. Alex is a mess, until he knows why he can't move past it. The rest of the dinner was a more somber affair after that, and Ori regretted asking. As she and Maceo were being driven back to the George V, she looked over at him. Maceo. He smiled at her. What is it, Bella? I'm sorry for asking about Alex's girlfriend. It's okay. It's playing on all of our minds. Did you know her well? He nodded but said nothing more. He took her hand and kissed the back of her fingers. Caro, there's something we need to talk about when we get to the hotel. Ori's heart started to pound uncomfortably. No, not yet. I'm not ready for you to dump me. Not here, not now, please, but she just smiled and said, okay. In the hotel room, he led her out to the balcony and pulled her onto his lap. Ori, something has been bothering me this evening. I hope I didn't ruin our evening. Of course not, Maceo, but what's wrong? Maceo sighed. I know how people see me, and a lot of it has to do with my past behavior. With the opposite sex, I mean. I'm sure Lucia warned you away from me. Ori grinned, hoping to lighten the atmosphere by teasing him. Warn doesn't really cover it. Maceo gave a small chuckle. You see? What chance do I stand? But Ori, these last few days with you, I feel so differently that I'm having trouble reconciling it. You make me want to see if I could do it, if I could commit. Ori stared at him, shocked. What? He rolled his eyes. I'm telling you I'm crazy about you, Orianthi Roy. Every emotion that flooded her body left her speechless. No. No, this was a line, surely. This was what men like him did, made you fall for them and then dumped you. It was a game. Maceo was a world-class player. I don't believe you, she said flatly and slid from his arms, pacing the room. Maceo watched her, his eyes never leaving her face. Why is so hard to believe that someone might love you, Ori? She didn't answer him, just turned hurt eyes on him. Don't. Please, Maceo. It's your stepfather, isn't it? Ori felt all the air being pushed out of her lungs. Maceo saw through her to the frightened little girl that she was. She stared at him but saw no malice in his looks. He stood and came to her, but she backed away. Don't touch me or I'll break. Her back hit the wall, but Maceo wouldn't let her run, trapping her in the cage of his arms. Bella. Mio Amata. His voice was soft and tender. What the hell did he do to you? Ori stared back at him, her eyes filling with tears. Maceo, please don't do this. I can't. He stroked her face. I can see it in your eyes, my love. Whatever that man has done to you, I'll make him pay for it. She pushed her way out of his arms. Don't promise things you can't deliver. Maceo sighed. Why are you so afraid of sharing your life with me? I'm not ready, she exclaimed, pain shooting through her. If I tell you, it'll make it real and... Tears came now and she choked on her words. Her cell phone beeped and grateful for the distraction, she picked up the phone. Voicemail. She listened to it, her face pale. Maceo watched the different emotions running across her face and waited until she ended the call. It's AJ, she said in a dull voice, he's in a rehab facility in New York. That was his physician. He's had a relapse in his depression. He needs me. Maceo, I'm sorry. I have to go to him. Maceo nodded. Of course, we will fly out immediately. We. Ori closed her eyes. No, Maceo, I can't let you get involved. It's too much to ask. But Maceo would not be shut out, and a couple of hours later, they were on a plane to the States. Ori was in turmoil. On the one hand, she was grateful to Maceo for his kindness. On the other, she didn't want to drag him into this part of her life, the part where she was unhappy, into her family drama. If Tyson knew about Maceo, who knew what he would do? 
Tyson Yannick was violently jealous and possessive over Ori. He had paid past boyfriends off or blackmailed them into leaving her alone. She knew Maceo would not be so easily gotten rid of, and it frightened her to think what depths Tyson would sink to. The thought of anything happening to Maceo. Ori knew then, at that moment, that the worst thing had happened. She was in love with Maceo Bartoli. She closed her eyes, willing the tears not to come, but then felt his lips on her forehead. Tell me, he said softly and wrapped his arms around her. And so, in the confines of his private jet, Ori told him the horrors of her family, of how broken she was, and how her stepfather had tormented her her whole life. What do you mean he's not here? Ori's voice was growing shriller by the minute, as she stood in the very well-appointed reception of the Pinigap Rehabilitation Facility. The director looked at her with sympathy. I'm sorry, Ms. Roy. Mr. Yannick removed his son from the facility yesterday, as he has power of attorney, there was nothing we could do. I do have some of Adam's possessions that he forgot in a rush. Would you like to take them to him? Ori nodded, feeling bleak. Tyson had done this on purpose, to show her he was still in control. She guessed he would not easily give up where AJ was. Maceo stood beside her silently, his hand on the small of her back protectively. She looked at him and shook her head, and he nodded. She wanted to scream and rant, but she was damned if she would do it here. The director came back with a plastic bag. Just a few items, but he may want them in the future. Ori thanked the director, and she and Maceo returned to Maceo's town car. Ori opened the bag and took out an empty money clip, a copy of The Sun Also Rises, a Jay's favorite book, and the burner phone she had gotten him. Screw that bastard, she hissed and showed Maceo the phone. He knew AJ and I would talk. He's cutting us off from each other. Maceo looked angry. Bella, I will help you find him. I have a fleet of private investigators here in New York that I can put on the case right now if you'd like. Yannick won't be able to hide AJ forever. Ori smiled at him gratefully. That would be wonderful, Maceo. I can't thank you enough. I'm sorry you had to get involved in this bullshit. Don't be sorry, just be ready to fight. Maceo nodded grimly. Because one way or another, Yannick is going down. AJ Yannick sat on the bunk of his new cell. It was luxurious, he had to give his dad that, but cold and sterile. The reason he had chosen Pinigap was because it had outside space and places he could spend time sketching or watching the birds in the trees. Tyson had arrived yesterday and had barely given A.J. the time to acknowledge his presence before he was whisked away in Tyson's bulletproof car to this place. A.J. put his head in his hands. He didn't even have his phone to call Ori now. Tyson had forbidden calls, and the staff here was obviously under strict instructions not to help A.J. at all. A.J. wondered if this was even a hospital or just one of Yannick's businesses that he used to launder cash. Yeah, Dad. I know all about the illegal activities. And you know that too, don't you? It's why you destroyed my peace of mind and undermined my confidence so much so I couldn't function. And what you did to me and Ori? What would the good people of the United States think of the congressman if they knew the real truth? Despair flooded through him and he slumped back on his bed. What the hell am I going to do now? He hoped that when Ori discovered he was gone from Pinigap that she would come for him, but he knew without a doubt that Tyson would try to stop her, and AJ was under no illusions of the grotesque ways in which his father would try to stop her. Ori had insisted on going to see Tyson, demanding to know where her brother was. I don't want him to even think for a moment he has won, she raged to Maceo. I'm going to go in there, to his office, in front of his staff, and demand he tells me. Maceo wasn't enamored of the idea, but knew he wouldn't be able to stop her. At least let me come with you. Ori shook her head. No, not this time, Maceo. Don't get me wrong. I'm so grateful that you're helping me, but I want to keep you as my secret weapon. So far, no one knows we are together. Tyson will threaten me and tell me I'm powerless, that I have no one. 
I want to see his face when I drop you on him. Maceo nodded slowly. Okay, I can get on board with that. Just, I worry about your safety. Which is why I'll make sure I confront him in front of people. She kissed Maceo gently. I will be fine. Take a recording device or keep your phone on. Record every word he says. It might turn out to be useful. So when Ori walked into Tyson Yannick's office the next day, she was wearing a wire. Downstairs, Maceo and one of his private detectives sat in his car, listening. Ori marched straight to Maceo's secretary, a thin-lipped blonde who had never liked her. Janine, please tell my stepfather I would like to see him. Do you have an appointment? Janine shot back spitefully. Ori gave her a wintry smile and fixed her with a stare. Now, Janine. Ori's voice was low but full of threat, and Janine sighed, pushing back her chair and getting up. Wait here, please. Oh, I will. Ori gritted her teeth. Janine disappeared into Yannick's office for a moment, and Ori could hear her nasal whine through the open door. Orianthi, come in, please. Oh, no. I'd like to speak to you out here, Congressman. I'm very busy, Orianthi. Please come in and stop wasting time. Sighing, Ori pushed past a smirking Janine who closed the door behind her. Ori was alone with Tyson. He didn't look up for a second, scrawling on a pad in front of him. Sit down, Ori. She stayed standing, and when he finally looked up, he smirked. Still playing childish games, I see. Where's AJ? Ori was clenching her fists into balls, trying not to lose her temper. Tyson leaned back in his chair. He's safe. In a much better place than that two-bit facility he chose. Or did you choose it for him? Ori gritted her teeth. He's an adult, Tyson. A legal adult. And even if he weren't? Even if he weren't, he would still be my son, Orianthi. My son, my blood. Do you think you have rights over my son? He's my brother. Half-brother. Screw you, Tyson. I'll find him on my own. Tyson laughed. Such a potty mouth on such a pretty girl. And my, you do look ravishing. Perhaps you have been away. Italy, perhaps? Ori stopped. What? Tyson's smile dropped, and he suddenly stood and darted toward her. He gripped her hands and yanked her toward him. Ori gave a small cry of alarm. Tyson smiled. I know where you've been, Orianthi. I know who you've been fucking. He buried his face in her neck and breathed deeply. You stink of your Italian billionaire, do you know that? Where was your concern for my son when you were spreading your legs for Maceo Bartoli? Tyson slipped his hand between her legs, grabbing at her crotch. His other hand snaked around her waist tightly. Ori struggled to free herself. Get off me, you bastard. Tyson laughed, running his hands up and down her body. This was mine well before he touched it, he growled. It belongs to me. He stopped suddenly and ripped open her blouse. The wire she was wearing was pinned to her bra. Snarling, he grabbed it and yanked it free. Ori felt pure terror. Tyson grabbed his letter opener and held it to her skin. Freaking little bitch. Think you can win against me? Let me tell you something, little girl. I can end you whenever I want, and they wouldn't even find your body. No one would care. What would happen if I drove this into you right now? Would your bastard Italian come for me? Let him try. Ori rammed her knee hard into Tyson's groin and he buckled. Furious instead of scared now, Ori pulled her blouse together, fingers fumbling at the buttons. That's the last time you will ever touch me, she said, her voice shaking. Now, where is my brother? She knew Maceo had heard Tyson attack her, along with her wire being destroyed, and was on his way even now. It gave her strength she never knew she had. Tyson was recovering now, and he gazed at her with absolute malevolence. I'll tell you, Ori. I'll tell you at the exact same time my knife sinks into your gut, you little bitch. When your blood is on my hands, that's when you'll know you will never be able to escape me. You'll never see AJ again. 
At that moment the door burst open and Maceo, all terrible beauty and rage, flew into the room and knocked Tyson Yannick across the room. Ori grabbed Maceo before he could launch another attack on her stepfather. Maceo, stop. I'm okay. Let's go. This pathetic piece of shit isn't worth it. We'll find AJ on our own. Maceo looked like he would like to pound Tyson into the ground, but instead, he let Ori lead him out of the office. It was only when they reached the car that Ori started to tremble, as all the adrenaline left her body. As they drove back to the hotel, Ori told him everything. He threatened to kill you? Maceo was beyond livid. Ori gave a humorless laugh. Not for the first time, Maceo. He's been doing that since he first raped me. Maceo launched into a torrent of Italian curse words, some of which Ori understood but mostly she just let him rant. Finally, he looked at her. I want to kill him. She touched his cheek. You and me both, baby, but it won't help AJ. He's the priority. They stayed in New York for a week before finally catching a break. A woman, a secretary from Tyson's office, called Ori from a payphone. I know what that bastard is like, she told Ori, so please don't let him know I told you this. She told them where AJ was being held, as she described it. It's not even a real place, just one of your stepfather's tax wrangles. Ori and Maceo traveled up to the place near Westchester with an entourage of Maceo's staff. They outnumbered Tyson's weak security team easily, and then Ori was inside. She found AJ's cell, appalled that he was locked in. The half-siblings hugged each other. Ori saw how much weight AJ had lost and despaired. Her brother looked close to the edge. Come on. We're taking you out of here. Maceo had arranged for them all to go to his friend Alex Millen's place for a time before deciding what to do next. It will be safer for both of you, he said to Ori and AJ, who smiled at him. I like him, AJ said with a grin and Ori flushed with pleasure. Maceo immediately fell into the role of big brother with AJ and Ori couldn't help but be overwhelmed with gratitude. One afternoon, Ori was taking a nap. Maceo watched her sleep for a while, studying every curve of her face, every line and the way her dark, thick lashes fell onto her cheeks. In his 39 years, he had never felt like this about anyone. It was overwhelming. He pressed his lips to her forehead, then went to find AJ. He found him in Alex's study, hunkered down with a pile of books on the table next to him. AJ grinned at him. I hope Alex doesn't mind. He wouldn't. I'd hoped he'd be around more, but he's so tied up in the investigation to find Viola's killer. AJ nodded, his smile fading. Poor guy. Is that what the police came to see you about yesterday? Yeah, they wanted to interview everyone Viola was friends or acquaintances with. I knew her first, you see, before Alex. AJ looked at him with interest. I saw a photograph of her, she looks like my sister. Maceo nodded. The resemblance is uncanny, actually, not just physically but personality-wise. AJ looked bleak. Maceo, Ori told me that my father threatened to kill her. I don't doubt for a second that he's capable. Nothing is going to happen to Ori, AJ, zero I promise you that. AJ stared out of the window. I keep thinking. I'm Ori's only tie to Dad. If it weren't for me, she could be free. Maceo felt a jolt. Kiddo, don't think like that. Ori would take your dad's abuse again and again, as long as she had you. There was a long silence. He raped her. Yes. Do you think she was protecting me by not telling anyone? The police? Maceo felt awkward. I don't know. Another long silence. Dad used to get in these rages after Ori left home. He would rant and rave and drink himself into oblivion while completely obsessing about her. Maceo got the feeling that AJ was trying to tell him something. AJ, whatever you need to get off your chest, if you need it to stay between you and me, that's okay. AJ nodded, and in a halting voice he began to tell Maceo just how much of a monster Tyson Yannick was. 
You're quiet, Ori said as they got into bed that night. Is everything okay? Maceo tried to smile. As long as you're with me, it is. He smoothed his hand down her side, feeling the dip of her waist and the curve of her hips. Orianthi Roy, it's been less than a month and look what you've done to me. Ori smiled and pressed her lips to his. Look what you've done for me. Thank you, Maceo. You've gone above and beyond for a girl you didn't know a few weeks ago. That's not possible, he joked, but then gathered her to him. Ms. Roy, you have changed my life. And you mine, she smiled, as he rolled her onto her back and wrapped her legs around him. Her body trembled at every silky touch of his hands, and when his mouth found her, she sighed and closed her eyes. Gosh, this man. She gasped as his teeth grazed her one after another. How on earth could any woman let this man out of her life? Oh gosh, Maceo. She never wanted this moment to end, this perfect moment with this wonderful man. They fell asleep in each other's arms soon afterward but, plagued by vicious nightmares, Ori slept badly and gave up at 3 a.m., sliding carefully out of bed she slipped into her t-shirt and shorts and wrapped her robe around her. She padded down to the kitchen and opened the refrigerator for some milk. Pouring herself a glass, she set it down on the counter to put the milk carton away, not seeing the man sitting in the corner of the room. Hi, Ori. She started with a small cry then, when she saw it was Alex Milland, she laughed a little. Hand on her chest, she smiled at him. I didn't see you there. Sorry, I was just... She indicated the glass, and he nodded. Sorry, I didn't mean to startle you. It's just for a moment you looked just like her. Viola. Ori's heart twisted in sympathy, and she went to sit by him at the long kitchen table. Are you okay? We were hoping to see you for dinner. Alex, his eyes tired and sad, tried to smile. More wasted time, I'm afraid. Did Maceo talk to the police? He did. Did you know he was the one who introduced me to Viola? Ori nodded. I did. I was thinking about that just then when you came in, and it made me wonder. Your resemblance to her. Ori suddenly saw where this was going, and felt alarmed. Alex, you don't think Maceo could have had anything to do with her murder, do you? Alex sighed and rubbed his eyes. No, of course not. It wasn't like that, more like you're obviously his type, so then why did he give Viola up to me? Ori tried to smile. We aren't the same person, no matter how much we look alike, Alex. No, of course not. I'm sorry. I'm so tired that nothing makes sense anymore. Let's change the subject, how's your brother? Doing better, Ori smiled at him. I think he's in love with your library. Alex laughed. Then he has good taste. You're always welcome to stay as long as you like. You're very kind. I really am sorry about Viola. Thank you. Alex drained his glass of scotch and stood. I'm going to try and grab some sleep. See you in the morning. Good night. Alone, Ori wandered into the living room and slipped through the French windows into the garden. The grounds were beautiful, but now, here in the moonlight, Ori felt as if she were being watched. Was it just paranoia? She had kept the shock of Tyson's threats internalized for the most part, not wanting to goad Maceo into doing something that would get him into trouble. But she was under no illusions that her stepfather meant her no harm. She could go to the press, her relationship with Maceo giving her some kind of credence, she supposed. The feminist in her cringed at that, but it was true. Maceo was as powerful as Tyson, if not more. His backing would mean they could take down Tyson, but there was still AJ to think about. He was Tyson's son, and Ori would hate to see him hounded by the press. Sighing, she went inside and went to bed, snuggling into the warmth of Maceo's arms. Tonight was not the night to try and figure it all out. She was asleep long before Alex Milland opened the door to their room and looked in on them. I want to find another facility, AJ told them over breakfast. Somewhere that's hardcore, that Dad can't finagle his way into. I truly believe I can get past all this crap, if I get the right help. 
Ori put her hand over her brother's. Whatever you want, AJ. I'm here for you. We're here for you, Maceo corrected with a grin. You deserve the best, brother, and both of you, you're not to worry about the cost. I have it covered. Just pick the best one for you, AJ, and we'll get you in there as soon as you want. Ori, too emotional to speak, hugged Maceo and he kissed the top of her head. AJ looked at him admiringly. Maceo, man, I don't know how to thank you. A look passed between the two men of understanding, of brotherhood. Ori was aware they had talked, but she didn't want to intrude. She looked up at Maceo as AJ started to talk to Alex, and she pressed her lips to his. I love you, she said quietly, and Maceo chuckled, his eyes shining. Ti amo, he murmured against her lips and her heart soared. Maybe everything would be okay, after all. A week later, gosh had it really only been three weeks since they met, they were on their way back to Italy. AJ had been transferred to a facility in California, and although Ori was reluctant to leave him, AJ had insisted she go back to her new life, her new job. Try not to dwell on Dad, he said. He can't touch either of us now. Maceo is a good man. Enjoy yourself, Ori. You deserve every happiness. Sometimes AJ seemed much wiser than his 18 years, Ori pondered now as she sat beside Maceo on his private jet. Now her thoughts were turning back to her new job and her old friend. Lucia had returned from Monte Carlo and had been amazed at Ori's news. Ori omitted the part where she and Maceo were sleeping together, and in love, Ori grinned to herself now. She wanted to tell Lucia that particular news face to face. She wondered if Lucia would be happy for her, or whether her friend would remonstrate with her for falling for her boss after Lucia's warnings. She looked over at Maceo now. He looked glorious, but tired. He hadn't been sleeping well, she knew, and deep inside, she was worried because it seemed like it had been since the I love yous that he'd been restless. Was he regretting showing his hand so soon? He had said he was ready for commitment, but maybe it had all been too much. Her stepfather, AJ, the thing about Viola, it was a lot to put on a man who only a few weeks ago had been carefree and screwing his way around the world's most beautiful women. Ouch. Ori pushed that thought away. No. Don't dwell. Just live and love and everything will be okay. Maceo looked up and caught her watching him. He grinned and her insides went to mush. Are you all right, Bella? I'm with you. Of course I'm okay. Maceo put his laptop down and slid next to her, taking her in his arms. Il mio amore, when we get back to Venice, I would like you to move in with me. I want to know you are safe every minute. I want you to feel safe. And loved. Above all else, loved. Ori was floored and suddenly nervous. Really? Really? As she looked into his sea-green eyes and at their honesty, she knew what her answer would be. Lucia rolled her eyes but hugged Ori anyway. I might have known. For what it's worth, I've never seen him like this before, so I guess it must be love. Ori was relieved that her friend was okay with her sleeping with her boss. She and Maceo kept things professional at the office, and she was grateful that she was learning from him too. She saw the way he dealt with his clients. He was definitely on the side of the artists, and got them the best deals while maintaining good relationships with his buyers. His team too was ultra-efficient, and Ori found them all inclusive and helpful. Even Cassie had seemed to change her mind about Ori, and now she enjoyed the other woman's company. They would often go for lunch together, and talk about back home. Cassie was from Virginia, a Rhodes Scholar and art historian by education. I just wanted to come to Italy to travel, but then I met Maceo and that was that. Snap, said Ori, smiling, but inside wondered if Maceo had gotten all of his staff the way he'd hired her, by screwing them. Cassie was watching her carefully. No is the answer to the question you're not asking, she said with a wry grin. I had a boyfriend when I met Maceo, one that I loved very much. So no, Maceo and I didn't sleep together. Ori was scarlet-faced. I, um, 
Ori, let's be real. Everyone knows you and Maceo are together. We're cool with it, so relax. Cassie was grinning at her knowingly now, and Ori had to laugh. Ori rolled over in bed and stretched. It had been two months since she'd returned to Italy and moved in with Maceo, and it had been bliss. Utter complete heaven, she thought now. Her body ached pleasantly from making love most of the night, and now on this Saturday she and Maceo had plans to do nothing. From the whirlwind of work, it was really the first time they had spent together that was free of work commitments, and Ori was really looking forward to just hanging out with him. They had become good friends as well as lovers, equal partners in their relationship despite Maceo's imposing wealth. Ori never felt at a disadvantage with him, even living in his opulent apartment. She wondered where he'd gone now, maybe to fetch some breakfast. She got up and pulled her robe around her body. As she suspected, Maceo was in the kitchen, fighting with his new espresso machine and cursing loudly in Italian. He was bare-chested just in his jeans, and she slid her arms around his waist. Buon giorno, beautiful. He bent his head to kiss her. She kissed him. He groaned, and she giggled as he lifted her onto the countertop. Gosh, woman, you make me crazy. They collapsed to the floor together. Bella, I love being with you, I really do, he said, puffing for air. But God knows how we're going to get anything else done. She wound her arms around his neck. Today, my love, we don't have to. And so they lazed around the apartment, making love and talking, sending out for pizza when they got hungry. The day went by too quickly for Ori's liking. Maceo grinned at her sulky face. Mio caro, tomorrow is Sunday. We can do it all over again. But a phone call changed everything in a heartbeat. At first, Ori frowned at the unknown cell phone number on her caller ID, but when she answered it the blood in her veins turned to ice and her legs gave way under her. Maceo took the phone from her and talked to the person on the other end. By the time he ended the call, he knew that Ori's world had just collapsed and felt helpless to know how to fix it. Not even his money could help her now. AJ was dead. They told her it was a suicide, but that they had not seen any signs of it. AJ had been doing well in his new program, and had even talked about getting an apartment away from the facility with a friend he'd met there. Everything had seemed good, and when Ori had talked to him, he had been upbeat and positive. Then, Friday afternoon, an orderly had found him on the concrete path outside the building. He had leapt from the roof. He was killed instantly, his brain smashed from his head by the impact. A numb Ori let Maceo make all the arrangements for her, and they flew to California to claim his body and arrange the funeral. But Tyson Yannick had gotten there first, and now, with the tragic suicide of his son, he was a media darling again, all past mistakes forgiven. Ori sat through a media circus of a funeral, arranged by Tyson. It had been the exact opposite of what A.J. would have wanted. Maceo kissed her gently. Are you sure you'll be okay if I go out? I won't be long. Ori nodded. They were in a hotel in San Francisco. Ori had not wanted to go back to Italy yet, wanting to be near A.J.'s grave a little while longer. Maceo had other plans. He was going to see Tyson Yannick, not that he told Ori that. Tyson Yannick was going to pay for what happened to A.J. and for what he'd done to Ori. He walked into the restaurant where Tyson Yannick was eating breakfast with a Weasley-looking lackey. Maceo strode up to the table and glared at the aide. Fuck off. Now. The aide paled but looked at Tyson who nodded. Maceo took the seat the aide vacated and stared at Yannick. Tyson sipped his coffee slowly, seemingly unfazed in the face of Maceo's overwhelming anger. What do you want, Bartoli? Maceo gave him a chilly smile. Only to tell you that once Ori is ready, we will be going to the authorities about the sustained and continued abuse she suffered at your hands. Tyson shrugged. And who is going to believe her? Where's the proof? Maceo's smile dropped, and his eyes took on a dangerous gleam. 
I suppose you think the press, now that you're playing the grieving father card, will slam her for taking advantage at this time? They'll paint her a gold digger? I think not. I have a feeling the press will soon be against you, Yannick, and the scandal you've just weathered will seem like a walk in the park. Tyson laughed loudly. Really? And where are you getting this fairy tale from? Maceo sat back, studying him carefully. Because this world is fucked up, and because it blames the victim rather than the perpetrator, especially if the victim is female, you probably think, hey, who's going to believe her? Tyson inclined his head, and Maceo leaned forward. Then how do you think the press will respond to a father raping his own son, Yannick? You piece of utter shit. AJ told me everything. To Maceo's satisfaction, Yannick paled. What the hell are you talking about? You know damn well. You raped AJ just like you did Ori. You're a monster, and believe me, I'm going to make sure the world knows it. Maceo got up and stalked out of the restaurant. Tyson stared after him, then plucked his cell phone out of his pocket. It's me. He's just left. Do it now. Ori had just gotten dressed when Maceo called her. I'm on my way back now, Bella. I'll see you soon. Ori smiled. Good. I missed you. She scooped her long dark hair into a messy ponytail and grabbed her book from the nightstand, intending to read until Maceo got back. As she walked back into the main suite, a movement caught her eye. She turned and he was on her. A masked figure twice her size threw her to the ground. Ori, her mind panicked and confused, had no time to fight back as the attacker brandished a knife. Oh gosh. No please. Ori had no time to scream. Even tied. Paris. Benoit Vox's eyebrows shot up. You're getting married? Marcella, his good friend and companion, laughed, throwing her dark hair back. Mon cher, there are other reasons for me to give up the escort life, not just for another man. No, Benoit, I'm not getting married. But I am leaving the country. You know I've always wanted to travel, and now is the right time. She touched his cheek. My sweet boy, there are a million women ready to take my place in your bed. Or maybe it's time you concentrated on finding her. Her. I think the young people call it the one. Marcella smiled and swung her long legs over the side of the bed. Benoit reached for her before she could move away. Marcella, have you ever thought that you might just be the only one for me? Marcella smiled down at him. Oh, you perfect man, I'm sorry to tell you this. There isn't any chance I might be your one. Go and seek her. I wish you all the happiness in the world. Benoit was still thinking about what she said the next day, as he sat through the first meeting of the week. His chief exec, Delane, always wanted these godawful meetings. Team building, he called it. Benoit barely listened to what was being discussed. How had his life come to this? Stuck in meetings, barely ever getting to do the things he loved, designing, building, creating. No, at this point it was all deals and accounts and bullshit. He edged his chair around to gaze out of the window, while one of his accountants droned on. Outside his window his city, his home, Paris, sprawled across his view. He had been to many places and many countries, but no city made his pulse race more than his birthplace. Being able to build here and giving people homes to build their families in, it had been his dream. He gradually tuned back into the conversation. Always about the bottom line, he thought now, listening to Delane remonstrate with the money men. Benoit cleared his throat. It made him smile, how that always made everyone in the room shut the hell up and pay attention. He leaned forward. Gentlemen, I want to move forward with the development on Le Boulevard Coutance. It's prime greenbelt land, and I'm not going to let it sit there any longer. We fought to acquire it, and God knows the 13th arrondissement is in need of it. So please, no more talk of budgets or waiting until we have the full budget. Let's begin. After the meeting, he headed gratefully back to his office where his PA, Genevieve, a striking woman in her late fifties, handed him a shot of thick, dark coffee and his mail. 
A woman from L'Institut des Préoccupations Environnement Tales has called six times this morning. She wants to set up a meeting. Which woman? Shiloh Hunt. Genevieve followed him into his office, her notepad in hand. She seems quite intent on speaking to you. Benoit sighed. The French environmental lobby had become powerful over the last few years, and L'Institut des Préoccupations Environnement Tales had influence with the government's housing department. Major influence, he thought now. Fine. Fine fifteen minutes. Genevieve hid a smile. How about right now? Benoit, looking at her over his spectacles, looked confused. Huh? She's right outside. You walked right past her. Benoit got up and returned to the outer office. A young willowy blonde looked up at him from behind huge black-framed glasses. Miss Holt? She stood, and Benoit was surprised to see she was almost as tall as his six feet, maybe five ten even in flat pumps. Her long ash-blonde hair hung below her shoulders in soft waves, and her bright blue eyes regarded him without even a hint of friendliness. Benoit smiled knowing he was about to get into a fight. Miss Holt, please come in. He shot a look at Genevieve as Shiloh Holt stalked past him. Genevieve hid a smile. Shiloh Holt didn't wait to be asked to sit. As Benoit walked to his desk, he heard her draw in a deep breath. Mr. Vo, I am here on behalf of L'Institut des Préoccupations Environnement Tales. I know, Miss Holt. Please have a seat. Shiloh blinked and looked down at the chair in front of her as if it hadn't occurred to her to sit. She pulled it out and sat, rather impatiently. Mr. Vo. It's Benoit, and I know where you're from, Miss Holt. I assume this has to do with the new development, on Le Boulevard Coutance? She inclined her head, slightly mollified. It does. Mr. Vo, as I'm sure you know, we are campaigning to stop any further development on this piece of Greenbelt land. We feel strongly that we must protect the rapidly diminishing green spaces in our city. Benoit smiled. Our city. Ms. Holt, if I'm not mistaken, that's an American accent. And it's Benoit, not Mr. Vo. Mr. Vo, Shiloh said, her blue eyes flashing with annoyance. I was born here in Paris. I hold dual nationality. My parents are French. Where did you go to get that accent? Shiloh looked frustrated. This is not what I came here to talk about. Where? She sighed. Brown. Then Harvard Law. Good. Benoit leaned forward, his manner switching from amused to businesslike. Ms. Holt, as you are probably aware, my company vets every piece of land we intend to acquire. One of the main tenets of our ethos is that we exhaust every possible reason not to purchase the land be it financial, social, or environmental. The land on Le Boulevard Coutance was deemed non-vital. It also has great links into the center of the city, and a thriving community being built up around it. Shiloh was listening to him carefully. Mr. Vo, Paris has less than 10% of green space in a city whose population grows larger every second. That community of which you speak needs parks and recreational places too. Your boutique apartments or hotels will not benefit that community. They will be priced out of the market, making it more difficult for the people who were born there to stay there. That's true of any developed land, Benoit said calmly. If we considered that as a factor every time we purchased land, nothing would ever get built. We cannot take responsibility for people's lack of finances or their situations. This is a business, not a charity. While he was talking, Benoit was studying the fine planes of her delicate face and the slender frame of her body. Despite her height, he still felt as if she would crumble in his arms if he touched her. She had a kind of fragility that he was drawn to. Shiloh was staring at him, her expression disgusted. Which is my entire problem with men like you, Mr. Vo. You are soulless. You exist in this otherworldly plane, one where your wealth and your looks open every door. Have you ever struggled to feed yourself, Mr. Vo? Benoit sighed. The anger in her made her face flush scarlet, and it was very distracting. I think we have wandered from the point. 
Shiloh sucked in a deep breath. Mr. Vo, I'm asking you to reconsider. No. I'm sorry, Ms. Holt, but this meeting is over. We have done our due diligence. The development goes ahead. Shiloh looked askance. You won't even consider my proposal? Benoit sat back in his chair. Ms. Holt, so far you haven't made any proposal. You have ranted at me and called me soulless. Now I have work to do. Genevieve will see you out. Shiloh gaped at him in silence for a beat, then stood and stalked out. He appreciatively watched the way she moved. A beautiful woman, he thought, but a major pain in my ass. Shame. He called Genevieve back in and got on with his work. Only later when he was alone did he let his mind wander back to Shiloh Holt's blue eyes, the flush of pink in her cheeks and the rosebud mouth. He wondered if he would see her again. Penny for them. Benoit looked up to see his old friend Alex standing in the doorway. Benoit's face cracked into a wide smile. Mon frere. How wonderful to see you. I had no idea you were coming to Paris. Had to get away from the crap going down at home, Alex shrugged his eyes sad. Benoit stood and hugged him. Let's go grab a drink and you can catch me up. Ori started to come around just as she heard Maceo calling her name. She opened her eyes and his beautiful face, frantic with fear, filled her vision. Ori. Are you okay? Dio mio, mio amata. She felt herself being scooped into his arms and carried to the bed. She heard him yelling instructions to someone to call for medical help. Her entire body ached and she remembered being forced to the ground a man, his knife. Had she been stabbed? Everything seemed so jumbled that she couldn't figure out her own body. The only thing she knew for sure was who was behind the attack. Tyson. Gosh, he'd sent someone to kill her, hadn't he? He was making his final moves. Now that AJ had died, she was the only threat left to him. Flashes of the attack were coming back to her as she tried to focus on Maceo's face. He was talking to her, his arms cradling her. Finally, her head started to clear. Maceo. What happened, baby? There was someone here. He grabbed me. He had a knife. She heard Maceo's sharp intake of breath and felt his hands running over her body, trying to find any wounds. You have some cuts and scratches, baby, but I don't think you've been stabbed. Your head is bleeding. I must have fallen when he grabbed me. I hit my head. She tried to sit up, but Maceo locked his arms around her. Take it easy, Bella. We're going to get you checked out. Ori sighed, but relaxed back into his arms, gazing up at his face. His green eyes were full of concern and shock. I'm okay, I think, Maceo. I just don't know why I'm still alive. She saw him wince. Don't say that. It was Tyson. I know it. Or one of his men. I just don't know why he didn't kill me. Maceo frowned. It wasn't Tyson himself, Ori. I know that for sure. How? Because I was just with him. Ori did sit up now, her head pounding. You were with Tyson? There was no reproach in her voice. She trusted Maceo enough now that he would have only met with Tyson to benefit her. Maceo nodded. To warn him to stay away from you. I think he got the message. He must have had us followed and called someone to attack me while you were out of the way. Except? She trailed off deep in thought. Absent-mindedly she pressed the heel of her hand to her head, wincing when her skin touched the open wound there. Maceo was watching her. Except what, Mio Caro? Ori nodded her head. If it had been Tyson, I would be dead. He sent enough warnings. He would have taken the chance to end it, even if it meant not killing me with his own hands. That's his ultimate goal, I know it. Maceo moaned. Please stop talking like that. Ori tried to smile, taking his hand. It's been my reality for over a decade, Maceo. Why do you think I've kept moving? If I stand still he's got me and I'll be dead. Maceo swore in Italian and got up, just as someone knocked at the door. The paramedics examined Ori. 
I think it's just a bad concussion, but we should still take you in for tests. Maceo shut down Ori's protests and rode with her in the ambulance. Once at the hospital, he arranged a private room for her and settled her in. Ori, despite her hatred of hospitals, felt some of the stress of the day falling away, and when the doctor had seen her and prescribed some strong painkillers, she felt herself drifting to sleep, Maceo holding her hand, ready to spend the night in the chair next to her bed. The nightmare hit her with full force. She was back in their hotel room, curled up on the bed asleep when he entered the room. Weirdly, she knew he was male even though he was entirely clad in black from head to toe. He forced her onto her back, and in the dream she complied, watching him dispassionately as he pushed her t-shirt up and raised the lethal-looking blade in the air. It was only when he pulled off his mask that she began to scream. Maceo. No, no, please, not you, not you, my love. Maceo drove the knife into her over and over as she screamed out her love for him, and she felt every inch of the cold, hard steel as it sliced into her tender flesh. She was begging him to stop, but he didn't listen, her blood soaking them both. As she died, she felt his lips against hers and heard him whisper to her, calling her by an unfamiliar name. Viola. For a few minutes when she woke, Ori did not open her eyes. The nightmare had been so vivid and so visceral that she did not want to see the man next to her, Maceo, and associate him with the monster who had slaughtered her in her dream. Gosh. She felt nauseous, tormented. She struggled with her senses, then opened her eyes. Maceo, his head on the bed, his chair pulled up close, looked twenty years younger when he slept, the furrows and lines of his face smoothed out. His fingers were interwoven with hers, and his dark lashes rested on his olive skin. A small scar at the corner of his right eye curved around like a half-moon, and Ori reached out to stroke it, her body relaxing. Gosh, how I love you, she thought, and as he stirred, opened his eyes and gazed at her, she smiled at him. Good morning, handsome. Maceo blinked a couple of times, still looking like a young kid, then sat up, rubbing his head to try and wake up. He pressed his lips against hers. How do you feel? Ori nodded. Okay, actually. I had some weird dreams, but I feel good. Maceo sighed. Thank God. He moved next to her so he could take her in his arms. Ori snuggled into the warmth of his broad chest. Can we get out of here soon? I want to go home. His lips were against her temple. If the doctor says you're good, we can change hotels, I'll make the arrangements. No, I mean home. She looked up and smiled at his surprised expression. Home, home? Venice. I don't want to be in the same country as Tyson Yannick. Maceo grinned. You don't need to persuade me, Bella. Four hours later, they were on a flight to Venice. As Ori slept beside him, Maceo was talking to his head of security back in San Francisco. I want to know who was behind the attack. If it's Yannick, we get the proof and go to the police and the press. I've already looked into it, boss, Greg, the calm security expert, told him. From what I've found out, when you left your meeting with Yannick, he gave the order to follow you, but if it was one of his guys who attacked your lady, then it was a rogue operation. Yannick wants to kill her himself, not get some lackey to do it. The dude has a seriously fucked up obsession with his stepdaughter. I don't think this was him. Dread started to curl in Maceo's stomach. Then who? Greg sighed. We don't know yet. I'll call you when we found something out. Maceo drew in a breath. So we're being followed? From a distance. We're not letting anyone too close, believe me, but you're leaving the States will probably ping their radar, and they know where to find you in Venice. Sure, it's a good idea to go back. I won't be run out of my own city by these figly di putana, Maceo said in a low voice. Ori and I will make our family there. We have our home there, our work. Greg, who had been with Maceo for many years, gave a low, soft chuckle. Boss, have to say, I've never heard you like this. Maceo smiled. Never felt like this. Keep me informed. He went to check on Ori, who was asleep in the small bedroom at the back of the private plane. 
He watched her sleep for a few minutes before lying down next to her and pressing his lips to hers. Ori opened her eyes and smiled, her lips curving up against his, and without speaking, he pushed her onto her back and covered her body with his. He smoothed her hair away from her face, gazing down at her, his eyes questioning. Ori nodded, a tiny movement. Say Cosi Bella, he whispered tenderly. You're so beautiful. Ori had tears in her eyes as she smiled at him. Ti amo, Maceo Bartoli. They made love until they were exhausted, then fell asleep in each other's arms. Shiloh Holt was not a happy woman. The small apartment she shared with two of her friends was getting smaller each day, and she longed for her own space. Sadly, being a spokeswoman for an environmental group didn't exactly pay well. Despite this, she had been saving for a couple of years, and now, finally, it looked like she would get her own place, a tiny studio in the Marias. Arranging for her stuff to be moved in a few weeks' time, Shiloh had to drag her attention back to her work when her boss called a meeting on the Thursday afternoon. Most of her colleagues groaned, Miriam's meetings tended to run late, and they all had dinner plans or family to get home to. Shiloh didn't mind, anything to prevent going back to the tiny cramped apartment where she lived with Heloise and Liv. She adored them both, as they did her, but all three were feeling the confinements of living so close together. Heloise was her oldest friend from college, a French woman and artist who dressed entirely in black and smoked endless Golois cigarettes. Liv, an eccentric Swede, was a science lecturer at the Sorbonne. Along with Heloise's two Siamese cats and Shiloh's cocker spaniel Beau, the small apartment was rarely tidy, organized, or stress-free. No, Shiloh thought to herself now, it's time before we all get on each other's nerves and ruin our friendships. Miriam, the director of the institute, began to run through her schedule. Shiloh only half listened until she heard Miriam say her name. She looked up to see everyone staring at her. She flushed. I'm sorry, Miriam, I didn't catch that. Miriam's lips pursed in annoyance. I was asking how you got along with Benoit Vo. Got along? Well, Shiloh grinned, we didn't get along at all. He was, as expected, the arrogant prick we all suspected. The others chuckled, and even Miriam smiled a little. But seriously, Shiloh continued. I'm afraid to say that he shut me down. Wouldn't budge. Even a consultation into the suitability of the land is beyond his reasoning at this point. Miriam looked a little startled. Oh. Shiloh tried to smile at her. I'm sorry, Miriam. Miriam shook her head. No, it's not that. It's just that he called this morning to tell me that I should be very proud of having such a committed and passionate spokesperson. Shiloh was stunned. He did. Miriam inclined her head. And he told me that he would look again at the sight. Speechless, Shiloh could only open and close her mouth for a moment. Excuse me, she muttered after a few moments, then left the meeting room. She strode back to her office and slammed the door. She grabbed her phone and dialed his number. Benoit sounded amused. How nice to hear from you, Ms. Holt. What game are you playing, Vo? Her temper snapped as soon as she heard his chocolate-smooth voice. Benoit laughed. You'll find out at dinner, tonight. The car will pick you up at 8.30. The line went dead, and Shiloh was left mouthing dumbly at the phone. What the hell had just happened? Shiloh slammed the receiver down and let out a stream of curse words. There was no way she was going to dinner with this man, no effing way. At 8.30 when her doorbell rang, Shiloh was resolutely still in her jeans and old, comfortable t-shirt, barefoot, her hair shoved messily into a ponytail. She opened the door, expecting to see an anonymous driver. Instead, Benoit Vo stood leaning against her doorjamb, dressed in a dark red vintage t-shirt and jeans that hugged his slim hips. Shiloh had to admit, on looks alone, the man knocked it out of the park. He grinned at her. Ready for dinner? Don't give in. Mr. Vo. If you hadn't so rudely hung up on me, I would have saved you the trouble of coming here by telling you that I have no intention of going anywhere with you. His eyes were amused. 
So you don't want to find out what I've decided about the land on Boulevard's Coutance then? She crossed her arms. What say you tell me now? He shook his head, really his grin was maddening. No deal. I'm hungry. There's a place I'd like to take you. Shiloh's stomach rumbled and she sighed. Fine. But I'm not getting changed. Benoit shrugged. You look beautiful, he said casually before holding out his hand. Flushing at the compliment but ignoring his hand, Shiloh grabbed her purse and walked out in front of him. She heard his soft chuckle and gritted her teeth. Gosh, he was infuriating. But in the car, a hybrid she was amazed to note she studied him while he drove. His dark hair was cut in a style which showed off his long neck and his muscled shoulders. The red t-shirt suited his swarthy skin color, his dark eyes sparkled with amusement. He wore a subtle, clean-smelling cologne which sent her senses reeling. He glanced over. Trying to make me out? Yes, she admitted. Why did you give me such a hard time then tell my boss all of that bullshit? Not bullshit. He shook his head, still smiling. You made me think about what you said. I called a few people, and maybe, just maybe, we can work together to both our mutual satisfaction. It's not to my satisfaction, she said without rancor. It's the city's. I only act in Paris's best interest, Mr. Vo. I'm not against business or progress, you see. Just, I feel that both evolution and the environment could be more simpatico, you know? He smiled over at her, and there wasn't a hint of arrogance on his face. I do know. Paris is in my blood too, Shiloh. And it's Benoit. Shiloh gave him her first genuine smile. Benoit. Over dinner she found him to be an attentive listener, and to her continued surprise, he knew more about her than she expected. She asked him about that, half-jokingly she asked him if he had her followed. I assure you, I would never invade your privacy like that, he said, not phased by the question. Shiloh, everything I know about you I got from a very basic internet search and asking around. And what you told me on our first meeting, of course. She looked blank. Harvard and Brown, he reminded her with a laugh. Oh right. There's not much else to tell. Wait. A thought had come to her suddenly. How did you know where I lived? Benoit grinned. When I said I asked around, I meant I have friends at the utility company. Shiloh's eyebrows shot up, and for a moment she didn't know whether to yell at him or laugh. She chose the latter. Man, you really are something else. Benoit was unrepentant. I used what was available to me. Shiloh nodded. Fair enough. But I mean what I say, Benoit. Paris is suffocating. We need those green spaces more than ever now, if you could just consider the big picture. That's all I ask. I'm not naive, I know how the world works. I just don't think it should be at the expense of our planet. Benoit was listening to her, she could tell. His gaze never left hers and now he nodded slowly. Shiloh, believe me. I understand your position, and yes, our company could do more. But we also have to consider that the population is growing every day, and these people need some place to live. But I have a proposition for you. Shiloh was intrigued. Which is? Come work for me. Work with me to try and strike a balance. I'm not saying give up your job, I can tell it's important to you but work with us as a consultant. I promise you this now, if we go ahead on the Boulevard Coutance project, my company will invest an equal amount of money on creating new green spaces in the city. My only condition is that you are involved in making those decisions. Shiloh felt her heart racing, excited at the prospect of making a real difference. Still, she hesitated. Why me, Benoit? I'm not even on the board at L'Institute. Benoit leaned forward and she caught his scent, clean and woody. Her stomach did a little dance, and she felt her face burn. If he saw her blush, Benoit didn't say anything, for which she was grateful. Shiloh, in this world, to find someone who is as passionate as you is a rare thing, sadly. When I see it, I can't help myself. I want to harness that passion to make things happen. 
Shiloh smiled shyly at him. I admit, you have surprised me this evening, Benoit. His dark eyes crinkled as he smiled. Not as soulless as you first thought? She laughed, her face going red again, but she nodded. I'm reserving judgment. Benoit laughed. I'll take that. He drove her home and kissed her hand at her door. That was a fun evening. We should do it again. Shiloh smiled. I'd like that. When he was gone, Liv stuck her head out of her bedroom. Was that Benoit Vo? Her voice registered amazement and Shiloh grinned. It was. You're dating the big bad wolf? Shiloh rolled her eyes. Not dating. We're working together. Liv looked skeptical. Yeah, right. Working together on what's in his pants. Shiloh sighed. Really not. Her mind flitted to his dark eyes, the sensual mouth, the tall, hard-bodied physique. No, stop it. She followed Liv into her room and sat cross-legged on her friend's bed. It's not like that. Liv was sitting at her vanity trying, and failing, to apply false lashes. She glanced at Shiloh in the mirror. Heloise dated him back in the day, you know. Shiloh ignored the jolt of jealousy that hit her. Really? Liv nodded, giving up on the eyelashes. She said he was hot but absent. Didn't give his heart away. She got tired of being treated like an inconvenience in the end. Shiloh stayed silent, wondering why it should bother her so much. Well, I'm just working with the man, so it makes no difference. Liv gave her an amused glance. Come tell me that again in six weeks. Lucia knocked on Ori's crowded desk and Ori, discombobulated, her mind deep in her work, looked up and blinked. Lucia grinned. I've been calling your name for about ten minutes now, she exaggerated. It's way past seven. Come get something to eat with me. Ori checked her watch. She'd been so focused on what she was doing that she hadn't even noticed the other staff leaving the huge open-plan office in Maceo's gallery. She rubbed a hand over her tired eyes and Lucia sighed. Sweetheart, she said, her voice gentler. You look exhausted. You're going at this too hard. Is it AJ? Ori swallowed over the lump in her throat. I'm trying to distract myself, she said, her voice gruff, and Lucia put her arms around her friend and hugged her. No one expects you to be over this anytime soon, she whispered, and Ori felt grateful for her kindness and leaned into the hug. I know, and everyone has been wonderful, especially you and Maceo. I just feel this emptiness. It hadn't helped that Tyson Yannick had been all over the news, giving interviews about the tragic death of his son, giving a performance so convincing that for a second Ori could almost believe he was in mourning. But then Tyson would look into the camera and beg Ori to, come home. Let us be a family for AJ's sake. Bastard. Ori would grit her teeth, her eyes filled with tears, and shut off the television. She hid her despair as best she could from Maceo, but it had been a subdued homecoming. She and Lucia went to grab something to eat, but Ori was nearly asleep by the time Lucia called one of Maceo's security guards to take her friend home. Ori dragged her feet as she walked into the large, luxurious penthouse she called home. Maceo had called her and told her he would be home later. He was meeting with some prospective buyers at an artist's studio across the city. So Ori drew a hot bath and soaked in it, her head resting against the cool tile of the bathroom. Her phone rang just as she was getting dressed. Pulling her robe on, she grabbed it, and without checking the caller ID, said hello. Hello, Orianthi. Ori frowned. She didn't recognize the voice. Who is this? You'll find out. Orianthi, would you do me a favor? Ori sighed. Look, whoever you are, I'm not in the mood, so... I thought you looked lovely tonight at the restaurant with your friend. The shock slammed into her. What? You heard me. I was close, Orianthi. Very close. But not as close as I was in San Francisco. Him. Ori's knees felt shaky and she sat down on the bed. What do you want? He laughed. You. Ori drew in a breath. 
You can't have me, whoever you are. I am not a possession for you to acquire, or whatever the hell it is you want. Get help, freak, and don't come near me again. A small pause. The favor I ask is this. Go to this website and see. He gave her a short web address. You should see it, Orianthi. You'll learn something about your future. The line went dead. What the fuck? Ori closed her eyes and let out a shaky breath. She had enough to deal with Tyson and now someone else? Or was it someone playing a sick joke? Reluctantly, she grabbed her iPad and brought up the website her caller had mentioned. And she froze. There were two photographs on the website's only page. One depicted a dead woman, a crossbow bolt buried deep her belly, her blood spilling from the wound. If Ori hadn't known for sure it wasn't herself, she would have sworn it was a picture of her. Viola. Under her photograph was one word, dusk. The other photo was of Ori herself in the hotel room in San Francisco, unconscious, her t-shirt pulled up and a knife placed on her stomach. Underneath it read, Eventide. The message was clear. Someone had murdered Viola, and now he was telling the world that Ori herself was next. Ori dropped her iPad and ran for the bathroom, only just making it before she threw up again and again, sobbing all her fear out. Maceo found her still hunched over in the bathroom a couple of hours later, and when he picked her up and cradled her in his arms, it was all he could do to make out her garbled words. When he understood, his blood turned to ice. He's going to kill me, she said, defeated. He's going to kill me, and I don't know how we're going to stop him. Tyson Yannick had expected the police to question him about the attack on Ori in San Francisco, but no one had contacted him. He was a little pissed. Whoever had attacked Ori hadn't been in his employ, but he wanted to have the opportunity to talk to the police so he could try and glean some clues to who it might have been and who was infringing on his territory. It was bad enough that that bastard Bartoli was screwing his angel. Now someone else wanted to kill her? No. This would not be born. Despite this, he talked to every one of his staff, asking them if they had gone rogue and attacked Ori. They all denied it. Good. They were aware that only he, Tyson Yannick, would put his hands on her. The consequences of their disobedience, he told them, would be catastrophic. They got the message. He'd had Maceo Bartoli followed, and knew they were now back in Venice. Good. Being at home granted them some complacency, and at least Tyson knew where Ori would be. He would have to postpone his plan to kill her. Doing it now would only endanger the fragile platform he was building. He had the press's sympathy about AJ best not risk that. Quietly, some of his party faithful were talking about bringing him back into the fold, and today he would fly to D.C. to have closed-door meetings with them. Yes, at last, his career was beginning to resurrect itself, and he would not risk that. Yet. He was lost in thought when his aide came to find him. Boss, there's something you need to take a look at. Tyson took the iPad from his hand and glanced at it. For a long moment he studied the two photographs, then glanced up at the aide with anger in his eyes. Call the media team. I want them here. Now. Despite herself, Shiloh was enjoying working with Benoit more than she wanted to admit. Yes, he was an arrogant SOB, but he was also a good listener. They would argue, but it was always about substantive things, never petty or small-minded. Shiloh would give her opinion, and then Benoit would pick it to pieces for good and bad points and vice versa. And from the ashes of their arguments, a solid ethos and ideal was created. Shiloh conceded that the apartment block on Boulevard Coutance was ideally placed, but she talked Benoit into making it low-price housing for the Parisians who needed to commute into the city center for work, rather than more luxury penthouses for the uber-rich. They spent days together planning new green spaces for the city, and even Shiloh's implacable boss, Miriam, was pleased. One particular Thursday, Shiloh had been working late when Benoit knocked at the door of the office he had loaned her. Come, let's go eat. Shiloh shook her head. I have to finish this, I'm not in tomorrow. Playing hooky? Shiloh grinned. 
Kind of. Moving house, I finally have my own place. Congrats. Look, what is it you're working on? She showed him and smiling, he shook his head. We won't even close on that land for three weeks. Come, let's go eat, and you can tell me about your new place. Shiloh realized she was actually starving. And so, twenty minutes later, they were seated at her favorite burger joint. Shiloh sipped her soda, feeling the cold wash of the liquid on her tongue and the sugary rush hitting her system. This was a good idea, Benoit. She studied him. He had pulled his tie down and opened his collar, and had shrugged out of his jacket. As Shiloh had gotten to know him, she had wondered how she had ever thought he could be soulless. She was ashamed now of accusing him of being something so generic. She had googled him and found a wealth of information, not least that his band of brothers, the Midnight Club, were the most important people in his life. She had scrolled through pages of photographs, and never had he looked more animated or happier than with his friends. There were women, of course, of all types, but only one woman had cropped up on more than one occasion, a woman called Marcella. She had looked regal and intelligent, and Shiloh couldn't help but be a little envious. She seemed like an important person to Benoit. Her curiosity got the better of her now, and she smiled at him. Who is Marcella? She seems important to you. Benoit looked surprised and then, hiding a grin, he nodded. She is a good friend, a very good friend. She is traveling, at the moment. So she and you? She let the question hanging. Her face was burning, but Benoit shook his head. No, it's not like that. Well, I mean it is, but we are not a couple, just friends. With benefits? Shut up, Shiloh told herself sharply. It's none of your business. If you like. There is no commitment between us, but she will always be important. How about you? Are you dating? Shiloh shook her head. No time. Come on now. Benoit leveled his gaze at her. You are a beautiful woman. You must have admirers. Shiloh shrugged. If I do, they're not known to me. There was a long silence. I can think of one right now. Shiloh's flush deepened, and to break the tension, she glanced at her watch. Hey, look, this has been fun, but I have a really busy day tomorrow. Benoit smiled. What time do you need me there? Shiloh blinked. I'm sorry. I'm offering my services. I've moved house more times than most. Benoit held up his big hands. Plus, you know, I have that buff thing going for me. In anyone else's mouth, it would have sounded arrogant and ridiculous, but the playful gleam in his eyes made her laugh. Then how can I refuse, Mr. Buff? I am strong like Bull. And he flexed his biceps. Shiloh burst out laughing. See you at 8 a.m. then. The next morning when her doorbell rang, Shiloh felt a thrill go through her, and she yanked the door open to see Benoit waiting with a smile on his face. Good morning. The soft growl of his voice made her heart beat faster. Come on in, she said, covering her sudden shyness. His big frame seemed to fill the small apartment. Liv stuck her head out of her bedroom and said hi to him, while giving Shiloh a conspiratorial look, and Shiloh suddenly remembered what her friend had said about Heloise having dated Benoit back in the day. Shoot. She didn't have time to react, though, as Heloise came out of the bathroom wrapped in a towel and stopped, gaping at Benoit. Benoit, what are you doing here? Benoit covered his shock well, just helping out Shiloh with her move. Heloise turned unfriendly eyes on Shiloh. Really? Oh, damn it. Shiloh smiled brightly at her. He's a good friend. Heloise gave Benoit a long look which he returned coolly. Nice to see you again, Benoit. Shiloh felt like she was intruding, and moved away to give them some privacy. She could hear them talking quietly, from her position in the living room. You look good, Heloise. You too, Benoit, a little more gray than when I last saw you. Shiloh heard Benoit laugh. You're not wrong. How did you and Shiloh meet? Believe it or not, she came to my office to yell at me. It was the start of a beautiful friendship. Shiloh smiled to herself. 
That was sweet. She strained her ears, trying to hear what Heloise was saying. I always regret our breakup, how painful it was. Was it? I seem to remember us both deciding that we weren't suited as lovers, just as friends. Heloise sighed. Still it was a wrench. You're a beautiful woman, Heli. I'm sure you have no trouble finding lovers. Hum. Well, I'd better get dressed. Good to see you. Shiloh pretended to be absorbed in packing her stuff when Benoit came into the living room. She looked up and smiled nonchalantly. The movers will be here soon, so most of the stuff I need shifting is just some private items that I don't trust them with. Like this fella. She indicated her beloved dog, Bo, who was lying on top of a pile of boxes looking sulky. Benoit mussed his silky ears and Bo licked his hand. Beautiful animal. Benoit said admiringly, and was rewarded by Beau rolling onto his back and showing Benoit his furry belly. Shiloh laughed. My dog is a slut, she said with mock sadness. The move went off easily, and Shiloh was sure that Benoit had slipped the movers some extra money because all of her boxes reached her new apartment in record time and in pristine condition. Once there, she set Benoit to work unpacking her kitchen things while she dealt with her personal items. The apartment was tiny, her queen-sized bed seeming to take up a lot of the studio, but it was compact and homey. Beau dragged his dog bed to a corner of his choice, much to Benoit's amusement. I bet that dog is the most spoiled pooch in Paris, he said, and Shiloh laughed. Try in France, she said, but stroked Beau's silky head. He is the love of my life, though. Lucky dog, quipped Benoit, and she flushed. Look, shall I go grab us some takeout and bring it back? If we keep going, you could be settled in by tonight. Shiloh smiled at him gratefully. That would be wonderful, thank you. But are you sure I'm not keeping you from a gala or a benefit, or one of your concubines? Benoit grinned. Oh, definitely, but I still prefer to be here with you. Give me an hour, and we can eat. While he was gone, Shiloh took advantage and grabbed a shower in her little bathroom, letting the hot water stream through her hair, feeling the dust and grubbiness wash away. A feeling of satisfaction had lodged in her stomach, she was home now. Benoit came back with fresh warm bread and cheese, a bag of sweet juicy peaches and a bottle of cold white wine. They picnicked on the floor of her living area, leaning back against her bed and chatting. Shiloh was amazed, that it seemed like the most natural thing in the world for this billionaire to be scooched down on the floor with her. By the time they had finished unpacking all her stuff, it was way after 1 a.m., Shiloh suddenly felt shy. Look, I feel bad that I can't offer you somewhere to sleep, she said, nodding at the couch which Beau had decided to sleep on. Benoit shook his head, grinning. Don't worry, my place isn't far. Thank you so much for today. I'd still be doing this next week if you hadn't helped. Benoit smiled at her. It was no problem. I had fun. Hey. He grinned as she looked at him askance. Better than sitting in money meetings all day. Shiloh had to concede that. Well anyway, look, are you free for dinner tomorrow? I'd like to cook you a meal to say thank you. Benoit nodded. That sounds wonderful. She walked him to the door, and he kissed her cheek, lingering only a beat too long. Get some sleep, Shiloh. You look exhausted. A few minutes later, she was crawling into bed, Beau jumping up to snuggle next to her. She fell asleep almost immediately, but soon the dreams came, and in each and every one of them Benoit Vaux was making sweet love to her. Alex had flown over from New York, as soon as Maceo had called him about the website. Maceo had already called in the police, who were working with their American counterparts. Miss Roy, they had asked Orianthi again and again. Do you know who would wish you harm? Maceo had barely believed it when she refrained from telling them about her stepfather, and it had been the cause of their first and only row to date. Why the hell didn't you tell them about Yannick? Maceo had demanded, his green eyes flashing with disbelief and anger. Ori had stood her ground. Because we both know this isn't him. It can't be. How the hell would he have known about Viola, before I even met you? 
Maceo had no argument for that, but he wasn't mollified. They could have at least questioned him and given him another opportunity to play the concerned stepfather card? No, thank you. Ori sighed to herself. But three days later, now it seemed that Tyson had found out about it anyway. His statement to the press was full of platitudes and nauseating homilies, and Ori pushed away the newspaper in disgust. Since their row, she and Maceo had hardly spoken, but now she felt his hands on her shoulders and she looked up at him. Let's not fight. I'm sorry, he said. I'm just scared. He came to sit next to her, sliding his arm around her shoulders and kissing her cheek. T. Amo. She nestled into his arms. I was thinking, whoever is doing this, I don't think it matters who I am to him. It's not really me who is the target. You are. Or at least you and the others. The club. It's too obvious. I agree. So does Alex, so do the police. The thing is, we've all obviously made bad decisions at one time or another, or had enemies. None of us think we've collectively screwed anyone over. So why target us? Ori sighed. Jealousy? The Midnight Club is a well-oiled machine. The Midnight Club is five friends who thought, back in their twenties, that they could rule the world. Some of us still think like that, some of us are happy with what we have. Maceo smiled at her. The club isn't a club, Ori. It's just us five brothers. There's nothing to be envious of. He kissed her gently. But I can understand someone being jealous of what I have. Ori smiled, but her mind was still racing. Is it because I look like Viola? Maceo's smile faded. I don't know, Bella. But I'm not her, she said quietly. Anyone who spent five minutes with me could tell. Yes. I don't get it. Me neither. Hey, look, let's go meet Alex for dinner and forget all this bullshit. Are we going to let one asshole ruin our happiness? I'll tell you a secret, Mio Caro. Ori chuckled at his cheeky grin. And what's that, Mr. Bartoli? I have a lot of money. A lot. Which means the best protection in the world. No one's getting near you or us. So we can go on, live our lives and enjoy what we have. Ori kissed him. I wouldn't change a thing about what we have, Maceo. I only wish I had thought to bring AJ back here with us. Maceo nodded, his eyes sad. I know. His arms tightened around her. The police will find out who did this, Mio Caro. Alex is like a dog with a bone with the investigation. In the meantime, we won't let it affect our happiness. Agreed. She pressed her mouth to his. I love you, Maceo. Take me to bed. Grinning he did as she asked, and as they made love, Ori knew that together, they would be able to defeat any problems that came their way. Alex Millen sat in countless meetings with police both in Italy and New York, but none of them could find out who was behind the website and who was threatening Maceo's new love. Alex was frustrated. Maceo could hire more and more protection, but it was still too easy to get to Ori, Alex thought. When he returned to New York, he went to see his half-sister, Netta. Much younger than Alex, she was an undergrad at Columbia and the offspring of Alex's late father and a Mexican artist from the Bronx. Netta had a fractious relationship with the milland half of the family, from a young age she had been fiercely feminist, much to Alex's father's disgust. She and Alex also had times where they didn't communicate for long periods, the difference being that Netta adored Alex and he adored her, but they shared a common trait of not needing to be around people all of the time. His sister greeted him now at the doorway of her dormitory. Netta was damned if she would join a sorority. Vapid narcissists, she had declared the students who joined them. Netta got away with her strident opinions because of her beauty, her spirit, and her incredible brain, which made sure she was top of the class of every subject she took. Her dark eyes flashed with defiance, her smooth café au lait skin, full red lips and curvy physique made her popular too, with men and women. Alex kissed her on the cheek. You hungry, sis? 
always. They went to a local burger joint and stuffed their faces with patties laden with grilled onions and Swiss cheese. Netta moaned with delight at the taste, and Alex had to laugh. Netta always made his heart lift. So how goes things, bro? Netta wiped her mouth on the back of her hand. So so, Alex said honestly. Still no progress on the case, and now it looks like Maceo's girlfriend is being targeted. Maceo has a girlfriend? Netta looked astonished, he's made an actual commitment? Alex grinned. He has, as amazing as it seems. Maceo and Netta, out of all of his friends, got along famously, kidding around with each other constantly. She's lovely too. Here. He handed her his phone, showing her a photo he had taken of Maceo and Ori. He watched his sister as she studied the picture, wondering if she too would pick up on Ori's resemblance to Viola. From Netta's expression, he guessed she did. Whoa. He nodded. Yep. Netta handed his phone back. That's some freaky shit. And she's being threatened, too. Alex nodded. It's a freaking mess. Anyway, distract me, please. What's up with you? Netta rolled her eyes. My life is classes followed by classes with food in between. Alex grinned. No hookups. None worth mentioning. Bummer. Word. I'm the proverbial doll jack, all work, no play. Hey, when is the club getting together again? If they're bringing girlfriends, I could be your date and finally discover what you get up to together. Alex laughed. I can assure you, Netta, when you reach 39, the most exciting thing you can think of to do is sit around with a bottle of scotch, talking about nothing much and still getting an early night. Party animals, she said mockingly, and Alex shrugged good-naturedly. That's us. Look, I have to get back, you okay for money? Netta rolled her eyes. Their father might have cut her out of his will, but Alex had still given her half of everything he inherited. She hugged her half-brother now. You're the best, you know? I know. You're a lucky girl. Alex chuckled, and Netta joined in. She thumped him playfully. Get out of here. He had almost reached the door when she caught up with him. Alex, wait. He looked down at her, his eyes curious. Her expression was serious for once. Alex, you know I loved Viola, right? Like, she was the perfect person for you and she was like my sister? I do, he said softly, nodding. I do. Netta nodded. She would want you to be happy, Alex. Try and find her again. Viola would want that. Alex smiled, but there was no happiness in his face. I can't, Netta. Not until I know. Not until I know who did this to her. I can't. Alex made it back to his car before he broke. He pummeled the steering wheel and screamed out his pain, knowing that in the underground parking garage where he was, no one could see it. He wouldn't be able to do as Netta asked, until he got Viola out of his head. An idea had been forming in his mind for the past few weeks, but it was so crazy, so out of character, so wrong, that he had kept shoving it away. Viola. Ori. She looked so much like his lost love that he could not stop thinking about her and yet, he could see that Maceo, playful, boyish, good-hearted Maceo, was deeply in love with the young woman. Could he really break his brother's heart by going after Ori? By trying to seduce her? He had no doubt that Ori loved Maceo as much as he did her. Gosh, what a freaking mess. But over the next few days, he couldn't help returning to the idea that maybe, just maybe, if he could make Ori his, then maybe he would be able to get over Viola. Am I cracking up? One morning, a week after his lunch with Netta, he gazed in the mirror and paused mid-shave. You're obsessing over your friend's lover. Stop this. He told himself over and over to stop thinking about her. When he got into the office that day, he nodded to his assistant who had brought him coffee when she asked him if he need anything. Yes, he said, and his voice was steady. I need an open-ended plane ticket. His PA took out her notepad. Where to, boss? 
He hesitated only for a beat. Venice. As soon as possible. When Maceo had suggested a week in the south of the country, Ori had readily agreed. A secluded villa on the cliffs overlooking Naples had been their base for the past two days and now, in the late afternoon heat. You want me, he said softly, and she nodded. It was nighttime by the time they finally rested. Ori, catching her breath, grinned over at Maceo. You drive me crazy, Maceo Bartoli. He laughed. Caro, voglio essere sempre dentro di te. I always want to be with you. He rolled onto his side, propped himself up on his elbow and looked down at her. Ori, marriage is never something I have aspired to, nor perhaps even believed in, until now. I'm not asking yet, I don't want to frighten you off or rush things. But is it something you desire? Ori was taken aback. Maceo, the only way I can think to answer that is to tell you that I want you. A piece of paper or a ceremony won't change how I feel about you or us. I love you. That is all I need. He bent his head to kiss her. Then I am happy. Still, he said, I would like to make a commitment to you, just a gesture to tell you that I belong to you. Ori smiled. Just your words are enough for me. Maceo laughed but shook his head slightly. You are not like other women, Orianthi Roy. I hope not. But it was later, when Maceo was asleep next to her, that she began to wonder what he really meant. Not like other women. Did he mean she was broken? Was he with her out of some misguided white knight thing? She hoped not, and she told herself it was just night terrors that were bugging her. She sighed and rolled onto her side. Don't be paranoid. But she couldn't but be wary. Years of her stepfather's abuse made her question any man's motives. She stroked Maceo's dark curls asleep he looked ten years younger than his thirty-nine years. She brushed her lips gently against his. T. Amo. And she did love him, completely. She just wasn't sure in her heart if she trusted him. He checked to see how many hits the website had and grinned. No doubt they had seen it. Good. Now they knew to be terrified. He assumed when Maceo had found Ori unconscious but alive, he had done the right thing by leaving her alive. The temptation to stab her to death right then had been overwhelming, his blade slicing into her tender skin, seeing the agony in her eyes, the horror of the blood. Soon. When he took her, he would take his time to kill Ori, not like Viola where the crossbow bolt had slammed into her body, severing her abdominal artery immediately. It had only taken her seconds to bleed out and die. No, Ori would suffer horribly before she died. He pushed away from his computer screen. He wondered if any of the other members of the club would avoid getting involved with women once they knew he was deadly serious. The Midnight Club would be brought to its knees by the time he had finished with them. Shiloh was deep in thought as she walked to Benoit's office a week later. They had almost completed the plans for the new developments, the green spaces they had worked so hard on. Now today, she and Benoit would present their plans to the board. Shiloh was going over everything in her head when she suddenly heard Benoit's raised voice. She hovered outside his door, curious. Benoit was speaking fast in French and he sounded angry. Shiloh started guiltily when Genevieve, Benoit's assistant, appeared behind her, but Genevieve grinned at her. He's in a foul mood today, she murmured. Good luck with him. She rolled her eyes and grinned, and Shiloh smiled uneasily back. Should I go in? Genevieve nodded. He's expecting you. Still, Shiloh poked her head in see if Benoit would want privacy for his phone call, but he waved her in and she sat in the chair opposite him. He finished the call by slamming the phone down and rubbing his hands over his head. Shiloh waited for him to speak. Merd. Well, that was Gaston d'Urberville. The name sounded familiar, but Shiloh frowned. Is he on the board? Benoit nodded. The presentation is cancelled. Shiloh, I'm so sorry, but it seems my board is more interested in profit than it is in social responsibility. Her heart sinking, Shiloh stared at him. 
the development. Benoit sighed, and she could see genuine sorrow in his eyes. I'm so sorry, Shiloh. They won't approve it. They will only consider boutique and high-end properties. Damn it, I thought I had them, at least four of them swore we would have their backing, it's such a kick in the gut. I don't believe this, all our work. Shiloh's voice was barely a whisper. What the hell am I going to tell Miriam? Benoit shook his head. I'll talk to Miriam, Shiloh. No, it's not your job to tell her. It's mine. Gosh, she trusted me and I failed. I failed the city. Shiloh felt bleak, and Benoit got up and dragged his chair around next to hers. He took her hands in his. Sweetheart, these things happen. Miriam can't blame you. At least you tried. Shiloh gave him a thin smile. That won't be enough. She trusted me with something she wouldn't normally trust anyone in a junior position with. She took a risk and lost. She'll understand. Miriam did understand, but it wasn't enough, and Shiloh tendered her resignation to her boss. Miriam accepted it sadly. These things happen, Shiloh. Learn from this. At least the severance package would pay her rent for a few months, but Shiloh felt bleak. Benoit immediately offered her a job with his company, but Shiloh told him she couldn't work for him, or rather for the board that had shattered their dream. A boutique hotel was swiftly erected on the green belt land, and Shiloh despaired at the world. The one positive thing was that Benoit Vo had shown himself to be a good friend. He called her almost every day and came over, bringing takeout or even cooking in her tiny kitchenette. They took to walking Bo in the parks Paris still had left, chatting about everything and anything. Benoit would take Shiloh's arm sometimes as they strolled, but he never made a pass at her or made her feel uncomfortable. Uncomfortable. Ha, ah, she thought now. The fact was that she was attracted to him. His machismo and his arrogance were tempered by his wit, his intelligence and his unexpected kindness. His dark brown eyes would settle on her blue ones, and she would feel as if she were sinking into them. On a rainy Saturday night in late spring, he asked if she would like to join him for dinner, and she accepted. The city was busy as they dined in a small but exclusive restaurant. Shiloh was telling Benoit about the freelance work she was doing. It's mainly writing articles, blog posts and doing research, but it keeps me busy. She was being distracted by his fingers, which were stroking the back of her hand as it rested on the table. That sounds positive. It is. Benoit slowly took her hand and brought it to his lips. I'm glad things are working out, but you know there's always a job waiting for you at my company. She was mesmerized by his mouth against her hand. Thank you. Shiloh. I can't tell you how sorry I am that our project didn't work out. I'm not sorry that we spent all that time together, and I think you know why. His words made her stomach warm and her sex quiver. She met his gaze, desire sweeping through her. She felt tongue-tied. Benoit leaned over and brushed her lips with his. You can't deny this thing between us, he murmured. It's in everything we talk about, everything we do. I want you, Shiloh, and I think you want me too. This doesn't have to be complicated. But it is complicated, she wanted to say, but couldn't form the words. And before she knew it, they were in his car, racing to his penthouse. Everything in her was telling her to stop it, that having sex with this man would not be a good idea. But gosh, she wanted him. As he drove, his hand was on her stocking thigh, his fingers stroking her gently, and all she wanted to do was to grab that hand and push it between her. Feel how much I want you, Benoit. By the time they had reached his penthouse, Shiloh was quivering with excitement, and Benoit, grinning almost triumphantly, pulled her into his arms, his mouth seeking hers hungrily. Gosh, that kiss. Shiloh felt light-headed and almost delirious as he swept her into his arms and carried her into his bedroom. She tugged impatiently at his tie, discarding it and using her frantic fingers to unbutton his shirt. As she pushed the fabric apart, she sighed happily. His chest, broad and well-muscled with a fine scattering of dark hair, was solid and masculine, not waxed and buffed like so many of her ex-boyfriends had been. 
Benoit noted her admiration with a grin. She was still awake when finally, Benoit fell asleep in her arms. Shiloh's mind was reeling, her body sated. It had been a night she had never expected or dreamed of, but what surprised her more than anything was Benoit. He was a masterful lover, yes, but just now he had fallen asleep in her arms, totally vulnerable and totally unafraid to be that comfortable with her. She could barely reconcile those two sides of him. She stroked his hair back from his face. He looked almost boyish in the moonlight. If he was like this with her, how come he kept his guard up with other women? How come he hadn't sent her back home after they'd had intimacy? Every preconception she had about this man was being blown out of the water. She just hoped the other shoe wasn't about to drop. Maceo was surprised to see Alex at the gallery when he and Ori returned after their vacation. Alex was chatting to Lucia when the couple arrived, and Alex hugged them both. Maceo bore him off to his office, while Ori stayed behind to talk to her friend. You look wonderful, Lucia said admiringly. Naples and Maceo obviously agree with you. Ori chuckled. I can't argue with that. She lowered her voice. Why is Alex here again? Lucia shrugged. I think he feels lost and wants to be around his friends. Doesn't he have a job? Lucia smiled. When you're as rich as Alex, other people do your work for you. Besides, she studied her friend. Don't you like him? Of course I do, Ori rolled her eyes, flushing slightly. It's just when he looks at me, I feel as if he's not seeing me, you know? Lucia rubbed her back. Hardly surprising, but don't worry about it. Alex is one of the good guys. Ori nodded, sitting down at her desk and hesitating before calling up a website on her laptop. Have you seen this? She showed Lucia the news story. Her stepfather was really milking the death of his son. Now Tyson was publicly accusing the facility where AJ had died of neglect and wrongful death. My son's death won't be in vain if I can stop these jokers from telling vulnerable people that they can help them. Where's the regulation? Where's the training? Oh gosh, Lucia groaned. Is it possible that your stepfather could become more of an asshole, or has he reached his limit? Oh, there's no limit on it, Ori said through gritted teeth. Look, I'm going to say something. I'm tired of Tyson blaming everyone else for his own failures. Lucia looked worried. Ori, are you ready to go up against him? I mean, really ready? Because he'll try to destroy you. Let him try, said Ori defiantly, lifting her chin. Both he and I know I could bring him down once and for all. I won't play my whole card, just enough to irk him. Give him enough rope, etc. It won't be hard. Lucia mulled this over. Ori, have you told Maceo what you intend to do? Not that you have to, she added hurriedly as Ori frowned at her. Ori sighed. I have. He's not happy about it, but I have to do something for myself. I won't hide behind Maceo's position or wealth. It's up to me to take Tyson down. For AJ if nothing else. Seems like you could do with someone on the East Coast to help out. Both women started as Alex spoke, neither had seen him return. He smiled at Ori. I could be your conduit, Ori. It might help you not to be in the same country as that asshat, but I can keep an eye on his movements. Ori half smiled. I'll think about it. Thanks, Alex. No problem. Hey, look, Maceo says he's busy this morning. How about I swing by later and take you two ladies out for lunch? Ori hesitated, but Lucia nodded eagerly. Yes, please. I could do with some distraction. I'll pick you up at twelve. At half past eleven, Ori had caught up with her work and went to see Maceo. She updated him on progress for the exhibit as he watched her, smiling. Finally, she looked at him through narrowed eyes. What are you looking at, Mr. Bartoli? Maceo grinned. The woman I love. Just remembering how I made you purr like a cat this morning. Ori laughed. You have a one-track mind. Speaking of your woman, 
Your woman is going to lunch with another man. How come your woman isn't being taken to lunch by you? Maceo looked repentant. Rufus called from O oh, Mio Mio. He wants to come by at 12 to talk about a possible collaboration. Ori was impressed. Rufus Armando was one of Italy's foremost gallery owners. If Maceo could land a collaboration, it would be a huge get. Maceo was watching her. You don't mind going out with Alex, no? Of course not, baby. She got up and leaned over the desk to kiss him. Alex is a friend. Besides, she flashed him, making him laugh, better you don't have me all day makes the anticipation even sweeter. Maceo growled at her. Damn woman. I don't need to have wood before my meeting. They both laughed and Ori stood, rearranging her blouse. Maceo stood to walk her out, kissing cheek and using the opportunity to murmur in her ear, I'm going to screw you stupid later, Mio Caro. You'd better, she said silkily. Gosh, would she ever get enough of this man? A half hour later, she was seated in a little trotteria with Lucia and Alex and remembering Maceo's kiss. Lucia and Alex were chatting amiably, and Ori took the opportunity to study Alex. He was slightly taller than Maceo 6'2", but they had the same dark hazel green eyes and intense brooding look. Alex's hair was slightly lighter, closely cropped, vague militaristic, and his broad shoulders and slim hips meant he wore his expensive suit well. She could imagine him being a virile and strong lover, gosh what was she thinking? But there was no doubt that he had a feral, animalistic sensuality beneath that calm, silent exterior. For a second, Ori let herself imagine Alex in bed. She wondered if he ever let a woman take charge in bed like Maceo did, and whether Alex was ever that generous. Somehow, she couldn't imagine it. She shook herself. Damn, the man has just buried his lover, Orianthi Roy, and you're imagining what? Being screwed by him? You're in love with Maceo, for crying out loud. Ori felt herself blushing, and just her luck, Lucia happened to glance at her at that moment. You okay? Ori tried to laugh her embarrassment off. Hot flash, she quipped. Must be my age. Lucia laughed, but Alex studied her. You're all of what? Twenty-five. Twenty-eight. Given what she'd been thinking about, Ori could barely look him in the eye. Same age as Viola, Alex murmured, and Ori felt bad for him. I'm so sorry, Alex. She leaned over and patted his hand, and he gripped hers for a second, squeezing her fingers. Thanks. Sorry. I didn't think that was insensitive. Don't be silly, Lucia said, much to Ori's gratitude. The mood had changed at the table now. Viola was part of our family, we all miss her, Alex. Ori smiled at him. I wish I had known her. Me too, you would have liked each other. Alex cleared his throat. I'm waiting for the day when talking about her isn't painful, or no longer causes people to feel weird around me. I don't know about the pain part, Ori said gently, but I think we should talk about her for your benefit and to honor her. Why should the mention of her name be a cause of embarrassment or awkwardness? That's not the sum of her life. Talk to me, Alex. Talk to us about your life together. Celebrate it. I certainly won't talk about AJ just in terms of his death. She hadn't meant to go on a rant, but at that moment Ori felt it was the right thing to say, and she believed it too. We may not have known each other long, she said to him now, but I would like us to be friends, Alex. Alex smiled at her. Same here, Ori. Thank you. And you're right, we should celebrate them. Lucia watched as her two friends talked, glad they had found common ground. There was only a very slight concern that sat in her chest as she watched them. The way he looks at her. Lucia had no doubt that Ori was totally and irrevocably in love with Maceo, and despite her initial misgivings, she seemed now to be trying to bond with Alex. But Alex was in mourning, deep mourning, for a woman who resembled Ori more than a little. Viola had been sweet, kind and loving, and still, someone had murdered her. Did the person who had killed her want some kind of revenge on Alex? 
Would being his friend put Ori in more danger than she already was? And why was she, Lucia, more terrified than anything that Alex might fall for her friend? Tyson Yannick listened to the dull reports he got daily of Ori's whereabouts, about her daily goings-on. She was protected, no doubt, and Yannick's own rising profile meant he could not go to her without raising suspicion. He had a plan, however, but he would need her to come back to the States to execute it. Should she come here, he could have her abducted and taken to the secret compound in the Louisiana swamplands. She would be totally at his mercy. He could spend days there doing her and torturing her before he killed her. It would be days of sadistic pleasure, before he dumped her body into the swamp to make it disappear forever. He imagined her beautiful eyes open and sightless, staring up at the sky as her blood-drenched body sank slowly into the murky water. The thought of it kept him going. But she never came to America. Oh, she traveled, mostly to Paris or other European cities, and always, always with Maceo Bartoli and his huge and highly trained security team. Untouchable. Not forever, my darling Ori, not forever. The minute she stepped foot on American soil, she was a dead woman walking. He would see to that. His party had recalled him to the front seats again, AJ's death having absolved him, it seemed, of all his indiscretions. There were even whispers of the VP slot on the next ticket, whispers he intended to make rallying calls. But Ori could bring that all down, even if her claims of his abuse were dismissed, just the mere mention of them would lead to his downfall. Tyson wondered if Bartoli had told Ori about his abuse of AJ. From how aggressive Maceo had been with him the day Ori was attacked, Tyson thought not. But maybe he should have. If Ori knew that Tyson had raped his own son, she would go ballistic and become reckless. Maybe she would come after him here in the States. Tyson began to smile. It was risky, yes, but maybe, just maybe, Maceo Bartoli could deliver Ori right into Tyson's hands. A month after they had begun to sleep together, Shiloh was still waiting for the punchline. How was it that the untamable Benoit Vo would be happy with a woman like her? It didn't help that the newspapers had gotten hold of the story, and now she was followed by paparazzi everywhere. She had been offered a new position at a human rights law firm, a junior assistant, and grateful for the job, she had taken to the job at once. Her first love would always be the environment and her city, but she found a new love here, working to keep asylum seekers in the country, helping them to save their families. At night she would meet Benoit, and over dinner, they would share their day, then go to his penthouse or her studio and make love. Shiloh found it wonderfully relaxing to be in his company, except she wondered if this life was as exciting as he needed. They had settled into a pattern, and Shiloh was constantly worried he would get bored of her. When he asked her to fly to Venice with him, however, she was thrilled. I'd like you to meet my friends, he told her. Ah, the elusive Midnight Club. She had heard about them from Benoit, and from his tone, she knew they were his brothers in arms, his family. Benoit, knowing she would frown upon him using his private jet, flew them using standard airlines, but business class, of course. When Shiloh looked disapproving, he shrugged unrepentantly. The plane would be flying whether we were here or in coach, he said, and she couldn't argue with him. Venice was a revelation to her, and she fell in love with the city almost as soon as she saw it. Benoit had booked an incredible suite at a luxury hotel, and arranged for a local designer to bring Shiloh some spectacular gowns. He was watching her change now, grinning lazily as she poked her tongue out at him. Come zip me up, she said, shrugging into a midnight blue dress. But instead of zipping her up, he let the dress fall to the floor and tumbled her onto the bed. Shiloh giggled at his mischievous smile as he removed first her bra, then her panties, and hitched her legs around his waist. You are insatiable. They were late to the restaurant, and by Maceo's Bartoli's grin, their friends had all guessed why. Shiloh flushed as she was introduced to Maceo, Ori, and Alex. My date is also late, Alex said, then looked over to the door. But there she is. He waved at another young woman. That's Lucia, Ori said to Shiloh. She's being Alex's friend date for this evening. 
She and I have known each other since college. Shiloh warmed to both of the young women immediately. Benoit had warned her about Alex's recent bereavement, but he seemed steady enough. Maceo was a joker, she thought to herself, but he was clearly head over heels for Ori. The meal passed quickly, and Shiloh could not have imagined a more pleasant bunch of people to be around. The food was exquisite, and when they all moved to the lounge for drinks afterward, she found herself relaxing in the opulence around her. Truly, she could not have anticipated a year ago that she would be here with a man like Benoit. Their whole relationship had been a whirlwind. She swallowed over the discomfort that was sitting in her chest. Shiloh had a secret, something she did not want to tell Benoit, not yet, not to spoil all of this. She was falling for him, hard, and yet something was holding her back. Her law firm had been so impressed with her, that they had offered her a chance of a lifetime defending human rights abuses in Africa. It would mean moving to the country for however long it took, which meant she would have to put her life on hold. Her life with Benoit. The trouble was, she couldn't see a way to have her cake and eat it. A man like Benoit would not wait for her forever, and why should he? But Shiloh knew that this was the career break she had been waiting for. She could not in all conscience decline it. So she was doing what she knew best, sticking her head in the sand. Her firm had given her a month to consider and so right here, right now, she was enjoying her time with Benoit. She had tried talking it over with Liv and Heloise, but Liv was a romantic, and Heloise, well, it hadn't been the same between them since that awkward confrontation at the apartment. Shiloh's heart ached for her old college roommate, especially now seeing Ori and Lucia so close. When Benoit was deep in conversation with Maceo and Alex, Ori leaned over to Shiloh. Are you okay? You seem distracted. Tell me to mind my own business if you like, but if you need to talk. Shiloh smiled gratefully. Thank you but not here. Ori squeezed her hand. During the week then. We'll go for lunch? That sounds perfect. Ori typed her number into Shiloh's phone. Anytime, she told her and smiled. Later, when Shiloh and Benoit had returned to their suite, they sat out on the balcony that looked over Venice's lagoon. This really is a magical place, Shiloh sighed and Benoit nodded. It is. Did you have a good time tonight, ma sure? Shiloh grinned at him. Oui, monsieur. Your friends are wonderful. I liked Ori very much. Lucia, too. Benoit nodded. Maceo is a lucky man. I think Alex has a little crush on Ori. I saw that too. What's his story? Benoit told her about Viola, and she was appalled. That's too awful. Isn't it? Now it looks like the killer is targeting Ori. Gosh. Quite. Look, let's change the subject. Why don't you tell me what's on your mind? Shiloh smiled at him. Nothing much. Just wondering how Bo is doing. Liv spoils him when she looks after him. I'll come home to a rounded pooch. It was weak, but Benoit seemed to accept that and Shiloh sighed gratefully. There was no way she was going to ruin their vacation by telling him about the job. Benoit stood and pulled her into his arms. Come to bed, he murmured, his rich deep voice sending thrills through her. As they made love, Shiloh could not imagine giving this up for anything or for anyone. Benoit made love to her slowly, carefully, but as he drove her relentlessly towards orgasm, she suddenly felt like crying. Why does life always come down to choices and compromise, she thought. She hid her tears until she was sure he was asleep, then let them fall unchecked. I'm in love with you, damn it. And I have no idea how to let you go. It wasn't often that Ori caught Maceo in a serious mood, but lately he had been more pensive than she had ever seen him. It made her nervous. Was he tiring of her? She hoped beyond hope that he wasn't, and in her heart she knew that wasn't it. But sometimes she awoke at night to find him at the window staring out unseeing, lost in thought. She was determined to find out and help him get past it. So she had come up with a plan. Shock him into giving it up. A few nights after the dinner with the friends, 
They were sitting on his couch watching an old movie when she spoke up. Maceo. I know something is wrong, and if it's that there's another woman, I'd rather you just tell me. Even it's just that you're tired of me. Maceo sat up and stared at her with wide eyes. What the hell are you talking about? Ori smiled at him. I'm just worried, there's something bothering you and it's driving me crazy not knowing. Maceo sighed and ran his hands over his face. Bella, it's not another woman, I swear, and believe me when I say I will never ever get tired of you. Ever. Ori moved next to him. Then what is it, my love? Maceo took her hands in his. Mio Caro, it's about AJ and something he told me before he died. I have kept it from you because, because he told me in confidence and because I didn't want to cause you further pain. Ori's heart was thumping now. Please, please don't say the words. Maceo. Her voice was barely a whisper. If it's what I think you're going to say, that my stepfather. She trailed off when she saw the truth in his eyes. Oh gosh. His own son. His own son. Ori stood and darted to the bathroom where she threw up and threw up until she was dry heaving. Maceo held her hair back and cradled her as she sobbed. When her sobs faded, she turned heartbroken eyes to him. I think I knew. I suspected. Once I even started to say something to AJ, but he shut me down. I should have made him tell me. I should have protected him. Sweetheart, AJ knew that if he told you that you would have attacked Yannick. AJ was positive that Yannick would have killed you to silence you. Ori grabbed a bath towel and wiped her eyes. Not if I killed him first, she said in a low voice, shocking Maceo. She looked at him, anger burning in her eyes. I should have. I had the chance once. He raped me on my 25th birthday. He was drunk and fell asleep on top of me. On my nightstand there was a photo frame, a metal one. It had these flowers, and one had this really sharp edge. I'd cut my finger on it lots of times. I lay there with this monster on top of me, asleep, watching the blood pulsing in his neck vein. All I had to do was reach out and grab the frame and... She mimed slitting his throat. I could have done it. I should have done it, even if it meant spending my life in prison. She buried her head in her hands. Then maybe AJ would still be alive. Maceo wrapped his arms around her, not knowing what to say to comfort her. We can't know that, baby, and AJ would not have wanted you locked away for murder. They sat in the bathroom for hours, it seemed, before Maceo carried her to bed. For once they did not make love, they just lay facing each other. I want to destroy him, Ori said simply, and Maceo nodded. I know. I will help you. She touched his face. I need to go back to the States. Maceo didn't look happy, but he agreed. But with the utmost protection, he insisted. Little did either of them know then, that it would not be enough. A week before her decision had to be made, Shiloh discovered something else, and it changed everything. Everything. In her tiny bathroom, she stared at the plastic stick in her hand and wondered how in this day and age she could have been so stupid. She knew she couldn't tell Benoit. Either she would look like a gold digger or an idiot. No, she thought, there's only one course to take. Which was why, in his opulent kitchen, she cooked a leg of lamb for Benoit, and over a bottle of Merlot she told him about Africa. He listened carefully, then was silent for a long time. Eventually, she grew crazy waiting. Benoit? His dark brown eyes were serious as he gazed at her. Well, you have to go, obviously. Shiloh swallowed the lump in her throat. You think so? Benoit reached for her hand. Shiloh, it's an amazing opportunity. You'd be a fool to turn it down. This could make your reputation internationally. Shiloh nodded, not trusting herself to speak. Do not cry in front of him. Do not. And for the love of God, woman, grow up. It is, she said softly. Probably the best opportunity of my career. She realized she was parroting him, but her throat felt choked and she looked away from his gaze. 
Shiloh, he said softly. I'm assuming it's not forever. It's open-ended. But you're not tied into a specific time length. You can go or stay as long as you want. She nodded and he got up, moving his chair next to hers. Sweetheart, I won't be the man who stops you from reaching your potential. I will not be that. Eventually it will lead to you resenting me. So I'm saying you need to do this and you have my full support. But what about us? She desperately wanted to ask him the question, but something in his expression was stopping her. Suddenly she felt the fifteen-year age difference between them. This man would not be tied down, that much was obvious. If anybody defined eternal bachelor, it was Benoit Vo. Only an incredibly stupid woman would fall in love with such a man, Shiloh thought now sadly. Only a very, very silly woman. She suddenly couldn't wait to get away from him. I'm so tired tonight, Benoit. She softened her words with a smile. Do you mind taking me back to my apartment? Benoit's face registered surprise for a beat, then he nodded. Of course. Alone, Shiloh sat on her favorite armchair, Beau asleep on her lap, her fingers stroking his silky ears. She looked out onto the Paris street, street lamps reflected in the rain-slicked streets and sighed. Come on now, she told herself. You were never the type to postpone your life for love. And to do it for a man like Benoit. She had to admit that it stung that he hadn't asked her to stay, nor made any reference to his waiting for her to return. That wasn't the way the world worked, she knew. Only in fairy tales did the white knight keep himself chased for the princess. No. Africa it was, and she would focus on that, and the tremendous opportunity it was for her. She would book an appointment tomorrow, to deal with the other problem. Her fling with Benoit was just that, a fling. She just didn't think she would ever forget him. Maceo looked at Ori, his green eyes serious. Are you sure about this? They had come to New York, and for the last week, had been watching Tyson Yannick on the campaign trail rebuilding his sullied reputation, glad-handing the public, kissing babies and holding press conferences. His most important speech was today at New York City Hall. A speech about domestic abuse, Ori had told Maceo incredulously, and that disbelief had fueled her determination. Alex had helped them shape their own speech, one which Ori would deliver to Tyson's face in front of his public, the press, and his political colleagues. His career would be in tatters, and Ori could not wait. She smiled at Maceo now. One hundred percent. They were riding in the car with Alex, making their way through the New York traffic. Ori was wearing an elegant but classy navy dress, a string of pearls at her throat. Again, Alex had advised her on looking the part, and Ori was grateful to Maceo's friend. They will try and paint you as a nut job he had said the previous evening when they were finalizing her plan, a hysteric, a bitter attention seeker. Forgive me, Ori. I'm giving you both the worst case scenario here. That's not the worst case scenario, Maceo had argued, his handsome face lined with concern. The worst case, my darling, is Tyson coming after you, hurting you, killing you. Alex shook his head. Will not happen, Maceo. We have the security team in place. Maceo did not look happy, but Ori put her arms around her lover and kissed him. I'll be fine. Once the police and the press have all the information and evidence we have, he won't be able to touch me. He may think he will have nothing left to lose, Maceo said, not convinced, but Ori would not be talked down. It's time, she said firmly, for AJ. For myself. So now, as they edged closer to City Hall, Ori was nervous but ready. At the reception area, she could see the press and Tyson's security team gathering. Alex had contacts, however, and they were soon being ushered backstage and into a small dressing room where they would stay until Yannick was already speaking. I must warn you, the aide said in a low voice, that Congressman Yannick is in the next room, so keep your voices low. Ori thanked the man. He smiled at her. Really, it's my pleasure. About time someone brought that asshole down. He left them alone, promising to come back when the time was right. Maceo had his arm locked around Oro's waist. 
So proud of you right now, he murmured, his mouth next to her ear. She turned to meet his gaze, and a rush of love swept through her. She could not imagine her life without this glorious man, it barely seemed possible that there was a time when she hadn't known him. Alex hovered slightly awkwardly on the opposite side of the room. The aide returned, nodding at them. It's time. As they walked to the press room, the aide ran through what Tyson was talking about. I've primed a journalist to ask a leading question, something to throw him off so that you can start to speak. Mr. Bartoli and Mr. Millen's men will hold back Yannick's security if it's required, but my guess is that he won't want to make extra drama. Ori nodded, her heart hammering in her chest. Alex waited outside of the room. As they reached the back of the room, Maceo stayed back so Tyson wouldn't see him over the crowd. Ori, as petite as she was, easily slid behind a tall pressman. The aide nodded to her when she heard a female journalist ask a question. Congressman Yannick, why the timing of this bill? Isn't it just a sop to the women who abandoned you in droves during your recent scandal? Not at all, Tyson said smoothly. Domestic abuse and women's rights have long been at the top of my agenda. Really? I had heard different, the journalist said, her voice hard. Ori drew in a deep breath. Tyson chuckled patronizingly. And what had you heard, my dear? Ori stepped out from behind the other journalist and started to walk towards Tyson. She's heard about the many, many times you raped me, Yannick, your own stepdaughter, the first time when I was thirteen years old. She spoke in a clear voice which to her amazement didn't shake. A gasp went up in the room, and Tyson Yannick went white when he saw her. Ori walked steadily to the podium and took the mic from Tyson. For those of you who don't know, my name is Orianthi Roy, and until my mother's death, this man was my stepfather. Over the years, until I finally broke free, he subjected me to rape, physical, emotional, and intimate abuse. He has, on many occasions, threatened to kill me. I imagine he's thinking about doing that to me right now, aren't you, Tyson? Tyson's mouth was flapping open and shut, his shock almost rendering him numb. Out of the corner of Ori's eye, she could see his security men edging forward, but Maceo and Alex were stepping into the room and their security teams were at the ready. The journalists in the room were silent. Ori dragged a shaky breath into her lungs. But believe it or not, that's not the worst thing this man has done. Not by a long shot. Many of you might know that he had a son, Adam James. A.J. She turned her dark eyes onto Tyson's pale face and saw murder in his eyes. Murder and desperation. A.J. was my brother, Ori said, her voice cracking. My brother and your son. And you raped him. Continuously. Brutally. From the time he was five years old, until the day he committed himself to the mental health facility. The room exploded, journalists jumping up and screaming questions. Tyson's security team rushed the stage, and Maceo and Alex's men tackled them as Maceo darted to get to Ori. Tyson lunged for her, tackling her to the floor before anyone could stop him. His lips at her ear he growled, You're dead, Ori. I swear to God, I will kill you for this. Maceo hauled him from Ori, who scrambled away from her stepfather. Maceo punched Tyson hard, the older man dropping like a stone, and it took both Ori and Alex to pull Maceo from him. Let's go, Alex said urgently, and in moments they were back into his town car racing away from the scene. Alex switched the radio on, and they heard the news breaking. Ori, breathless and shaken, looked at Maceo. Phase one complete, she said. Maceo half-smiled. The journalist is meeting us back at the hotel. She did a good job, Ori said gratefully and looked at Alex. You chose well. Alex smiled at her. Thanks. Well, we're in it now, so let's hope it pays off. Tyson Yannick kicked his way back into his hotel room, cursing and yelling, his aides and security team cowering under his rage. Find what hotel she's in now. I want a way to get to Ori without her bodyguards being there. That bitch isn't going to draw another breath when I'm done with her. The aides exchanged glances. Congressman, if anything were to happen to Ms. Roy now, you would be the first suspect. 
Tyson tried to rein in his temper. He knew they were right, but gosh, on that podium, if he'd had his knife, he would have stabbed Ori to death right there in front of the world's media. Futting fucking bitch. He never honestly thought she would have the guts to do what she did today. Fuck. This was it. Even if he denied the claims, he was never coming back from this. It was over. His suspicions were confirmed a few minutes later, when the chairman of his party called. It was a brief, tense conversation, but it was made very clear to Tyson that he no longer had the support of the party. His resignation would be expected the next morning. Tyson didn't even challenge it. Screw this. If he was going to hell, then he would take Ori with him. If the police were going to investigate and charge him, then he might as well go down for her murder as well. He dismissed everybody, except his most trusted bodyguard. When they were alone, he eyed the man. He'd hired him because of the cold lack of empathy he had seen in him, and now he was grateful for it. She has to die. The bodyguard nodded. Do you want me to do it, boss? I'm happy to. That was the other thing he liked. The man simply enjoyed killing as much as Tyson, but he shook his head. No, I want to do it. I just need you to bring her to me. Unmarked car. We'll take her out of the city, and I'll do it there and leave her body in the car. She's pretty well protected. I know. Tyson sighed. But there's always an opportunity at some point. Make it happen. Ori was exhausted. After talking with the journalist, telling her and AJ's entire story, it had felt like a huge weight lifting, and now she just wanted to sleep. She lay next to Maceo as he stroked her skin with his hand. There was concern in his eyes, and now she wanted it in the open. He will try and kill me now, she said softly, before I can say anything more, before I give evidence to the police. Which is why we need to get out of the country. Ori shook her head. No. I need to speak to the police first. Maceo gave a sharp sigh of frustration and sat up. I swear sometimes you have a death wish. I don't, Maceo, I swear. But we came here to do this, let's finish it. Maceo's back was tense, and she pressed her lips against his shoulder blade. Baby, we're nearly home and free. Don't be angry with me. He looked around at her, his large green eyes full of love. I'm not angry, Mio Caro. Ori smiled. Good. She pushed him back onto the bed, unzipping his pants and sliding them down his legs before straddling him. Maceo looked up at her body appreciatively as her hands stroked the length of him. Have I told you just how beautiful you are today? Ori grinned. Cheeseball. Maceo laughed, then shuddered as she cupped his rocks in her hands. The things you do to me, Mio Caro. They fell asleep just before dawn. A couple of hours later, Alex knocked at their door. You'll want to turn the television on. Huddled on the couch, Ori and Maceo stared at the large flat-screen television as Tyson Yannick, his face pale and drawn, spoke to a much tighter group of journalists than yesterday. Obviously, these allegations are a disgusting slur on my character, and I can assure you that I will prove my innocence in all matters. My stepdaughter has long been bitter towards me, since her mother cut her out of her will. This was after discovering that the young and precocious Orianthi had made many intimate advances to me. I knew that one day, our relaxed method of parenting would return to haunt me, and so it seems that day has come. If you're listening, Ori, please, darling, get the help we all so desperately want you to have. AJ wanted you to have that help too, and your reluctance to do so, well, let's just say, there were reasons why he decided to end his life the way he did. Ori drew in a sharp breath, and Maceo cursed loudly. Figlio di Patana. Alex shut off the television and held up his hands. It's hard to hear that, but here's the thing. The press isn't buying his story, Ori. The New York Times has basically been gathering information about Yannick's proclivities for years, and they hit him with it in this morning's edition. He handed her the paper. Ori read the headline, Yannick's closet empties out. Congressman denies rape and abuse, but staffers say it went on for years. 
she felt a lump in her throat and looked at Maceo and Alex. His staffers are telling the truth? More than one, Alex said gently. Ori wiped a tear away. He really is going down, huh? The FBI are investigating, Ori. I've already had a call about you being interviewed. Ori sighed, leaning against Maceo, who put his arms around her and looked up at his friend in gratitude. Thank you, my friend, for everything. We could not have done this without you. Alex smiled. My pleasure. Look, we need to talk security later, but for now I'll give you two some space. When they were alone, Ori looked at Maceo with shining eyes. It's over, isn't it? Maceo nodded, smiling. It looks like it, Bella. Thank God. Benoit had insisted on driving Shiloh to the airport himself. Shiloh had been quiet all day, and now he looked over at her. Are you excited? I am, she said softly. I'm just not a fan of traveling. Besides, I worry about Bo in the cargo hold. I would offer my private jet, but I know you don't approve. She gave him a half smile. I'm not going to lie, I would be torn about my principles and having Bo in the cabin with me. You will email me. We can Skype often too, and I can keep you up to date on my projects if that would be of interest. Of course. She looked away and out of the window, and Benoit nodded to himself. He would not make this separation harder, by telling her just how desperately he would miss her. He was already grieving for the loss, but he was damned if he'd show it. This was the best opportunity Shiloh had been offered, Benoit Vaux knew how rare these things were. Over the past two weeks, Shiloh had seemed to have drifted away from him emotionally and physically, and he knew she was absorbed in her work. That was good. That was how he had become a self-made billionaire. Work was the key. At the gate, he kissed Shiloh's soft pink mouth and felt the silky strands of her light blonde hair drift through his fingers. Shiloh Holt, he said. You are a magical woman. You will go on and change the world, I have no doubt about that. I am lucky to call you a friend. There was a little flinch, he noticed, but she smiled at him. And the same to you, Benoit. Thank you for changing my mind about your kind. Look, I have to go, but I will email you. As soon as you're settled, he said, and kissed her again. He leaned his forehead against hers and closed his eyes. Say avec vous que j'ai commencé à dire oui au monde. It is with you that I started to say yes to the world. Paul allured, Shiloh breathed, touched beyond comprehension, I know that saying. It's beautiful. Benoit nodded and opened his eyes. And very appropriate. Shiloh stared at him, and he thought he saw a flash of tears there, but she smiled brightly at him. I must go. Goodbye, Shiloh. We will see each other again. She nodded but said nothing, as if not trusting herself to speak. She walked through the gate, only looking back once more to see him waving. Benoit watched her disappear, his heart sinking. If I had known one year ago what an effect this woman would have on me. Love, he decided, was a distraction. Love was the willowy blonde walking away from him right now. He drove back into the city through the cool Paris night and went to a bar near his home. He ordered a scotch and nursed it for a while before walking back to his apartment. Knowing Shiloh was in the air made him feel the emptiness of his home keenly. He snagged his phone and dialed a number he knew by heart. Marcella answered, her smoky voice purring down the phone at him. Benoit, darling, it's been too long. How was your trip, Marcella? Too much sun, too much drink, too many young lovers. I adored it. She gave a throaty laugh. Benoit grinned. Marcella, what say we get together for a drink? I need a beautiful distraction. Twenty minutes later, he was in a cab to her apartment, and when she opened the door wearing nothing but a long silk robe, Benoit only hesitated for a moment before walking into the room. Marcella studied him. Monsieur, she said without criticism, you have changed. Benoit nodded. I have. Someone changed me. But now, Marcella, I need to forget her. Will you help me with that? 
Marcella smiled and held out her hand, letting her robe fall open to reveal her lithe, athletic body. But of course, my dear, but of course? Already flying high above the city, Shiloh looked out of the window at the lights of Paris beneath her and let a few tears drip down her face. Goodbye. She squeezed her eyes shut and put her hand over her belly. She'd lain in her bed the morning of her appointment at the clinic and listened to them calling her voicemail, asking her where she was. She couldn't do it. Not Benoit's child. Not her child. Whatever physical changes had come over her were nothing to the emotional bond she already felt with the tiny embryo inside her. She couldn't get rid of it, and now that she would be alone in Africa, screw it, she had thought. I want this child, I want it so badly. She sighed and leaned her head against the window. Even if its father doesn't want me. Tyson Yannick was tired of waiting. His career had been shot to smithereens, and now he had nothing left. Well, not nothing, there was still his private fortune, he would never have to work again. But Tyson wanted fame above everything, and if he couldn't get it through politics. He found out where she and Bartoli were staying, and put together a reasonably sloppy disguise to throw her bodyguards off the scent. He figured if he went all out on prosthetics, it would be seen through in a moment. Instead he shaved his head and wore his frameless glasses. His glossy, well-coiffed head of hair had been his standout insignia, along with his blandly handsome face. Without it, someone wouldn't be completely sure if it was him or not. It was ridiculously easy to gain entrance to her hotel, even easier to bribe some staff into helping him. He used one of his staff's credit cards to book into a suite. He had to be careful. His bodyguard had reported back to him that the FBI was talking to Ori. They might be with her. They might on the lookout for him. So he let himself into the suite opposite Ori and Maceo's and waited. She would be unprotected at some point. The Ori he knew hated to be cooped up. She would skip out for some ice from the machine in the hallway or down to the lobby for some air, and then he would take her. No elaborate plan, just grab her and stick the knife into her as many times as he could before her security came running. Easy. Ha, ah, Tyson thought now, setting up a chair near the door so he could hear her door opening and shutting, along snippets of conversations. Easy wasn't the word I'd choose. Ori would die in agony, bleeding out before her bastard lover could summon the help she needed. Tyson didn't much care about himself after that, they could put him in jail. As long as Ori was dead, he would be satisfied. His chance came three days later. He was listening to her talking to Maceo at their doorway, before kissing him goodbye and telling him to hurry back home. Tyson watched through the peephole as Maceo Bartoli took off. The other guy, the American, seemed to be in the room with her but when Tyson heard him leave too, he risked going across to the door and trying it. He couldn't believe it. It was open. His heart pounding, he darted back to his room and grabbed the knife he kept ready. It was long, thin, and lethal. Tyson crept slowly over to Ori's room and went inside. He walked silently through the apartment until he saw her. She was napping on the couch, stretched along the wide cushions. In her sleep her t-shirt had ridden up, and Tyson was distracted by the long expanse of silky brown midriff. He gripped the knife and stepped forward, crouching down to her level. Gosh, she was beautiful. He placed the tip of the knife against her skin, anticipating how it would split and gush blood, how her eyes would open in shock and terror, her moans of agony. Goodbye, Ori. A hand clamped over his mouth and jerked him away from Ori's sleeping body. He dropped the knife as he realized he could smell chemicals and then the room was fading around him. As he lost consciousness, he heard a voice next to his ear say, Your death will be more merciful than you deserve, you piece of scum, more merciful than the one you were about to give Ori, you'll never touch her again. Tyson Yannick knew then he was a dead man and that Ori his Ori had finally won. When Ori woke, it was already dark. She blinked. She'd only meant to sleep for an hour or so. Someone was banging on the door. Miss Roy. Miss Roy. She pushed herself off the couch and stumbled, still half asleep, to the door. Yanking it open, 
she was amazed to see her bodyguard almost frantic. Gosh, are you okay? Jesus, please sit down, I'll call 911. Ori was completely discombobulated and let him lead her to the couch. David, I don't need 911. I'm fine, what are you? She trailed off as she placed a hand on her belly to quell the rising panic, and her hand came away wet. She looked down. Blood. Ice flooded her veins, what the hell? She pulled up her t-shirt to find a shallow but definite stab wound just right of her navel. What the hell was going on? She suddenly felt light-headed, and she must have paled as David, who was always professional with her, stuck his arm around her to steady here. He was talking rapidly into his phone, only pausing when she turned frightened eyes towards him. I've been stabbed, she said in disbelief, and he nodded, grim-faced, relaying that news to whomever was on the other end of the phone. A second later she discovered it was Maceo, also frantic. As David handed the phone to her, she could hear him yelling her name. Ori mio Dio, are you okay? Maceo, calm down, I'm fine. It's not very deep. I just don't understand how it happened. She heard heavy breathing as Maceo tried to gather himself. Maceo, why was David pounding on the door? Has something happened? Gosh, Ori, it's Yannick. He's been found dead. Shock rippled through her, shock but not sadness. That's not important to us anymore. Maceo sighed. Look, David is going to take you to the emergency room and I'll meet you there. Where the hell was Alex all day? Sweetheart, he has a job. I told him I'd be fine. Jesus, she had no idea what was going on and she suddenly felt exhausted. Okay, look, I'll go with David. You'll be there? Of course. Maceo, his handsome face lined with fear, wrapped his arms around her. The doctor smiled at him. She's fine. It's just a little cut. I'm more concerned about the sedative. Maceo was confused. What? Ori touched his face. They think I was drugged with some kind of sedative. That's how come I didn't feel it when I was stabbed. She looked to the doctor, who nodded. We've called the police, obviously. Look, you have your antibiotics. I'd like you to stay in one night for observation. Oh, that's not necessary. Yes, it is, Maceo interrupted her protest in a tone that she'd never heard before. Hard, angry, shocked. She nodded at him, squeezing his hand. Calm down. Fine. Thanks, doctor. Maceo pressed his lips to hers. I'm so sorry, baby. I should have protected you. She clung to him, needing to feel his solid, strong body against hers. She felt chilled to the core. Maceo buried his face in her hair, and she suddenly remembered what he had told her. Tyson's dead? She felt him nod. They think he may have fallen from the roof of his building. Fallen or jumped? They don't know exactly. They sat in silence for a long moment. Maceo stroked his finger down her cheek, and she leaned into his touch. T. Amo. Let's go home, Ori. It's time. Agreed. She sighed and kissed him again. Knock, knock. The doctor reappeared, looking uncomfortable. Ori, the police are here. Ori noticed the doctor didn't look at Maceo and wondered at his attitude, but gave her permission for the men to enter. Two police detectives entered the room, nodding at her. Are you here about the stabbing? Maceo stood and offered his hand. The police officer ignored it. No, it's about the death of Tyson Yannick. With a sympathetic glance at Ori, the officer reached into his pockets and drew out a pair of handcuffs. Suddenly Ori realized what was happening. No, no, please, not that. Maceo looked at her, his handsome face even more confused as the police officer reached for his wrist. Maceo Bartoli, I'm arresting you on suspicion of the murder of Tyson Yannick. Nightfall Fashion god Lysander Duarte is in the middle of prepping his biggest show ever, when the news breaks that his brother-in-arms, 
Maceo Bartoli, has been arrested in connection with the murder of disgraced politician Tyson Yannick. Maceo's lover, Ori Yannick's abused stepdaughter, calls on the Midnight Club to help Maceo convinced of his innocence. Lysander races to New York and meets with Maceo's lawyer, Kate Garcia, a junior partner in one of the Big Apple's most prestigious law firms. Fiery Lysander, however, is outraged that Maceo is taking legal advice from a child, but as he gets to know her, an undeniable attraction forms and soon they are both questioning their lives. Meanwhile, a devastated Ori works with Alex to find out what happened the night of Tyson Yannick's death, and who drugged and injured Ori herself the same night. She finds more and more ties to Viola's death, and when the website showing their photos is updated with a new horrific message, she realizes her time is running out. With Maceo absent, will Alex be able to protect Ori, or does he hide dark secrets of his own? Lysander Duarte did not speak to anyone the entire flight from Buenos Aires to New York City. The flight attendants fussed over him, bringing him champagne, but Lysander barely registered their presence. Maceo. Arrested for murder. Jesus. What was shocking Lysander more than anything was that somehow this had been inevitable. Maceo had always been the one to get into trouble, but at the same time, out of all of the Midnight Club, Maceo was the one Lysander would have sworn blind would never, ever be violent. Leave that to Alex or me, he thought now, shaking his head. But maybe Maceo's love had been in serious danger. Alex had called Lysander and filled him in, and Lysander had taken a look at the website. Seeing Viola's dead body like that. Gosh. Lysander had swallowed the bile that rose in his throat. Alex had also told him about Maceo's alleged victim. Yannick was a rapist and a pedophile, Alex spat out, and he was going to murder Ori. Maceo swears he didn't kill him, but would any of us blame him if he did? No way. He and Alex had always been the most similar of their group, no-nonsense straight shooters who would do what it took to protect the people they loved. Had they underestimated Maceo's capacity for violence? Alex had arranged for a car to pick Lysander up at the airport. At Alex's hotel, he greeted his friend with a hug. Where is Maceo now? Holding cell. He's got a lawyer, but bail's not been set yet. How's he doing? Alex half smiled. He's Maceo. A little shocked to be banged up, but he's pretty confident this will be sorted out. What about Ori? Alex sighed, his expression softening. A mess. She got hysterical when they arrested Maceo, so the doctors have kept her in the hospital, sedated. They think whoever killed Yannick, well, they saved her life. Cops believe that Yannick stabbed her and was stopped from going all the way. There were signs of a struggle in the room. Lysander ran a hand through his pale brown curls. Jesus, what a mess. Do we think Yannick was behind that website? Alex shook his head. No. Ori is the only connection between the two cases. Lysander studied his friend. Alex looked older and grayer, the grief of Viola's murder etched on his handsome features. And how about you, my friend? Alex tried to smile. The main thing is to get Maceo freed and to make sure Ori is safe. Seth thinks the best way is for me to take her out of state while Maceo is locked up, but she's chafing against leaving him. What does Maceo say? Keep her safe. At whatever cost. Who's his lawyer? Catherine Garcia. She's a junior at Fielding Lawn and Greg's. Wait, junior? It was short notice, Sander. Maceo is happy with her. Lysander's face tightened. Look, I want to see Maceo and talk to this lawyer. Alex shrugged. No problem. Look, I can drop you at the prison if you'd like. I'm going to see Ori to try and talk some sense into her. Kate Garcia tried not to grimace as she was being patted down for the third time that day. How would I have smuggled something in when I haven't been outside since the last time you did that? The guard gave her a withering look and Kate grinned. No sense of humor. The guard buzzed her through the gate and she walked quickly down to the interview rooms. Maceo was already waiting for her, 
his eyes tired and stressed, but he still had a warm smile for her. His green eyes crinkled at the edges. It would be quite easy to get a crush on you, Kate thought, but quickly pushed the thought away. Firstly, she was a professional. Secondly, Maceo Bartoli was crazy nuts for his lover, the deceased's stepdaughter. Kate had seen the press conference where Ori had outed Yannick for his abuse of not only her, but his biological son. Kate had cheered on the brave young woman and had been amazed when, not 24 hours later, she had been called to represent this man, Ori's love, for the murder of Yannick. Did you sleep? She studied Maceo's handsome, scruffy face. He shook his head. Not much. How is Ori? Have you seen her? Kate smiled. She's fine, Maceo, just worried about you. The doctors haven't released her yet, but I'm sure that when they do, her first visit will be to you. Maceo shook his head. No. I don't want her coming to a place like this. Seeing me like this. Maceo. No. Please. I couldn't bear it. Alex will know what to do. Kate sighed. Okay, well, I'll stay out of it, but Ori won't be happy. I just want her safe. I know. Maceo fixed her with a steady gaze. I didn't kill Yannick, but I would have. For her. He stabbed her. Gosh, when I think about it. Don't think about that, Kate said sharply. Ori is fine. And don't ever say that again to me or anyone else. At least not while we're fighting this case. Maceo agreed and drew in a deep, shaky breath. So, did they tell you how it happened? Why they think it was me? Kate looked at her notes. Yannick's throat was cut, he was almost decapitated. They found the knife, the same knife used to injure Ori. How did he get into the hotel? I have no idea. As far as evidence, they don't have much that isn't circumstantial, apart from the knife. They wanted to try and pin Ori's stabbing on you at first. I know, I know, she said as Maceo's face flashed with horror. Don't worry, they quickly dropped that idea when numerous people told them that there was no way you would hurt her. They're tilting at windmills mostly, but it's just the knife. They say they have found DNA that doesn't belong to Ori or Yannick on it. Any chance it could be yours? Maceo shook his head. None. Kate sighed. Well, we'll get some lab work done and see where we go from there. We do have witnesses that say they saw you leaving MoMA around the time of Yannick's death, so there's that. Look, let's just see if we can get bail set and go from there. She was walking back to her old Volkswagen in the parking lot when she saw him. She recognized him, of course. Who wouldn't? It just wasn't every day that a world-famous fashion designer leaned against her car, giving her the kind of look that would have shriveled a meeker person than she. Instead, she got irritated. Mr. Duarte, I suggest you step away from my car, she said as she approached, and to her satisfaction he did. Miss Garcia, I wanted to talk to you. Then call my office and make an appointment, Mr. Duarte, she said shortly. Gosh, were all of Maceo's friends as gorgeous as he was? This one was tall, and looked like he could bench press an entire football team. His bearded face was framed by wild light brown almost auburn curls, his beard full and thankfully not manscaped. No, this guy looked as if he should be chopping wood in the Pacific Northwest, not designing clothes. Miss Garcia, this will only take a second. Call my office, Mr. Duarte, she said firmly and opened the driver's door. Lysander put a hand gently over hers, and electricity snapped up her body. He leaned in so that his face was close to hers, but strangely, Kate didn't feel threatened. I will call, Lysander said softly, but for now, just tell me how he is. His hand felt huge over hers, the warmth of it against her skin. Kate cleared her throat, aware her face was burning. Mr. Bartoli is fine. Tired, but that's understandable. Lysander removed his hand, and Kate felt bereft. Thank you, he said. Gosh, that voice, deep, smoky, the heavy accent. Kate nodded sharply and got into her car. She watched as Lysander returned to the waiting taxi cab, she hadn't even noticed was there. Damn. She let out a long breath. 
It had been a while since anyone had had that effect on her. Even, she thought now, guiltily, her longtime boyfriend Nikos. She pushed the thought away. What the hell is wrong with you today? First Maceo, and now his friend. Are you extra horny for some reason? She chuckled to herself as she drove back into the city. A half hour later, she got her answer as the monthly stomach cramps hit. Of course, she thought, but then felt a strange pull of relief. Not pregnant. Again. She and Nikos had been together for six years, all through Harvard Law, and now their careers had taken off. So when Nikos had said six months ago that he'd like to have a child, Kate had been surprised both at his request and at her own reaction. A child. Now. Nikos hadn't pressured her, but told her he would happily be a stay-at-home dad. Hell, I'd even carry it for you if that was possible, he joked, and she had laughed. They talked about it for a couple of months until finally Kate had said, let's not try try. Let's just stop using the condoms and see what happens. Nikos had agreed, but now every month they were on tenterhooks. She picked up her phone now and dialed his number. Hey babe. Hey you. Well, red sky in the morning. Oh, she heard Nico sigh, well? Damn. I'm sorry babe. Not your fault, sugar, just had a feeling this was the month. She smiled down the phone. It will happen, Nicono. Don't call me that. At least not in public, he chuckled. Did you go see your hot Italian perp? I did and I did check. He's still hot, she teased, knowing Nikos would see the funny side of it. He did. How come all I get is dyspeptic old men with toe fungus, and you get hot billionaires? Nikos grumbled, and Kate laughed. Because you chose medicine instead of criminal law, sucker. She was still giggling when she hung up the phone, but when her boss shuffled down the hallway to see her, she immediately switched into her professional mode. Gerard Gregg nodded at her as he listened. Okay, well I can't suggest a better way so just keep on what you're doing. I assume they've shown you how to bill hours? Kate hit a grin. About two years ago, Jerry. Jerry waved his hand. Forgive me, Kate. I lose track of time. When he left her office, Kate reflected again on how far she'd come at such a young age. Of course her work ethic had driven her there. Could she really halt everything for a child? She was only 29. The answer is that I simply don't know, she thought. I don't know if I want a new life. For some reason her mind flitted back to Lysander Duarte, and she wondered idly what his children would look like, before imagining him without clothes and screwing her, his machismo a total turn-on. Kate wriggled in her chair. Stop that right now. She sighed and got back to work. Orianthi Roy had already packed her things by the time Alex turned up at the hospital. She greeted him with a hug, and he laughed as he watched her shoving her clothes into a holdall. Have the doctors actually said you can go? Yes, she said firmly, then grinned. No, but they will. The doctor is due here any minute. How's your wound? Hardly feel it, she said brightly. Really, I think people were making a big fuss over nothing. A stab wound isn't nothing, Alex said softly, noticing her wince at the word stab. Ori fixed him with her cool hazel eyes. Alex? I want to go see Maceo the minute we get out of here. Alex shook his head. Not going to happen, sweetheart. Maceo does not want you near that prison. Tough noogies, she said shortly, I'm going. Alex sighed. Ori, look. Maceo and I talked and we think the safest thing for you is for me to take you out of state until Maceo is bailed. Ori gritted her teeth. Alex, do I get a say in this? Not really, Angel. It's for your own safety. Ori was silent, and Alex could see the conflict in her eyes. Finally, she turned to him. I will go with you on one condition. What's that? I get to see Maceo once before we leave New York. Maceo had agreed reluctantly, and Ori would never know how Alex or Maceo's lawyer had swung it, but they had arranged for Maceo and Ori to have a private room to themselves for a few hours. 
As soon as she saw him, she ran into his arms, and his lips found hers. Gosh, I missed you, he murmured, and with tears in her eyes she nodded. Let's not waste time, she said, her eyes locked onto his, I want you now. With a growl, Maceo pulled her to him, and soon they were shedding their clothes, not caring that the door of the room they were in was locked from the outside. It was a hard, furious, desperate bang, and afterward, Maceo stroked his hand slowly, languorously over her soft skin. He touched a fingertip to the butterfly stitches over her small wound. Does it hurt? No. It never did. If it hadn't been for the blood, I doubt if I would have even noticed it. It truly is nothing. She nestled closer to him as they lay together, using their clothes as a blanket. Maceo tightened his arms around her. We'll get through this, you know. I know. I'm just scared that they need a scapegoat for Tyson's death, and you're it. I'm not sorry he is dead. Me neither. Hey, she grinned up at him. Now I only have one psycho after me. Score. Don't even joke, he said, but couldn't help laughing at her mischievous grin. In all seriousness, Ori, you will go with Alex, yes? Until I make bail? Ori sighed. Yes, okay. If it's what you want. It is, Mio Caro. I hate that you have to see me like this. Ori propped herself up on an elbow and looked at him. Maceo, I know you didn't do this, but I wouldn't have blamed you if you had. If I had had the chance to kill that man, well, maybe I would be here instead of you. But I know you didn't. He stroked her face. Non si sono abbastanza modi in questo mondo per dire si mostra quanto ti amo. Ori smiled. That's beautiful, what does it mean? Maceo pressed his lips to hers. There are not enough ways in this world to tell you how much I love you. Ori felt tears prickling her eyes. Ti amo, Maceo. Ti amo. She straddled him her body lit by the small window, her hand slipping between his legs to stroke him. Maceo smiled lazily at her as she brushed the tip up and down her warm wet, before impaling herself slowly onto him, pushing her hips against his. Promise me something, Ori said, as their time together drew to a close. Maceo kissed her gently. Anything, am I amore? Ori looked up at him, her eyes serious. Don't ever lose faith, will you? In your innocence. In the future. In us. Maceo smiled at her. I promise, and the same goes for you. You and me. You and me, she said. It was only later, when Alex was flying her in his private jet up to his house in Vermont, that Ori allowed herself a few tears. She couldn't help feeling as if she was abandoning Maceo when he needed her the most, but he had been adamant. The worst thing I can imagine is something happening to you, he said. Alex will keep you safe. Ori knew Maceo was aware of the small crush Alex obviously had on Ori, but still trusted his friend to take care of her. Ori too knew she could rely on the big man, and that he would not take advantage of the situation. How can you be so sure? A small voice inside her piped up, but she batted the thought away and tried to get some sleep. Benoit Vo woke to the news of Maceo's arrest, and immediately made plans to fly to New York. He called Seth, who told him about Alex taking care of Ori. Maceo could really do with the rest of us being there for him, Seth said in his soft Canadian accent, and Benoit agreed. But no sooner than he had ended the call, then Alex himself called him. Benoit. I hate to do this, but have you been seeing someone? A blonde woman called Shiloh Holt? Benoit's heart began to pound. We saw each other for a while, but she's in Africa now. Why? Alex hesitated. I just rechecked the website, the one with photos of Viola and Ori. There's a new photograph, Benoit? Benoit looked up the address Alex gave him, and his heart froze. It was a photograph of Shiloh, her blonde hair flowing down her back, walking through the arrivals area of a foreign airport. Underneath, the caption read, Nightfall. Jesus, Benoit hissed, his emotions swirling. There was something else about the image he couldn't quite get a handle on, 
but he listened as Alex calmed him down. Look, man, unlike the photos of Viola and Ori, she's not injured in any way, but I thought you should know. She's on this crazy's radar now. Benoit was silent for a long time. Who the fuck is doing this? And why not come after the four of us, not the women we love? I'm trying to rack my brains to find out who would do this, who we might have pissed off. I think this goes beyond just pissed off, Alex. Yeah. Benoit sighed. Look, I was going to fly to New York, but now I think I had better go to Africa and make sure Shiloh is safe. After he had hung up, he studied the photograph of Shiloh closely. There was something about her demeanor, and the way she carried herself. When it came to him, he pushed back his chair and strode to his office door. Genevieve, book me a flight to Nairobi as soon as you can. Kate Garcia glanced over at her client as they sat in his bail hearing. The DA on the other side smirked at her, Kate knew him well. She had been at law school with his younger brother. Smug bastards both of them from a rich family. All rise for Judge P. Richards presiding. The judge made his way in and sat down. I understand the prosecution has something to say at this time? Kate glanced over at the DA quickly, she didn't know what they were playing at. Maceo looked at her, but she shrugged. Your guess is as good as mine. Your Honor, we would like to ask the court for a postponement of this bail hearing in light of the new evidence we are just receiving. Kate was up. Objection, Your Honor. What new evidence? That's for me to ask, Ms. Garcia, said the judge mildly, then looked back at the DA. Let's have it. The DA glanced at Maceo quickly. We feel certain Mr. Bartoli is a flight risk, and today we have come into some information that he had already been planning to return to Italy once his bail was set. Maceo looked confused and shook his head at Kate. She stood. Your Honor, my client knows nothing about these plans. So this itinerary and flight plan are nothing? The DA held up a sheaf of papers, then presented them to the clerk of the court. Maceo bent his head towards Kate. I made no such plans. Someone's framing me. So it would seem, Kate murmured. And that gives me pause. I don't think it would be a bad thing to postpone bail. Something about this is hinky, and I don't want you vulnerable. Maceo nodded. Understood. Kate stood. Your Honor, the defense has no objections to the postponement of bail. When Maceo had been returned to the prison, he and Kate sat in the interview room, hot but weak coffee in front of them. Kate fixed him with a long stare. Maceo, someone is trying to frame you for Yannick's death. I want you to tell me everything about yourself, where you were born, who your parents were, where you went to school, were friends with, weren't friends with. Who you've screwed. Everything. Something is rotten here, and I want to know what it is. Maceo nodded. Me too, Kate, me too, and began to tell her the story of his life. Lysander waited for Gerard Gregg to be available. Gregg's very nervous PA's eyes had widened when she saw who was demanding to see her boss. Lysander tried to smile at her, but it came out as a grimace, and he saw her flinch just as Gerard Gregg opened the door and ushered him into his office. The man was elderly, Lysander saw, but there was still the spark of great intelligence and wit in his eyes. What can I do for you, Mr. Duarte? Lysander sat forward. Mr. Gregg, I am here regarding my friend and your client, Maceo Bartoli. I am concerned about his legal representation. What are your concerns? The man's tone was mild, but wariness flashed in his eyes. Lysander cleared his throat. Ms. Garcia seems very young to be taking such a big case. Jerry smiled. If that's your concern, you have nothing to worry about. Kate is one of the best lawyers I've ever seen, and I've been doing this for nearly fifty years. Don't let her youth fool you, that one is a killer when it comes down to it. If you'll pardon the metaphor. Lysander wasn't satisfied, but the older man would not give way, and eventually Lysander stalked out of the office, cursing under his breath. Kate Garcia was walking into the building, talking on her phone. She saw him, 
and to Lysander's amazement grinned at him. She came to a stop in front of him. Yeah, I'm with him now. See you in a few. She ended the call, dropping her phone into her bag and gazed up at him, scrutinizing his face. Lysander suddenly felt guilty. Look, I... Kate grabbed his arm. Come with me. She marched him out of the building and down the block, Lysander just going with it. They went to a small bar where Kate ordered two whiskey sours and some chicken wings. I don't eat during the day, Lysander said, desperate to regain some of the control in this situation. He had to admit, being bossed around by this little firecracker was kind of a turn-on. Kate scoffed, they're not for you, big guy. Get your own. She took a sip of her drink. So, you think I'm a little young to help your friend beat a murder rap? Ah. Gerard Gregg had ratted him out. Lysander took a deep breath in. Honesty was the only way to go. I do. Which is no reflection on your abilities, Ms. Garcia. Kate. And I'm confident in my ability to defend Maceo. What specifically is your concern? She met his gaze with a cool, steady look, and Lysander suddenly wondered if she was this assertive in bed. Her caramel hair fell in waves past her shoulders, and her warm honey-colored skin was smooth and clear. The swell of her breasts under her blouse was intoxicating, and Lysander felt his groin tighten. Mr. Duarte. Damn. She has caught him staring and was grinning. Mr. Duarte, is it because I have boobs? Because I assure you, hell, Beyoncé assures you, girls run the world. Suddenly Lysander burst out laughing, an unusual sound even to his own ears. He shook his head. You are like no one I've ever known, he admitted with a wry smile. Kate's chicken wings arrived, and she fell on them, offering him one despite her earlier declaration. Lysander shrugged and took one. Let me guess, Kate said, wiping her mouth. The women you're used to are, uh, pin-thin models with all the personality of the undead, or b. praying mantises who see dollar signs. Lysander's mouth hitched up in a smile. That's a very jaded view of the world. I speak as I find. I'm beginning to see that. So, apart from my relative youth, what's your objection to my representing Maceo? Lysander sighed. She had him beat. Look, I'm sorry. I overreacted. Maceo is my brother. There is no way he killed Tyson Yannick, even if he was threatening Ori. Maceo doesn't work like that. He would have done everything he could to protect Ori, but by the book, building a watertight case. Mr. Duarte, you don't have to sell that to me. I believe Maceo is innocent. But I also believe someone close to him or Ori is setting him up. Lysander was shocked by this. Why would they do that? Kate shrugged, and he realized that although she behaved casually, she was gauging his reaction to her statements. Smart girl. Lysander took a slug of his drink. Kate, ask whatever you need to. I don't have anything to hide. Any questions you have, feel free to come to me. I can tell you this, it's none of his closest friends. Ah, the infamous Midnight Club. Lysander rolled his eyes. That name is about twenty years old. Hopefully we've all matured past it. Kate shrugged. You know, I kind of like it. She smiled at him. The way Maceo talks about his brothers makes me wish I had siblings. He loves you all. Lysander felt sadness settle over him. Kate, I just ask that you do everything, everything to help him. Kate, her own face serious now, nodded. I promise, Mr. Duarte, there is nothing I won't try to get Maceo free. Lysander went back to his hotel room, his mind whirling. Who the hell would set up Maceo, of all people? Maceo, the fun one, the easy-going one, with more charm than the rest of them put together? His mind flitted to the many, many women, and their husbands, who Maceo had slept with over the years. He vaguely wondered if Maceo had been entirely faithful to Ori, but banished that thought almost immediately. The way they were together, Lysander, as well as Alex and Benoit, had never seen Maceo so wiped out by love. No, he was sure, Maceo was reformed. 
But yes, maybe someone from his past or an ex-lover. Lysander's mind went back to Kate Garcia. He would still need convincing that she could help Maceo, but he now had confidence that she would try anything. He felt bad that he'd gone to her boss. I should apologize. He called the concierge and asked him if he could arrange for some flowers to be sent to her. He allowed himself a small fantasy that Kate Garcia would be so grateful that she would immediately come to his hotel suite to thank him. He imagined unbuttoning that blouse of hers and letting her honey-skinned front fall into his hands, taking them into his mouth. Lysander sighed. Really, man, you're thinking about intimacy at a time like this? He couldn't help be attracted to the young lawyer, though. He just hoped she would see Maceo through the roughest time of his life. Benoit strode through the hotel lobby. Nairobi was sweltering, but all he could think of was seeing Shiloh, confronting her actually, he thought. If he was correct in his assessment of the photograph, then not only was Shiloh in serious danger, but she was hiding something from him. Something huge. He hadn't called ahead, he wanted to catch her unawares. Money changed hands at the reception desk, and then he was in the elevator to her floor. The hotel itself wasn't luxurious but merely functional, and Benoit noticed signs of wear and tear as he walked to Shiloh's room. He knocked and listened for her inside. Shiloh opened the door and rocked back when she saw him. She was wearing a pale yellow sundress, her skin already a little tan from the African sun. Benoit, what the hell are you doing here? Benoit smiled but it didn't reach his eyes. May I come in? Shiloh hesitated for the briefest second then stood aside. Please. He walked into the tiny room. Shiloh shifted some of her stuff from the bed, and they sat facing each other. Benoit, what are you doing here? She asked again, and this time he reached into his pocket and pulled out the photograph from the website. He handed it to her. Shiloh glanced at the photo with surprise. Who took this? We don't know but we're pretty sure it was taken by the person who murdered Viola. Shiloh, this photo appeared on a website with two other photos, one of Viola dead, one of Ori after she had been attacked. It's a threat. I've come to take you home and keep you safe. Shiloh was open-mouthed, her face pale. Benoit. And then there's the other thing, Benoit said softly. He took the photo and traced the image of her, her hand on her belly, looking down at the minuscule bump. Benoit looked back up at her. Why didn't you tell me? Shiloh had tears in her eyes. Because I didn't want you to feel burdened or trapped. It was an honest accident, and I was going to deal with it and never tell you. But I couldn't go through with the abortion. I want this baby, Benoit, but I do not expect anything from you. You think I'd abandon my child, Shiloh? Shiloh looked away from his keen gaze. You told me to come to Africa, Benoit. You made your position clear. A tear dropped down her cheek, and Benoit couldn't help but brush it away with his fingertips. Shiloh, perhaps I didn't make things clear enough. I didn't send you away. I wanted you to take this opportunity, because it was the best thing for you. He grinned suddenly. If I had my way, you'd never leave my bed. Shiloh looked up at him. What? I'm telling you how I feel about you, Shiloh. But listen, I can see you're upset and I think I know why. Let me put your mind at rest. When it comes to us, I'm in, Shiloh. We're a partnership. A team. You make me a better person. My heart is yours. Shiloh looked pale and shaky. And you're not just saying that because... Her hand fluttered over her belly, and his big hand covered hers. No. But I am excited about the future, for the three of us. I don't know if we can work it out, but I'm willing to give it a try if you are. His lips found hers then, and he felt her sink into his arms. They lay back on the bed and began to make love slowly, Benoit tracing his lips along the fine planes of her body, noticing, despite the baby, that she had lost a little weight, her delicate limbs curving around his body. He gazed down at her as he moved inside her. Gosh, this woman, he knew he was falling in love with her. 
He had never felt this connection before with anyone. A child. Benoit had been staggered to find himself excited at the prospect of being a father. Kids had never been part of his plan. But now with this remarkable woman, yes. He hadn't lied to her. He was in. Later they ate together, using room service. Benoit returned to the subject of the website. I think it's pretty obvious now that someone is targeting us. Or he's been attacked twice now. We're all scared that the next time it happens, she won't be so lucky. Have you noticed anyone following you? Shiloh shook her head. But then, I haven't been particularly vigilant. Time to change that. Yes. She ate in silence for a time. Benoit, what do you think I should do? I mean, I'd be sorry to leave here before I even started to make a difference. Benoit nodded. And why should you be driven out of the country by this coward? I agree, stay, be defiant, make a difference. The one thing I ask is that you let me provide you with security. Better safe than sorry. I know you don't like to be around people all the time, they'll be discreet. Shiloh sighed, her body slumping, but she nodded. Okay. I know you're right. Benoit, and she suddenly flushed. What about you? Will you? Come back and see me. Benoit smiled and took her hand. All the time. I wish I could be here permanently for you, but you know my work is in Paris. I do. It's a heck of a commute. Benoit laughed. It is that. And look, not to pressure you, but doesn't the baby kind of put a time limit on this job? It does. I worked out that I have about six good months. Even if I just get the ball rolling on some cases, I will have felt that at least I achieved something. Benoit squeezed her hand. Should we talk about living arrangements when you come back to Paris? Shiloh hesitated. I don't know. How about we say not yet and see how this thing progresses? Benoit lifted her hand to his mouth and kissed her fingers. Agreed. Shiloh smiled at him. Hey. How's Maceo? And Ori? Benoit's smile faded. Maceo is bearing up. Ori. Alex took her out of state to his place in Vermont. Alex did? She sounded skeptical and Benoit frowned. Concerns? Shiloh raised her eyebrows. Hasn't Alex got a pretty major crush on Ori? Benoit half smiled. I don't think that's anything to worry about. Maceo wanted her protected while he was in jail. After a pause, Shiloh said softly, You don't think he did it, do you? Maceo? No way. But if he caught Tyson in the act of trying to kill Ori, it could have happened. Benoit inclined his head. True, but Maceo would have admitted it, that's what I'm really saying. Maceo is a terrible liar, so he doesn't bother. He would take responsibility. Besides, Yannick was killed some time after Ori was attacked. Maceo has an alibi, some artist in Queens, but the authorities for some reason don't believe this guy. They say Maceo is the only person with a motive other than Ori herself. What a fucking mess. I should call Ori, Shiloh said, thinking about the lovely young women she'd only met once but had liked immensely. I think that's a great idea, Benoit smiled at her warmly. He wrapped his arms around her, kissing her soft mouth. Now, Ms. Holt, why don't you show me around this lovely city? Ori was frustrated, bored, and felt out of place in Alex's huge Vermont mansion. Even Maceo's sumptuous Venetian apartment couldn't hold a candle to it, but for some reason, Ori couldn't settle. It lacked something. Warmth. Whereas Maceo's apartment had bookshelves stuffed with books, expensive but comfortable couches, and a kitchen designed to be the heart of the house, Alex's home was a study in minimalism. Ori had been surprised. Alex seemed far too friendly a man to have a home like this. She wondered what Viola had made of it. Outside, winter had set in, and Ori shivered as she watched the snow pile up. She missed Maceo so much that it was like a physical pain in her chest. They spoke every day on the phone, but when she went to sleep at night, 
The bed seemed huge and cold without him beside her. Alex was kind and attentive, but Ori felt slightly awkward around him. There were photographs of Viola everywhere, and Ori saw her own resemblance to the dead woman even more keenly now, living in her home. She wondered if Alex was more aware of it. She would catch him staring at her as if he had seen a ghost sometimes before turning away, apologizing. You poor man, she thought now. I cannot imagine how I would feel if anything happened to Maceo. Desperate to distract herself, she spent time talking on the phone to Lucia at the gallery back in Venice and burying herself in the work Lucia emailed to her. Kate Garcia, Maceo's lawyer, had come up to interview Ori and had brought Lysander. Ori had been amused by the pair's bickering as Kate grilled Ori on Maceo's personality and Lysander rolled his eyes constantly. As the pair were leaving to go back to New York, Ori had nudged Lysander. She's lovely, she had whispered, but Lysander gave her a mock scowl. She's a child. But Ori could see that he liked the young lawyer. At midnight, Ori closed her laptop and padded down to the kitchen to get some milk. The house rang with silence, and she wondered where Alex was. She didn't want to intrude on his privacy by asking. She wandered through the darkened house. She had been surprised that Alex didn't have a huge staff for this enormous mansion. His chef arrived in the morning and stayed all day, but apart from a couple of cleaning staff, the house was empty. As Ori made for the stairs again, she glanced over at the front door. Deadbolt and locks. This place wasn't a home, it was a fortress. She went to bed and tugged the comforter around her. Sleep was eluding her, so she closed her eyes and conjured up a memory. She and Maceo working late at the gallery, discussing a new exhibition they had planned for the following spring. She loved that, despite his insatiable appetite for her sexually, he also appreciated her intelligence and work ethic, and didn't dismiss her ideas. He respected her. She told him as much that night, and he grinned at her. Of course, Mio Caro. I didn't just want you for your body, although now that you mention it, you are looking very fine tonight. Ori chuckled. After being at work all day. Maceo rounded the table and studied her. The pale pink summer dress she was wearing looked warm against her olive skin, her dark eyes shone at him. He pushed her hair back over her shoulders and trailed his fingers along her throat. Especially, he murmured, lowering his lips to hers, after being at work all day. He slid his fingers under the thin straps of the dress and pulled them down her shoulders. Ori sank into his kiss. I knew I liked this desk for a reason, he said, and Ori laughed, excited, her heart pounding as she opened her arms to him. I love you so much, Ori whispered. When finally exhausted, they caught their breath. You are exquisite, he said, nuzzling his nose against hers. Our children will be gorgeous. Ori chuckled. Seriously, Maceo, I've never known anyone with so much confidence. Maceo grinned, shrugging unrepentantly. I know I'm a good-looking man, I've cashed in on it many times. He grinned but she winced. Hey, I meant as a business tool. Ori took a deep breath in. Sorry. I'm not a crazy jealous person, I promise. But I hear things. From? She hesitated then said in a small voice, Cassie. Maceo rolled his eyes. Cassie likes to exaggerate for reasons of her own. Ori couldn't look at him. Were you and her ever? Maceo shrugged. She really isn't my type. Ori grinned then. So how many women have you slept with? I honestly didn't count, he said, rolling off her, and for a moment she wondered if she had upset him. His face was neutral though. Ori, the only thing that matters is how many I've slept with since I met you and that's one. You. You are my life, my love. There will never be anyone else. Ori's eyes filled with tears and she got choked up. Oh, Maceo. Maceo pulled her on top of him. Now be a good girl and straddle me. I want to play a game. She did as he asked, giggling as he tickled her gently, then as he grabbed his tie she raised her eyebrows at him. Oh yes? Do you trust me? Implicitly. 
Good. He grabbed her wrists and bound them together behind her back. Ori chuckled at him. Kinky. Just testing your limits, Bella. Ori wriggled on top of him, feeling him growing hard underneath her. She was completely turned on by the feel of silk tie tight around her wrists. Maceo smiled at her. Gosh, you're beautiful, Orianthe Roy. He gathered her to him and kissed her, murmuring, How about we just stay here forever? If only they had, Ori thought now, all these weeks later. The ache she felt in her chest and not being with Maceo was agonizing, and finally she let herself cry out all her sorrow, for Maceo, for AJ, and for herself. He almost marveled at their arrogance. Moving Orianthe out of state, Bartoli locked up and so so sure she was safe. She was never safe, he'd proved that. The day he'd killed Yannick was also the day he'd come so so close to killing Ori too. He'd had to hold back and remind himself. Not yet. Not yet. She was unconscious, and her t-shirt had ridden up, and the warm gold skin of her belly had been too much temptation. He had placed the knife tip against the skin then. Just to appease his almost overwhelming bloodlust, he'd pushed the blade into her, just a centimeter or so, enough to watch the flesh sink under the steel, then split. Enough to spill her precious blood, without ruining the anticipation of the actual kill, the murder, the horrific death he had planned for her. And the blonde girl, Benoit's lover, he grinned to himself now. Masterstroke. Now they thought it was all about their lovers, all of their lovers, not just Ori. It deflected any suspicions they might have. He'd had the blonde followed, found out she was going to Africa, had someone take the photo then. He grinned to himself. He had no interest in the blonde, but if it kept the Midnight Club angry and fearful, all the better. His thoughts returned to Ori. So lovely and yet so vulnerable. He hadn't finalized his plan to kill her, the where or when, but it would be talked about for years afterward in hushed tones. That poor girl, they would say, you would not treat an animal that way. Do you know, Ori? Do you sense that I'm close? Do you think about me, how I'll kill you, how I'll make you suffer? Can you picture Maceo's grief? Soon, my love. Soon. Kate Garcia felt another wave of nausea come over her, but she swallowed hard. Maceo, sitting next to her, exhausted and drained, shot a glance at her. You okay? Kate tried to smile at him. She had to be okay. Today was Maceo's bail hearing, and by the looks of him, he'd reached the end of his tether. She knew how desperately he wanted to be with Ori, that sending her away with Alex had killed him. If they could get the judge to set bail, Maceo could get some decent sleep in Ori's arms. The trouble was not with her case, which as far as she and her boss could see was pretty open and shut, but with Kate herself. The past few days she had felt so ill, so sick, that even Nikos had noticed. You should stay home, he'd said, but Kate shook her head. No way. I've never taken any time off sick, and I'm not about to start now. Sitting here in the stuffy courtroom, she was beginning to regret her stubbornness. Thankfully, the judge arrived. Kate argued her case, the prosecution argued theirs, and finally, the judge granted bail in the sum of one million dollars. And you are to surrender your passport, Mr. Bartoli. Maceo nodded somberly. Of course, Your Honor. Thank you. Afterward, in the car with a very relieved Maceo, Kate told him what she'd found out. They have no case, Maceo. Nothing. They needed to make an arrest quickly because of who Tyson Yannick was, but they have nothing on you. No forensics. The artist in Queens wasn't the only one who saw you at his place or at MoMA. I'll be surprised if this case ever sees the inside of that courtroom again. The DA is pissed. Maceo sighed and leaned his head back against the headrest. That's good to hear. Do you want to go back to the hotel and get some sleep? I'll go back to the hotel, but only to take a shower. I want to go to Vermont tonight. Lysander is waiting for me. At the hotel, Kate, telling herself it was just to make sure Maceo checked in okay and not, absolutely not because she wanted to see Lysander again, went with him. Lysander was waiting in the suite, 
a table full of sketches in front of him. He and Maceo hugged for the longest time, then as Maceo went to shower and change, Lysander smiled at Kate. Thank you. His rich, heavily accented voice made her belly quiver. You have done a remarkable job. Kate tried to smile. Not really, but thank you. They don't have a case, it's that simple. She nodded at the sketches. They're beautiful. Lysander smiled. You think so? Come take a look for me. I don't know anything about fashion. Lysander made a noise. Don't be silly. All I want to know is if you would wear something like this. He picked up a sheet of sketch paper and handed it to her. It was a beautiful gold gown, fitted, with a skirt that billowed out from a tiny waist. You would look amazing in this, Lysander said softly. The color of your skin against the gold? Oh, yes. And how about this green? Or the burgundy? Kate flushed at his compliment. He was sitting next to her now, and she couldn't help breathing in his scent of cologne and soap. His knee rested gently on hers. Although her stomach was roiling, she still felt desire flood through her. Nikos. Don't forget Nikos. She looked up at Lysander, opening her mouth to comment on the sketches when her brain failed her. Lysander was looking at her, his dark eyes so intense she couldn't look away. Time passed, one heartbeat too. Lysander bent his head and brushed her lips with his. Light quick testing her. The second kiss was firmer, the third one he slid his tongue into her mouth. Kate sank into the kiss, knowing it was wrong. They both jumped as someone banged on the door. Room service. Guiltily, Kate stood, not looking at Lysander. I'm sorry, I have to go. Maceo. Maceo came out of the shower, wearing a towel around his waist. Kate almost groaned. What was with these guys? They radiated sex. She forced herself to speak in a professional tone. I must go. Have a great time in Vermont but stay in touch. She couldn't get out of the room fast enough. In her car she brushed away some tears. What the hell were you thinking? Poor poor Nikos. He deserved better. He wasn't home when she got in, and she was glad. Her nausea had returned, and now she felt lightheaded and hungry. She grabbed some leftover lasagna from the fridge and microwaved it, but as soon as she put the first forkful into her mouth, she knew she had made a mistake. She made it to the sink before she threw up, but barely. When there was nothing more to vomit up, she sank to the kitchen floor. Gosh, she must be sick. She crawled to the bathroom and rummaged around for painkillers in the cabinet. She threw a couple down with some water, managed to keep them down, then crawled into bed. Curling up under the duvet, she dozed off and on. A couple of hours later, she heard Nikos come home. He checked her temperature. Still sick, baby? She nodded, and he wrapped her up in the comforter. I think we need to get you to a doctor, Kate. She waved him away. It's just a virus. Three hours later, she was screaming in pain as a panicked Nikos called the emergency services. Sirens, flashing lights, and she was being wheeled into emergency surgery. Appendicitis. Well, shit, she said, still high on morphine when Nikos came to visit her the next day. Just damn appendicitis. Nikos smiled at her. Just? Baby, I'm so happy it was just that. I was scared out of my gourd. A nurse knocked on the door. Someone sent flowers. That's nice, oh wow. Kate gaped, as a huge bouquet was brought in with a large manila envelope. The bouquet was stunning, pale golds, creams, yellow and whites, roses, gerberas, lilies and Kate noticed a few fronds of pampas grass. She suppressed a smile. Lysander. How the hell did he know she was here? Nikos's expression was confused. Who are they from? I think they are from a friend of a friend. Lysander Duarte. She was opening the envelope. The designer. Nikos sounded impressed, but Kate wasn't listening. She was holding the sketch of the golden dress. On it in his elegant scrawl Lysander had titled it El Catalina Doro, and under that had written, When you are well enough, it is yours. L. 
Kate felt her throat close. Oh gosh. Why? Why had she kissed him? This was not good at all, and yet she felt overwhelmingly excited. She steeled herself. Well, that's very sweet. He's a good friend of Maceo Bartoli's, that's how I met him. He's just saying thank you. Nico seemed to buy this, but when Kate was alone, she kept rereading Lysander's message. I cannot cheat on Nico's with you, Mr. Duarte. I won't be that girl. The doctor came in to check on her. Hey, Kate, how do you feel? He pulled up a chair next to her. Okay, thanks, a little sore. The doctor, Dr. Pays, nodded. Good. Kate, when we were operating, we noticed something else which we thought might be significant. Have you had abdominal surgery before? She nodded. When I was 18, an ovarian cyst. On your left side? She nodded. They had to remove the ovary. Okay. Kate, we noticed that your right ovary has a small cyst now too. Now we can operate to remove it, but of course, if things go wrong, we might have to remove your other ovary. He was silent then, letting it sink in. Kate stared at him blankly. So I would be infertile. I'm afraid so. In these circumstances, we would recommend freezing some eggs just to be safe. You'll still be able to carry a pregnancy to full term, as far as we know your uterus is fine, but we will make sure of that, of course. Kate, do you want me to call your partner? Kate shook her head. No. Thank you. He patted her hand. I'll give you some space. I'll come back in the morning and we'll talk. Kate blew out her cheeks. Well, that went south quick. She rubbed her hands over her face. She had always known it could happen. The female side of her family had always been prone to these benign cysts. She'd looked into freezing her eggs before, half-heartedly, but when she found out that fertilized eggs had a better chance of survival, she balked. Why? Because she truly didn't know if she wanted children at all, or if she did if she wanted them with Nikos. And now she would have to make that decision. Well, shit, she muttered for the second time that day. Lying down, she couldn't help but stare at the bouquet from Lysander, and as she fell asleep, she knew that if Lysander had been the father, she wouldn't have hesitated. Maceo smiled to himself as he looked down at Ori's sleeping figure. Last night, as Lysander had driven him up to Vermont when they approached Alex's sprawling compound, Maceo had laughed when he saw a little dark-haired figure yank open the door and run out to meet the car. He was out of the passenger seat before Lysander had time to hit the brakes, and he and Ori fell into each other's arms, joyful at being reunited. They made it another hour and a half, chatting with Alex and Lysander, before they couldn't bear it any longer and excused themselves. Practically tearing each other's clothes off, they'd made love through the night. Ori had assured him that Alex and Lysander were sleeping on the other side of the house, and so they screwed with abandon, until exhausted, they fell asleep as the dawn rose. Ori lay on her stomach, her dark hair clouded around her. Maceo drew the curtain of it back with his finger, before bending his head to kiss the length of her spine. He heard her murmur and chuckled. Good morning, Mio Amore. Ori wiggled onto her back, smiling at him sleepily, stretching her arms above her head. Maceo enjoyed the way her bosom jiggled with her movements. Will we ever get tired of this, she whispered, and Maceo grinned. Maceo kissed her deeply, wanting to taste her. He trailed his lips to her ear and whispered, Sposami? Ori smiled through her tears and nodded. Yes, Maceo Bartoli, I will marry you. By the end of her second week in Nairobi, Shiloh was flying high. The work was hard, the language barriers made easier by Shiloh's interpreter, the case is sometimes heartbreaking. But this, this, was what she had studied for and broken her back to achieve. She was working with another, older human rights lawyer Florence, and Shiloh knew she had found her mentor. Florence, a well-spoken Briton, was friendly but thorough. She reined in some of Shiloh's more emotional tendencies with practicality and an encyclopedic knowledge of the law. Benoit kept his word and flew to see her every few days, so much so that her colleagues knew him as well as they did her. 
She felt grateful that he took an interest in her work, and didn't even seem to mind that Florence tried to persuade him to invest in housing projects in the country. Africa needs investment in housing, Mr. Vo. Here in Nairobi, there is 5% of the population living in slum conditions. You are in a unique position to help them. Benoit enjoyed jousting with the older woman. That is true of any country, Florence. True, but we're here now. Benoit laughed. Florence, I am a businessman. Come to me with a business plan and we'll talk. Shiloh would smile to herself. Benoit had already told her he was looking to help the people of Nairobi. What Florence didn't know was that Benoit planned to help the entire country. She was on her way to Paris now, to spend the weekend with him. For once they had cleared the week's work early and Benoit had sent his plane. Just this once Shiloh had told him and he'd grinned. If I promise to offset the carbon footprint, will you forgive me? She loved that he cared about her beliefs. Now, as she came into land in Paris, she knew he would be waiting with a limousine. She smoothed her hand over her dress, stopping to feel the tiniest bump in her belly. The billionaire's baby. She shook her head, disbelieving of the way her life had turned out. Benoit leaped up the steps of the plane and embraced her. Darling, how was your flight? They traveled back to his apartment, and Shiloh, gazing out of the window at her beloved Paris, could not help but feel glad to be home. She and Benoit spent a wonderful, lazy afternoon making love and talking. Then, as evening closed in, they dressed for dinner. Shiloh slid her slender frame into a dark red cocktail dress, pulling her long blonde hair over her shoulder. Asking Benoit to zip her up added another half hour to their dressing time. The moment his lips trailed against her shoulder, the dress was on the floor again. The maitre d' welcomed them with a smile. Good evening, Mr. Vo, Ms. Holt. Your table is ready. Shiloh and Benoit ate between talking. The food was out of this world, and although she wasn't drinking, she still felt lightheaded and happy. Benoit smiled at her glowing face. Pregnancy makes you even more beautiful, my love. Sweet talker, she said, but she flushed with pleasure. Benoit was more relaxed this evening than usual, and she liked to think it was because she was there. We're good for each other. Lingering over coffee, Shiloh looked up to see a beautiful, slightly older brunette touch Benoit's shoulder. Shiloh recognized her, Marcella. A cloud passed over Benoit's eyes, but he politely introduced them. He didn't invite Marcella to join them, and feeling awkward, Shiloh asked her if she would like to have coffee with them. You are sweet, ma sure, but I have a date waiting. It is nice to finally meet you. I know Benoit was desolate over your leaving Paris. Shiloh noticed Benoit shooting daggers at Marcella. What the hell was going on? Marcella smiled at Shiloh. Darling, let's have lunch soon. I'm sure we have a lot to talk about. Marcella sashayed off to her table, and Shiloh suddenly felt sick. Can we go? Benoit grim-faced nodded. In the car, Shiloh opened the window, letting the cool night air ease her nausea. It could be nothing, she thought, probably morning sickness. But there was a tension in the air that was palpable. At the apartment, she waited for Benoit to say something. When he didn't, she told him she was going to bed. I'll be in shortly, darling. Shiloh changed into her nightgown and slid between the cool cotton sheets. Her chest hurt, and she couldn't shake the feeling that Benoit was hiding something from her. When he hadn't come to bed in an hour, she got up and padded into the living room to find him. She heard him talking on the phone in hushed tones. He was arguing with someone in rapid French. Shiloh stayed out of sight and listened. Whoever was on the other end of the phone, and Shiloh was convinced it was Marcella, was arguing with him, as his voice was hard, impatient. Nah, no, she need never know because it was nothing. I made a mistake and you know that, no, no, Marcella. You do not understand. I have found my person, my love. You told me to find her, and I did, because you didn't want me, Marcella, do you remember that? Shiloh leaned her head against the door jamb, tears in her eyes. Damn that woman. Shiloh had to admit, she had been jealous of Marcella, 
ever since she'd seen the photographs of Benoit and Marcella in the society pages. The other women fit into that world. Will I ever be that kind of woman for Benoit? Unconsciously, she rubbed a hand across her belly. No, you're just the girl stupid enough to get knocked up. Benoit was still arguing. I don't care, Marcella, not anymore. You will not ruin this for me. Goodbye. Shiloh quickly ran back to the bedroom, and when Benoit came in, she pretended to be asleep. Benoit stripped and slid in beside her. Shiloh? Are you awake? Shiloh kept her eyes closed, ignoring his whisper, and when she heard his breathing become regular and even as he slept, only then did she let the tears fall. Maceo shook his head. Mio Caro, it's too dangerous for you in New York. I think you must stay here with Alex. Ori had been arguing with him for an hour, but he wouldn't budge. You'll only be there for a day. I can stay safe for one day, surely? Maceo and Alex looked at each other. Kate Garcia had called them. The DA had dropped the charges, but she wanted Maceo to come back to New York to finalize everything. Ori argued that if she was traveling with him, she couldn't be in that much danger. Ori sighed. Look, both of you, you know this is my decision, right? As much as I love you both, I do have control of my own life and I'm not willing to give that up. For anyone. I had that taken away too much by Tyson. Maceo hugged her. I get that. I'm sorry. She smiled. Don't apologize for caring. I'm just saying, yes, there's a creep threatening me out there, but no way in hell am I going to stop living my life the way I want to. Alex, who had been listening, cleared his throat. I have an idea, if you don't mind me sharing it. Maceo, kissing Ori's temple, nodded at him. Go for it. Ori, I have someone who could be of help, not a bodyguard per se, but an instructor of Krav Maga. Ori's eyebrows shot up and she nodded. I've heard of that, a martial art? Alex smiled. Kind of a mix of martials, boxing, wrestling, etc. You're a healthy, athletic, okay, he grinned as Ori made a face at athletic. You could be athletic. You want more control? This is it. Self-defense. I like that idea very much, Maceo said, grinning gratefully at his friend. Then he turned to Ori, Bella, would you also allow me to find you a bodyguard? Someone who could be a friend, as well as protector? Ori considered. Only if I get to interview him or her, her. I want a woman. She saw the friends exchange a glance and she grinned, shaking her head in mock sadness. Sexist Neanderthals. She sighed as they laughed. Seriously though, guys, we women can squeeze another human being out of us, we can handle being a bodyguard. Kate had discharged herself from the hospital without having the further surgery. There's no rush, is there? The doctor wasn't happy, but extracted a promise from her to see her gynecologist. She hadn't told Nikos yet about her condition. She knew if she did, he would insist on inseminating and freezing her eggs and Kate just wasn't sure. She wondered when she had decided that Nikos wasn't the one for her. When you met Lysander Duarte, you little fool. Now it was a month later, and Kate was relieved when Nikos told her he was working out of the city for a week, and Kate could bury herself in her work. There had been an odd atmosphere between her and Nikos, one which neither of them wanted to address, so they limped on, never really talking. Maceo was officially a free man. There was simply no evidence he had killed Tyson Yannick and the DA's office had to walk back a very embarrassing statement they had made about catching his killer the day of the murder. Kate had never known the DA's office to behave so recklessly, and she was determined to find out if the DA himself had any ties to Tyson Yannick. She would bet her life he did. Tyson must have poured poison into his ear about his stepdaughter's new love. She made her displeasure with the DA known. Jerry had talked her out of launching a formal complaint, until they were sure he was corrupt. A junior partner accusing the DA without proof, that would be the end of your career, Kate. Not just in the States, either. News travels. Kate had been digging around without much success, 
and was in her office being frustrated by the lack of response to her questions when Lysander Duarte knocked on her door. Hey, she said in delighted surprise and stood to greet him. She suddenly felt awkward. Did she shake his hand or hug him? They had kissed, but... Lysander saved her by placing his hands on her shoulders. Let me look at you. You seem healthy. I trust you're doing well? She grinned. I am, thank you. Appendicitis is painful, but thankfully, the recovery is quick. Thank you, Mr. Duarte, for the beautiful flowers and the sketch. It meant a great deal to me. I think we can go with Lysander and Kate now, can't we? Lysander grinned, taking the seat she offered. And it was my pleasure. I meant what I said. When you're ready, that gown is yours. You are too kind. Kate could feel her face burning. What brings you into the city? Forward planning for New York Fashion Week. And I wanted to see you and make sure you were okay. Her face couldn't get much hotter, Kate mused, but she was delighted he wanted to see her. She threw caution to the wind. Hey, look, I'm finishing up here. Want to grab a drink somewhere? Lysander pushed through the crowded bar and to the table he and Kate had commandeered. He handed her one of the sodas in his hand, and they clinked glasses. Kate Garcia was easy to spend time with, he thought now, and she'd done what nothing else had done for months now, made him smile. She grinned her thanks to him for the drinks as he sat back down beside her. Thanks for taking care of Maceo, he said, clinking his glass to hers. If only all cases were that easy. She checked her watch and leaned back happily, but not for another hour. I could live here. She looked around the bar, its subtle lighting and dark wood complementing the big leather couches. You seem like a woman who would want to go out every night, soaking up everything New York has to offer. Good or bad, he added, grinning wickedly. She laughed. Yeah, been there, done that? Not here, but yeah, I've done my share of partying. Her expression was suddenly changed, bleak and sad. Lysander frowned. Sorry. She shook her head. No, it's okay. I was a mess with drugs, booze, anything that was available. My dad had just died, Ma was remarried and with her new family. She laughed quietly then. Lysander waited and she smiled at him. Little Miss New Boobs. Lysander's eyebrows shot up. Excuse me? Kate grinned. It's from friends. When Janice's husband leaves her for another woman and his new family, she calls her Little Miss New Boobs. Lysander shook his head. Your knowledge of friends is somewhat encyclopedic. She bowed her head. I thank you. I could probably recite the whole ten seasons to you verbatim. It's a gift. It's something, all right, Lysander muttered and laughed when she punched his shoulder. Hey, tell me to mind my own business. Mind your own business. Funny girl. So what was the catalyst? To stop the partying? Kate smiled. I can't even tell you. It's like one day I just woke up and thought, what the hell is this life? Such a waste. I remember being out at Coney Island, and it was cold but sunny and just a perfect day. I had a hangover, but the fresh air blew through me, and I just decided at that moment to change. So I got clean. It's not like I was on the heavy drugs, it was just the odd ecstasy pill and some weed, and enrolled in college. And that was that. Lysander nodded. Impressive. For what it's worth, I'm very grateful to Coney Island. Kate laughed. Me too. She met his gaze and her stomach flipped. Lysander smiled, a soft, intimate smile and then his lips were on hers. Gosh that kiss, tender, gentle, then firm and masterful. Kate's head whirled with desire. Lysander leaned his forehead against hers. Want to get out of here? She took him back to her apartment, her desire for this man overriding the thought of Nico's. Lysander's hands were on her body, caressing, massaging, stroking, and she let go of all her ambitions. I want you, Katie. A punch to the gut. Katie was Nikos's nickname for her. Oh gosh, Nikos, I'm sorry. She gently pushed Lysander away. I'm sorry, I can't. 
she couldn't look at him. He stood catching his breath silent for a few moments. It's okay, it's okay. He tried to smile, but Kate could see the hurt in his eyes. She slid off the counter and went to him. I'm sorry, I don't know what I was thinking. She grinned wryly. I truly am a big old mess at the moment. I have a boyfriend, his name is Nikos. Until I get things resolved with him, it's not fair to him. It wouldn't be fair to you. I'm just not ready. She tried to read his expression. Friends? Always, he said with a sad smile. Kate stroked his face. It's not that I don't want you, Lysander. I do. I have ever since that first day. I just have to end things with Nikos first. I don't want to be a cheater. Lysander nodded. I understand. Look, I had better get out of here before you change your mind and wrestle me to the ground again. Kate laughed, grateful for the joke. Does anything dent your confidence? Lysander grinned. Not really. He cupped her face in his hand and brushed her lips again. Kate groaned, the taste of his mouth was too intoxicating. They started to kiss again, then froze as someone knocked at the front door. For a moment, they didn't move. Another knock, louder. Kate sighed and grinned up at Lysander. Disengage, soldier. He snickered. Walking away from him, she smoothed her clothing and her hair quickly. Another knock. Coming. If only, muttered Lysander, and she giggled. Purr. She blew him a kiss and skipped to the front door and unlocked it. Nico stood in front of her, his face a mask of shock. Benoit and Shiloh sat in the small cafe, both staring at the photograph in front of them. Shiloh reached over and took Benoit's hand. He looked up at her, dazed, almost bewildered. She smiled at his expression. Our baby. Our girl. He laughed softly. I cannot quite believe it. This is really happening, huh? Shiloh laughed and rubbed her belly. Unless this is a burrito baby. She watched him as he marveled at the scanned photo. Any names come to mind? Anything but Marcella. She regretted her words at once as his face creased with pain. I'm sorry, Benoit. I didn't mean to break the mood. He didn't answer, but stared out of the window. The Parisian streets were dark now, streetlights casting long beams over the slick wet asphalt. She watched his face go through a myriad of emotions before he cleared his throat and turned back to her. Shiloh, I'm not going to pretend that I didn't feel something for Marcella and that I probably will always miss her as a friend. But this, he waved the scan gently, I am committed to our child now to trying to make us work. She reached over and stroked his face. Thank you. She saw the uncertainty in his eyes though, withdrew her hand and sighed. Things would be so much better if she wasn't around all the time. Just so you didn't have to see her, so I didn't have to see her and know she was the love of your life, that I am your fallback, your consolation prize. Her voice was soft, but there was bitterness in her words and angry tears in her eyes. He sighed and took her hand. Don't ever say that. He sighed, Marcella is not the love of my life, Shiloh. Don't you know by now that I love you? It was the first time he said it, and Shiloh's eyes filled with happy tears. I love you too, Benoit Vo. He smiled and kissed her hand. A new life, Mon Amour. She smiled and glanced at her watch. Let's go home, Benoit. Let's start making that new life. Shiloh waited at the cafe as Benoit brought the car around. Outside the rain was relentless, headlights on the windows of the cafe twinkled like jewels. Shiloh smiled to herself, running her hand down her swollen belly and picking up the scan again. She could pick out the baby's face now, the nose, the tiny eyes. She squinted, trying to see who the child resembled, then laughed to herself. What did it matter? Everything was working out right. She traced the fetus outline with her finger, her eyes pricking with tears. Love. It was a feeling she had thought she would never feel for a child. We're on our way, baby, she whispered, grinning to herself. She noticed an old couple looking over at her, and she waved the scan at them. They nodded and smiled. 
Sighing happily, she gazed out of the window again, trying to pick out Benoit's form in the melee of cars and bodies in rain, and waited. He watched her from the across the street, his eyes following the elegant sweep of her neck, the way her blonde hair fell over her shoulders in fine strands. So, she was pregnant? That made things more interesting. Still, he was only tracking her to throw people off his scent. This blonde girl was merely collateral damage. Ori was his real prize, her resemblance to Viola fueling his bloodlust. He would use the blonde to distract the Midnight Club and then, when the time was right, claim his prize. It was getting harder and harder to get to Ori alone, he would have to take his chance whenever he could. He just hoped he would get the chance soon. Orianthi Roy could not be permitted to marry Maceo Bartoli. She was his and his alone. Shiloh saw Benoit pull up to the curb and gathered her things. She stepped out into the rain, and Benoit leapt out to open the door for her. As he did, a car came from nowhere, tires screeching wildly and slammed into their car. The force knocked both Benoit and Shiloh off their feet, broken glass shattering around them. Benoit threw himself onto Shiloh as the car headed inexorably towards them. It was over in seconds, and then all was silent for a beat. People began to stream out of the cafe to help. The attacking car pulled back and screeched away, the driver unseen. Benoit quickly gathered Shiloh to him. A large gash on her forehead was oozing blood, her cheeks were grazed but she blinked at him dazed but conscious. Cavier? His voice was urgent, and she nodded. We. Oui. Toy. Benoit was shell-shocked but unharmed, what the hell was that? He looked up at some of the bystanders. Did you see who that was? They all shook their heads but later at home, when they were resting, he got his answer. A text message. Nightfall. Benoit cursed, and Shiloh looked at him with big frightened eyes. Together, they looked at the website. A new photograph of her had appeared, sitting in the cafe waiting for Benoit. A warning, I am close. Benoit did his best to reassure Shiloh. I will never let him hurt you or our child. Four hours later, in the dead of night, Shiloh awoke, panting, pain like she'd never known ripping through her. She staggered to the bathroom to find blood flooding out of her, the pain in her abdomen excruciating. She managed to scream for Benoit before she passed out. Seth Cantor had been concentrating so hard on his work that he barely heard his cell phone. As the weather worsened in Montreal, he stayed longer hours at the office. Now that he and Irina were over, he had no appetite for socializing. He knew his friends were worried about him, but they all had bigger problems at the moment. He snagged the phone from his pocket. Cantor! It's me. Benoit said, his voice flat. Seth's heart began to beat fast, please don't let this be bad news. Did you see the website today? Seth brought it up and cursed. A new photo. It was taken yesterday, just before we were hit by a car. Shiloh's in the hospital. They think she might be miscarrying. Seth's heart sank. Oh gosh, I'm sorry. Thanks. Look, they're trying to stop it, but I really need your help. We need to find this guy before he kills Shiloh or Ori or anyone else. Agreed. Look, I'm on my way to Paris. I'll be with you soon. Hang on there, buddy. Thanks, Seth, Benoit sounded relieved and grateful. See you soon. Alex told Ori and Maceo about the attack in Paris as they ate breakfast. Both expressed their sorrow. Do you think we should go to them? Alex shook his head. Maceo, you haven't got your passport back yet. Seth is going, and we all agree that putting Shiloh and Ori in the same place is not a good idea. He or she is determined to kill you, he said to Ori, who paled. I think this shows he will stop at nothing. I'm glad you have Jason and Krav Maga. Cheers to that, Maceo murmured and kissed Ori's temple. She smiled but said nothing. Over the last four weeks she had been training hard every day with Jason Meeks, an instructor who Alex knew. She was enjoying the physicality of it, and her body changing as she got fitter and leaner, but there was something else, something she hadn't shared with Maceo or Alex. Jason himself had appeared friendly when she started working with him. 
They would go for long hikes in the woods, but it wasn't until a few days ago that she'd noticed his changing attitude. He began to flirt, complimenting her on her body in a way that made her uncomfortable. What was the word, she thought? Intimate. He pretended there was an intimacy between them that didn't exist as far as she was concerned. Then yesterday, she had been late to the rendezvous point. Tired, cranky, and hormonal, she had overslept, and the aspirin she'd taken for cramps hadn't kicked in yet. She pulled her car alongside his at the parking lot of the trail. He stood, his hands on his hips, staring at her car. She sat in the car for a few minutes, trying to gather herself. It was obvious Jason was waiting for her. She rubbed at her eyes and dropped her head into her hands, frustrated. Five. Minutes. Two. Myself, she intoned softly, her words muffled. She gave a yelp as the car door was yanked openly suddenly. What the hell are you doing? Jason's face was red with anger. I was worried sick about you. Her annoyance flooded over, and she slid from the car and slammed the door shut behind her. Ignoring him, she stomped into the small hut where the bathrooms were, trying to slam the door in his face. He caught it though, following her, and she turned on him. I don't answer to you, Jason. I don't answer to anyone. Now, if you don't mind. He stepped toward her and she caught her breath as she saw the rage in his face. She swallowed and turned away, but his hand was on her shoulder then, gripping, spinning her around. You don't talk to me like that, baby girl, do you understand? After all I've done for you, is it too much to ask for a little common courtesy? Ori felt a jolt of dread as she looked into his handsome yet angry face. Suddenly Jason blinked, stepped away from her and held his hands up. Gosh. I'm sorry, Ori. That was totally inappropriate. Please forgive me. I was worried sick about you, and I took it out on you. Please, I'm sorry. He looked so genuine contrite that Ori's anger seeped away. It's okay, she said rather stiffly. Look, shall we leave it for today? Jason sighed. If you'd like, but I'm willing to put this behind us and carry on if you are. Ori considered. Her stomach cramps were telling her to go back to bed, but she knew that if she carried on, the exercise would be good for her. And indeed it proved so as they ran, walked, and practiced their moves. She had to admit she loved training out in the open, no matter how cold it was. She felt like she was becoming strong and hardier. Jason didn't mention his outburst again, but she knew she would never feel comfortable with him. So now when she had the chance to say something to Maceo or Alex, she stayed silent. Jason Meeks was the least of her problems right now. Maceo's passport had still not been returned by the DA, and now Maceo's lawyer was getting involved, making noise. She and Maceo wanted desperately to go home to Italy. She missed her work, Lucia, all her friends, along with their life together in Venice, away from all this crap. She had a constant dread that she would never see that life again, that it would be taken from her one way or another. She and Maceo had been trying to find a suitable bodyguard who wouldn't mind traveling around the world, but it had been a hard job. Alex assured them that while they were living under his roof, they were safe. Ori pulled away from Maceo and went to use the shower. A few minutes later, he joined her in there sliding his arms around her wet body and turning her to face him. The spray pounded down on them, flattening his dark curls, and she grinned. Maceo's eyes were serious, though. Are you okay? She nodded, smoothing his wet hair back from his face, his glorious face. She loved how one moment he could look like a teenager, the next like a dangerous man, his eyes growing dark and brooding. You are so darn hot, she said to him now, and he smiled. Don't try and distract me, Mio Caro, I'm concerned. Nevertheless, he pressed his lips to her throat. Ori leaned into his big solid body, skin on skin. This is the place I feel safest in the world. Ori laughed. Never a chance of that, my love. Maceo's cell phone rang. Oh hey Kate. Yup. Gosh that is good news thank you. Yeah. Courier will be fine. I can't thank you enough. He gave Ori a thumbs up and mouthed passport to her. 
Ori felt a flood of relief. They could go home at last. They told Alex the news, and Ori sensed he was slightly disappointed. She felt a rush of fondness for him, he was obviously lonely. You could always come with us, she said to him. It might do you good to get away from here for a while. Alex smiled gratefully at her. You're very sweet. You'll stay another week? Maceo looked at Ori, who nodded. Of course, my friend, we would be happy to. Ori looked out of the window. Jason was picking her up today, and she saw him coming up the driveway. She pushed the little bit of unease she felt to the back of her mind, and kissed Maceo goodbye. Shiloh and Benoit waited for the doctor, their hearts sinking. Hey, he said softly, if it's bad news we can try again. A nurse poked her head in the door. The doctor is running behind. I'm so sorry, but he'll be another couple of hours. Shiloh nodded, but Benoit let out a long breath, obviously irritated. Shiloh smoothed his hair. You look exhausted. She looked around him. Seth, help me out here, get him to get some sleep. Seth had been their rock over the last few days. The doctors had operated on Shiloh, trying to save the baby, but it was a long shot, they told her. Not wanting to invade their privacy, Seth moved out of the gloom of the corner. She's right, Benoit. You've been awake for three days straight. Benoit looked mutinous for a moment, then relented. Okay, look, I'll grab an hour in the room next door. They had a cot set up in there for us. Are you sure you'll be okay? She put her hands on his face and pulled it to her. I'll be fine, baby. Go sleep. She kissed his eyelids. Sleep. Benoit kissed her, then stood. You wake me if anything, anything happens. He said this to Seth, who nodded. Go, Benoit. I'll be here. With Shiloh. Seth smiled at her. Benoit hesitated, then moved to the door. With one last look back at her, he disappeared into the next room, leaving the door ajar. Shiloh saw this and rolled her eyes at Seth. He stifled a laugh. Can I get you anything, Shiloh? Some hot tea would be lovely if it's not too much trouble. Thank you, Seth. The doctor came eventually. It's good news, he smiled at them. Shiloh burst into tears, and Benoit looked vastly relieved. I want to keep Shiloh in for a couple of days, but then you should be good to go. Mon Dieu, mon Dieu. Benoit rubbed his face then hugged Shiloh tightly. I've never been so scared in my life. Seth chuckled. I'm intruding on your family time, I'll give you some space. As he left, Benoit hugged him. Thank you for being here. Any time. Benoit and Shiloh sat and talked about their future, their child for a time, then Shiloh met his gaze. Someone tried to kill us. Yes. Don't worry. Seth and I have already set things in motion. Seth talked to Maceo, to Lysander and Alex. We're mobilizing. This ends now, if it takes every penny we have, every resource available. We're going to make damn sure we're safe. All of us. Ori had been on edge since Jason had picked her up, and now she felt sick. He wasn't driving her to their usual workout spot, she realized this as they passed the turning. Where are we going? Jason smiled at her, and she couldn't detect any menace behind it. A surprise. Somewhere I think you might enjoy. From what Ori could make out, they were going deeper into the forest. As Jason pulled the car over, he started talking. This is my favorite place to run and walk. It's gorgeous. I guarantee you'll love it. There was no one else around, and the forest was quiet. Ori felt her muscles tense as they walked along the path, then as they started to run, she wondered if it had been a good idea after yesterday's debacle. An hour later, they were deep inside the forest when Jason stopped, offering a bottle of water. I wanted to talk to you, Ori, without anyone around. Oh gosh, no. She had been right, this was a plan. Jason studied her. You have nothing to be afraid of with me, Ori, I swear to God. It's Alex I wanted to talk about. Ori was astonished. Alex. 
Why on earth would you need to talk about Alex? I've known Alex a lot longer than you have, Jason said gently, and I knew him with Viola. I knew Viola pretty well. Ori, you and she could be sisters. So people have kept telling me. Ori couldn't help but be a little irritated at being reminded of her resemblance to a dead woman, over and over. This is not news. Is Alex being in love with you news? Ori rolled her eyes. Alex is not in love with me, Jason. He might have a little crush, but love? I don't think so. Jason was quiet for a long moment. Then, if it's not love, it's obsession. Oh, come on. Ori yelled, throwing her hands up. Look, he's my friend, but you should know something. Alex was extremely possessive about Viola. Extreme to the point of violence. Stop it. I saw the bruises, Ori. She turned on him. Why? Why are you saying this shit? Because I care. I care what happens to you. She held her hands up. Please, please tell me you're kidding, or this is some deluded way of getting me to. Viola slept with Maceo. He could not have said anything else that would have made her shut down as quickly. No. No, Maceo would have told her. She put her hands on her face. Why are you doing this? I have no proof of this, but I think Alex is dangerous, and I think he wants revenge. He knows about Viola and Maceo. Ori was quiet for a moment, and then yelled, Fuck, loud and long into the silence of the forest. This is why I wanted to tell you out here. And to answer your question, yeah. I'm attracted to you, and I think we have a hell of a lot more in common than that bunch of rich bastards. Jason stepped closer to her, and Ori backed up into a tree. Jason trapped her in the cage of his arms. Ori tried to step away, but he grabbed her. Don't fight this, Ori. We belong together. Oh, for fuck's sake. She pushed her way free and started to backtrack along the trail, fury burning inside of her. We're going home. Now. To her relief, Jason didn't argue, and they walked back to the car in silence. On the drive home, he turned the car into a gas and sip, and for a second she thought about running. I'll be just a second. He got out, and she let out a deep breath. Outside, the weather had turned stormy, the rain slamming heavily into the earth. Ori leaned her head against the cool window as trucks and cars roared past on the highway, headlights like stars out of the looming dark. The gas station was empty apart from Jason's car. Ori sighed heavily. She watched as Jason paid the clerk and chatted to him. Was she unreasonable? No. This morning she could forgive, but after the way Jason had just behaved. I don't want to be anywhere near him. She choked back the tears as they came, rummaging through her bag for a tissue. Coming up with nothing, she pulled open the glove box of Jason's car. As she searched, her fingers brushed against something cold. Her hand closed around it and she pulled it out. Her entire body went slack as she stared down at the knife in her hand. Ori slammed the glove box closed, opened the door of the car and threw up. Jason, still pumping gas into the car, moved around the car. Hey, hey. Ori, are you okay? Ori cringed away from him, all her bravado from earlier dissipated. She was shaking so badly that he crouched down, reached in, and held her hands. He glanced over to the glove box, and his face changed and became somber. I know what you saw in there. It's just a hunting knife. I put it in there in case we... Ori, we were in the middle of the forest today. I don't have a gun. I thought it would be better to be safe. Obviously, I didn't think it through. Here. He opened the glove box and pulled out the knife. You hold it. If it makes you feel safer, you hold it. He looked at her pinched face and sighed, reached into her bag and handed her phone to her. Call Maceo and tell him where you. It'll make you feel safe. I'm so sorry I scared you, Ori. I'm going to finish getting the gas, then I'll take you home. I promise, Ori. I will take you home. She didn't say anything to Maceo or Alex later, but both of them noticed how quiet she was. After the house had gone to bed, she lay awake, 
gazing at Maceo's handsome face, wondering if Jason had been telling the truth. In her heart, she knew he was. Maceo had been a different person before her. At least, that's what she told herself. How long would it be before he grew tired of her and strayed? Ori felt her eyes fill with tears, and not wanting to disturb him, she got up and went down to the kitchen to cry silently. As she cried herself out, she felt a hand on her hair smoothing. She knew immediately it was Alex. She looked up at him through her tears. Maceo and Viola, she said simply, and he nodded. Yes. I hoped you wouldn't find out. How long have you known? Since before she died. She told me herself. We talked. I forgave her. But you never told Maceo. He shook his head. No. I know what Maceo must have felt, the tremendous guilt he must have been carrying around. It was a mistake, a one-time thing, not an affair. He sighed and pulled up a chair, sitting down, taking her hands. There is a difference between a one-time thing and a full-blown affair, Ori, and I know that. I was not always faithful either. I have not been faithful to her memory. His gaze locked onto hers, and she shivered with the intensity of it. You must know how I feel about you. But I would never act on it while you were happy with Maceo. Are you happy with Maceo? She opened her mouth to tell him yes, 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 I love Maceo more than my own life, but the words choked in her throat. He bent then and kissed her on the mouth softly and smiled as he drew back. Maceo is a fool if he doesn't hang on to you. He kissed her again, and she felt herself respond, returning the kiss. She pulled away after a second, stunned at her body's response. Alex cupped her face in his hands. I'll see you in the morning. And he was gone, walking down the dimly lit corridor. She stared after him, her mind in turmoil. What was that? Ori went to the bathroom to brush her teeth. She stared at her reflection in the mirror. She looked lost, she thought, lost and frightened. She got back into bed and turned on her side, away from the sleeping Maceo. She stared at the darkness outside the window, until her eyes grew heavy and she let herself sink into sleep. Kate and Lysander had not seen each other since the day Nikos had almost caught them kissing. Kate and Nikos had talked and talked, but both of them realized this was the end. Kate moved out of the apartment and was staying on a friend's couch, and now she was apartment hunting. By the third apartment, Kate's spirits had begun to lift. A new life, she thought, and remembered when she last said those words. The day she met Lysander. Could that really have been less than forever ago? She smiled at the realtor, Mindy, who was looking at her expectantly. Well? The apartment was a one-bed, one-bath, small, but the large windows and view over the city more than made up for it. Even better, Kate thought, were the inbuilt bookcases that stretched from floor to ceiling. She could see herself curled up on the couch with a book, maybe a dog curled up in her lap. The thought of it made her excited. Yes. This one is just perfect, I mean a little small but hey it's just me. What's the situation with the seller? He bought it to rent out, did that for a few years, and then just wanted to get rid of it. Everything is included, all the furniture, it's a tad worn but usable. You could move straight in, and as there's no forward chain, escrow shouldn't be difficult. Kate nodded. I do love it, the openness of it. The kitchen and living room are a nice space. She could feel Mindy watching her and grinned. Min, just ask the question you've been holding in all day. Mindy laughed. All right. A few weeks ago, you told me there was no way you could live anywhere but with Nikos. What changed? Kate didn't answer for a beat, then sighed. A lot of stuff has happened. A lot. I don't really want to go into it, but let's just say I needed some distance, some independence. Mindy nodded sympathetically. I get it. And your friend? The tall guy, Lysander, was it? Kate, rather indiscreetly, had told Mindy about Lysander. Kate didn't meet her gaze. He's just a friend. Whatever you say. She gave Kate a cheeky grin. It faded when she saw the unease in her friend's eyes. 
Hey, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to pry. Kate shook her head. It's complicated. Just some stuff I have to sort out. She smiled at Mindy. I'd like to make an offer. Mindy indicated the table. Sit down with me and we'll go through the figures. Kate pulled out a chair and sat down. As Mindy chatted and calculated, Kate realized she was glad she was here in her own place, well, hopefully her own place. She went back to her office. Despite it being a Saturday, she wanted to catch up on work. Also, her friend whose couch she was sleeping on could probably do with some alone time with her partner. She'd been there for a couple of hours when her phone rang. Hey Kate. It's me. Her heart began to thump wildly. Lysander. Where are you? Outside your office. I saw the light on, may I join you? Kate looked out of the window and saw it was dark already. I'll come down and unlock the door. When she saw him, her mouth went dry. Had he gotten more gorgeous since she saw him last? How was that possible? She unlocked the door and he stepped inside. It had been raining and he was dripping wet. Kate suddenly grinned. Are we in a cheesy movie right now? Lysander threw back his head and laughed. Well in that case. He took her in his arms and kissed her so tenderly that her head swam. When she finally broke away, breathless, she grinned up at him. And hello to you too. Sorry, I've been waiting weeks to do that. He cupped her face in his hands. Was it okay to do that? She smiled. It was. Let me get my stuff and we can get out of here. Alex Milland was drunk. Ori was kind of shocked when he lurched into the living room and slumped down into a chair opposite them. Maceo and Ori exchanged a glance. Are you okay? Alex looked up at her. Viola? Oh gosh, he was really out of it. No, sweetie, it's Ori, remember? She got up to go to him, sat on the arm of his chair. Did you have a drink? Alex sighed and rubbed his hand over his eyes. Viola, why must you make me this crazy all of the time? Alex, it's Ori, not? What Alex did next shocked them all. He grabbed Ori and wrestled her to the floor, cursing and shouting in her face. Maceo dragged him off of her, roaring his fury at his friend, dragging him out of the room. Ori was shocked to the core, unhurt but badly shaken. She remembered what Jason had said about the bruises on Viola. Ori felt sick. She got to her feet and followed the two men out. She could hear the upstairs shower running and Maceo talking angrily to his friend. She hovered in the doorway of her bedroom as she saw Maceo carrying a dripping wet Alex into his bedroom. A few moments later, Maceo reappeared. He's asleep. He pulled Ori into the bedroom and hugged her tightly. She felt him trembling. I'm so sorry, he whispered, and she tightened her arms around him. I know Alex is hurting, but... I've never seen him so. It's okay. Gosh, everything is so fucked up right now. She couldn't finish and held her hand to her mouth. Maceo held her tightly. It's okay, Mio Caro. She nodded, feeling safer with his arms around her. I have just one question. Right here, right now, Maceo, just tell me. Do you think Alex is capable of hurting someone? I don't know what to tell you. His eyes were hurt deeply, and Ori could feel her chest quiver. Sadness. Fear. He's my brother, Ori. I know, and I wouldn't ask but... She let out a shaky breath before meeting his gaze. I know about you and Viola. Maceo's expression changed. Devastation. Guilt. He nodded. Yes. It did happen. Just once, and we both regretted it afterward. I think Viola told him. I think so too. He pulled in a couple of painful breaths. I'm so sorry I never told you, Ori. It was something I was and am deeply ashamed of. I broke the code and... Alex kissed me. Silence. When? A few nights ago. The day I found out about you and Viola. We were talking about it, and it just happened. 
When finally she looked back at him, his eyes were kind. He pulled her into his arms. It's okay, Ori, really. You got caught up in this bullshit, and I'm sorry. I know. I know. I don't suppose you can vouch for him on the day she died. Maceo shook his head. I don't want to think that he would wish you any harm because of something I did, my darling. She leaned into his touch, as he cupped her face in his hand she grabbed it and kissed his palm. If Alex does have anything to do with it, and I don't want to believe he does, then he needs help. Will you please tell me anything, and I mean anything, before you do it? I know that's a lot to ask. He leaned over and kissed her. No, it isn't, Ori. Of course I will, of course. Her eyes were stinging, and as she closed them, tears dropped down her face. He kissed them away. She was still for a moment, then pulled away, stood, and offered him her hand. Maceo, with a confused smile, took it, and she led him to the bed. She turned to him, her face etched with grief and hopelessness. Make the world go away, Maceo. And she pulled him down onto the bed. They went to his hotel suite, and Lysander offered her a drink, but Kate slowly shook her head. Let's not pretend we're here for idle chit-chat, she said with a slow smile. She put her hands on his chest and stood on her toes to kiss him. Lysander swept his arm under her buttocks and lifted her into his arms, his mouth seeking hers hungrily. They didn't make it to the bedroom. Kate snuggled into his chest. I missed you. I'm sorry things ended with Nico's, but the moment I met you, Lysander Duarte, I knew you were different. Gosh, that sounds so hokey. Hokey works. I like hokey. She felt his laugh rumble through his chest. Alex had apologized and apologized, but Ori wanted out of that house. She and Maceo flew back to Italy the next day, and never had she felt so relieved to be back home. Their apartment seemed like a stranger, but when they returned to a celebratory gallery, Ori knew she was home. Lucia gave her a hug that seemed to go on forever. I've missed you so much. Me too, honey, me too. But we're home now. We're home. That's not a good face. Kate walked out of Lysander's bathroom wearing nothing but his t-shirt. He looked up from his laptop and smiled wearily. She kissed him. Good morning. He slid his hands around her waist, pulling her to him. Morning. He sighed as she hugged him back fiercely. You okay, dude? She felt him nod. There's been another one. The website. Another photo? He nodded again. She sighed and pulled him over to the couch. Is it Ori or Shiloh? She stroked his face and gave him a rallying smile. He hesitated, then shook his head. Let's not talk about it. He let her hold him then, there on his couch, the morning sun casting warmth across the whole room. Like Kate does, he thought. Here now, in her arms, he felt like he would be happy to never move again. To hell with work, to hell with his civic duty he just wanted to lie in Kate Garcia's arms and sleep, eat, make love and laugh. He couldn't remember when he'd last felt joy before Kate inveigled herself into his life. She made him laugh, and for that moment he would forget everything. Sometimes it follows you. Kate frowned and made him look at her. What? What do you mean by that? He looked up at her, her dark eyes curious, confused, her caramel hair falling around her face. He wanted to tell her about the connection to Ori, the coinciding dates, his fears about Alex's preoccupation with Ori. He sat up and gave her a smile. Nothing. Don't worry about it, Kate. What time do you have to be at work? She pulled his face to hers. Not until much, much later. Lysander wrapped his arms around her, burying his face in her hair, deciding that now, right now, was not the time to tell her that the new photograph on the killer's website was of Kate. Underneath it was one word, midnight. In their absence, the staff at Maceo's gallery had been working long hours, and to thank them, he threw a party. Ori was glad to have something positive to focus on. The only downside was that Alex was coming for the party along with Lysander and Kate Garcia. She and Alex hadn't spoken since the day they left his home in Vermont, 
although she knew Maceo had talked to him. There had been an hour-long telephone call where the two men had talked everything out, both of them apologizing for the way they had behaved. Maceo told her afterward that he hoped that his and Alex's friendship could be mended. Ori replied that she hoped so too, but it didn't detract from the fact that she couldn't help be wary of the other man. She avoided him at the party, but when she thought she had gotten away with it, he came to find her. She was hiding out in the little tea room at the corner of the office upstairs, exhausted and drained. Hey you! She looked up and saw Alex smiling at her. Her heart sank. Hey, I was just taking a break. I'll be down in a sec. But he didn't leave. He pulled up a chair next to hers. Ori he sat back, her arms crossing defensively without her even noticing. Alex saw the movement. Ori, I don't know how else to tell you I'm sorry about what happened. I think if you asked around, people Maceo would tell you it was out of character for me. Please forgive me. She tried to smile. Already forgiven, Alex, truly. There was an awkward silence. Alex sighed. And I'm sorry for kissing you that night. That was unconscionable. Don't worry about it. Another silence, then Alex got up. I'll leave you alone. Thanks. She watched him walk down the stairs and felt both guilty and relieved. Everything Jason Meeks said was now coloring her every interaction with one of Maceo's best friends. Gosh. After that day, she had told Jason that she didn't want to see him anymore, and he had acquiesced more easily than she'd expected. Gosh. She would be glad when this party this week was over. She and Maceo had plans to drive down to Florence on Friday, a long weekend in a private villa in the middle of Tuscany. Utter bliss. They hadn't been truly alone for what seemed like months. Not even their security was coming with them. Maceo had promised no one would even know where they were. Incognito, he said wickedly. And while we're there, we should talk about when you'll allow me to make you my wife. She'd almost forgotten his proposal during the last few weeks, but now she smiled to herself. Yes. She couldn't wait to be his wife. Even with the revelations about Viola, she trusted this man of hers beyond reason, she chuckled to herself. If there was one thing she was sure of, it was that Maceo loved her without limits. She went to find him now, and saw him out on the balcony talking to Cassie, one of his assistants. Drawing near, Ori realized they were arguing. Cassie was looking upset, and Maceo was gesturing, his expression animated and fierce. Ori stayed back as she watched them, then suddenly Cassie stalked back into the room and passed Ori without glancing at her. Maceo was on the balcony still, taking deep breaths in. Ori went silently to his side and put her hand on his shoulder. What's wrong, baby? Maceo, still trying to calm himself, slid his arms around her, burying his face in her neck. Ori held him, but had the feeling he was trying to hide something. Maceo, she said softly, whatever you need to tell me, it's okay. She steeled herself. If you've been having an affair with Cassie or... Maceo looked up sharply. Is that what you think of me now? Is every woman I speak to going to be someone I've done or am doing? Ori recoiled, and Maceo held his hands up. I'm sorry, Mio Caro. I didn't mean that. Please forgive me. I just fired Cassie. Alex told me she was the one who told him about Viola and myself. How she knew I do not know, and she wouldn't tell me. I offered her the chance to come clean, but she clammed up. So she's gone. Ori. He took her in his arms again. I swear to you, on my life, Cassie is neither an ex nor current lover. You are the only one for me. Do you believe me? She nodded, her eyes still wary. Maceo pressed his lips gently to hers. Then I think we should use this party to announce our engagement. Tell the world. Make a declaration. Ori thought it was a terrible idea, but she could see Maceo needed to prove himself to her. He didn't need to. She believed him entirely when it came to Cassie. She would seek out the woman herself and get the truth out of her. 
She owed Maceo that much. Their friends rallied around them as Maceo made the announcement, and at least she got to see her Maceo again, cheerful, happy, the showman. Ti amo, she whispered in his ear, and his smile made her heart soar. Ti amero per sempre, he said simply. I will love you forever. Friday came around, and Ori felt her heart lift as they caught a water taxi out to where Maceo's lotus was parked. When they drove out of the city, they held hands, and both of them felt a lightning of the spirit. Maceo told Ori as much as he knew about Florence and Tuscany, and Ori listened to the passionate Italian as he described the beauty of his homeland. Oh how I love you, she thought, her hand tangling in his dark curls. They stopped along the way at a small roadside tavern, and Ori was delighted at spending time with Maceo, truly alone with him. They were relaxed and happy and joking around. As they walked back to the car, Maceo whispered in her ear. Think we should stop in some olive grove along the way? Ori grinned at him. And why's that, she retorted, feigning innocence. Maceo laughed. I think you know. It was twilight when they stopped at a gas station. Waving hello at the gas station owner, Ori waited in the car as Maceo filled the car and went to pay. Her phone buzzed, and she was looking down at it as the driver's door opened. Hey, all set. No answer, and expecting Maceo, she was shocked when she looked up into the face of a stranger. Not the face, but a black mask pulled down. Ori had no time to yell. Her attacker clamped his hand over her face and with his other hand tore her t-shirt open. Ori, beyond terror now, watched in disbelief as he placed the tip of the knife against her navel, and for a second she thought he was just going to threaten her again. That he was here just to scare her. Terrorize her. He removed his hand from her mouth. Please, she whispered. Don't. The moment he drove the blade into her, all the way to the hilt, she knew she was wrong. The steel sliced through her belly as if it were butter, and as he stabbed her over and over, she wondered how she could ever have been so stupid to think she was ever safe. Maceo, my love, my life. As her attacker finally let her be, Ori felt her body betray her, her head slumping against the cold window, her hand clamped over her torn belly, trying to stem the blood gushing from her wounds and knowing that she would not survive this. Why? Barely a whisper. Her attacker pulled his mask up enough to reveal his lips, and kissed her as she bled to death. Because, this is how I show my love, Orianthi, he whispered. Ori barely felt it when he stabbed her twice more, and then left her to die. Maceo was chatting to the gas station owner and his wife as he paid for the gas. He was still smiling when he walked out to the car and got in. Great people, great. He looked over at his love, and for a second could not comprehend what he was seeing. Her lovely face was pale, her eyes closed, her breathing ragged and shallow. His eyes dropped, and he saw the torn flesh and the blood, so much blood, and knew in an instant what had happened. The gas station owner would never forget the young man's howl of utter despair and grief. Midnight. He stared at his friend, the friend who was aiming the gun at his chest, and he shook his head. So this is the way it ends. His friend nodded. This is the way it ends. There was a long silence, as if his friend couldn't decide whether to pull the trigger or not. He decided to take the chance to ask the question he so desperately needed the answer to. Then why all this, old friend? She did nothing wrong except love me with her whole heart, and you butchered her. The killer smiled. You don't get it, do you? She was dead the second you touched her. And he pulled the trigger. Now. Maceo Bartoli felt as if his eyelids were glued open. His eyes felt gritty and dry, his entire body felt frozen. The air ambulance that had flown him and Ori to Florence had been a godsend, but he could barely register anything else but the stillness of her. He had never known the meaning of the word desolation until that day. He saw the horrified looks on the face of the paramedics, the look that passed between them that said, we can't save her. They had to pry him away from her so they could try. One of them pressed down hard on her torn belly, 
trying to keep the blood inside her body, he supposed. He felt numb. How? How in the few minutes between him filling the car and going into the gas station to pay had someone stabbed Ori so brutally, so mercilessly? Why hadn't she screamed? The police were kind. He supposed the only reason they hadn't arrested him was that Ori had clearly been okay before he stepped into the gas station. She'd waved happily to the owner. You saved me again, he thought. I would give my own life to save yours, my precious Ori. Please hold on. Please. They had rushed Ori into surgery, promising they'd try, but Maceo knew it was a long shot, that soon the surgeon would come out and tell him that they had done all they could, but she had been too far gone. He got up from the plastic chair he'd slumped into, and walked towards the operating theaters, pushing through the restricted door. A nurse stopped him. Sir, I'm sorry, you're not permitted to be here. Maceo looked at her wildly. She'll die. She's going to die, and I want to be there for her. I don't want her to die alone. I can't, I can't. The nurse, her face full of sympathy, held him as he began to sob. Ori, oh gosh, Ori, please, please, this can't be it, this cannot be the end. Kate Garcia lay under Lysander Duarte, kissing him. Would she ever get enough of this man? They were breathless by the time they had finished, stretched out next to each other, laughing and talking. They had decided to stay in Venice for a few days after Maceo's party. Kate had never been to Italy, and Lysander had set up some meetings for some designers while he was there. Yesterday he dropped her off with Lucia, Maceo's friendly and fun assistant, and the two women had done every tourist spot Lucia could think of. They were sitting in a small trotteria when Lucia smiled at her. I remember doing this with Ori. Gosh, was it really less than a year ago? So much has happened. Kate smiled at her. How long have you two been friends? A long time. Since college. Ori's really lovely. Yes, she is. Lucia smiled, then her smile faded. Considering what she's been through in her life, it's a damn miracle. Kate nodded but said nothing. Lucia shook herself. She speaks very highly of you, too. I know she'd like to get to know you better, especially now that all the crap with Yannick is over. She'll always be grateful. Kate shook her head. I didn't do anything, Maceo was innocent. They sat in companionable silence for a while, then Lucia said in a low voice. Who do you think killed him? Kate sighed. I honestly have no idea, and I think I could care less. Tyson Yannick was scum. Agreed. Lucia scooped the last bit of her gelato into her mouth. I'm heavenly. So how are things with Lysander? Kate flushed red but laughed. Good. Very good. I do feel a little shell-shocked. His world is a lot bigger than mine ever was. Lucia grinned. Yeah, that takes a bit of getting used to even for those of us who aren't romantically involved with one of the Midnight Club. Kate looked at her curiously. You know, I keep asking Lysander about their boys club, but he just keeps saying that they've all grown too old for that nonsense. Ha, huh, Lucia said, raising her eyebrows. That's a new one. I don't think Maceo feels that way. Kate sipped her now almost cold coffee. I'd like to know how they started. I'll tell you what I know but obviously it'll only be from Maceo's point of view, because he's the one I heard it all from. That's okay if you don't mind. Not at all. Well, where to start? Harvard University, 20 years ago. Lysander watched, amused, as his young Italian friend was berated in the middle of the cafeteria by a gorgeous young undergraduate. Lysander would have bet good money that Maceo didn't even remember the girl's name let alone her phone number to call her again. He had never known anyone as blatantly charming or irresponsible as Maceo, but the other man had made his first semester in a new country a lot easier. And definitely more fun. They'd started talking at a bar during Freshers' Week and had hit it off straight away. Maceo's roommate Seth Cantor, a tall, quiet Canadian, had become a good friend too. 
That they shared a birthday was just a weird but cool coincidence according to Maceo, but Lysander, always superstitious, wondered if there was more to it. Hey! Seth poked Lysander on the shoulder, jolting him from his reverie. Is Maceo winning or losing the argument? Lysander chuckled, as they both watched Maceo gesticulating wildly, trying to explain himself to the angry girl. Losing, of course, Lysander said with a laugh. I'm waiting for the slap. As if on cue, the girl cuffed Maceo around the face and darted off in tears. Grinning ruefully, Maceo made his way back to his friends. He shrugged when he saw them laughing. Collateral damage, he said, showing them the bright red palm print on his face. Do you even remember her name? Seth shook his head, laughing. Maceo grabbed a can of soda from Lysander's tray and popped the tab, completely unrepentant. Listen, doesn't everyone come to college to get stoned, educated, and laid? They should know the rules by now. Seth and Lysander exchanged a look. One day, Bartoli, you will meet a woman who will slay you. Utterly slay you. Maceo stole Lysander's apple too and crunched into it. I doubt that day will ever come, my friends. Florence. Now. Maceo felt like he was broken. He thought if he opened his mouth to speak, then all that would come out would be gibberish. The nurse who kept an eye on him in the waiting room was casting worried glances in his direction. It had been hours, and they were still trying to save Ori's life. Every time they came to update him, he steeled himself for the news that Ori was dead. The strain was almost unbearable. She could die. My darling girl could actually die. Are you sure I can't call someone for you? The nurse had a kind, sweet face, and he tried to smile at her. I can't remember any of their numbers. Gosh, he was out of it. The nurse got up and came to sit by him. They will be on your phone, I think. May I look? He handed her his phone disinterestedly, then an idea started to form in his mind. Yes, he said, his voice gruff. You can call four people for me. Ask them to come. Ask them to come together. The nurse was flicking through his contacts. And the names? Maceo smiled without a glimmer of humor. Seth Cantor, Lysander Duarte Benoit Vo. Alex Milland. Venice. Lysander put the phone down and drew in a deep breath. He stood in Maceo's office in the floating city Galleria with a pale, shaken Kate and a tear-stained Lucia. Ori had been stabbed. She was dying. Jesus, he finally said, the word coming out in a rush. Sander? Does Maceo want us to go there? Kate put her hand on his arm. Lysander nodded. Yes, he said to use his private jet, Lucia, can you arrange that for us? He wants us to come together, so we'll have to wait for Benoit, Seth, and Alex. Why does he want to wait for all of us? I don't know, sweetheart. Lucia, who looked like she might pass out any moment, tried to stop the tears from falling, and Lysander put an arm around her shoulder. I knew, Lucia sobbed. I knew one day someone would get to her. I thought with Yannick dead that she'd be safe for a little while. Lysander met Kate's eye. She's in the best place, Lucia. Where was she stabbed? Belly. Multiple times. She lost a lot of blood. Lucia turned and threw up into her trash can. Kate rubbed her back. Oh, sweetie. She looked at Lysander, desperation in her eyes. Sander, what are we going to do? Lysander nodded. We wait for the others. Then we go to Maceo and hope we're not too late. Florence. The surgeon rolled his shoulders and stepped back from the table. That's as much as we can do until she gets stronger. He looked down at the beautiful woman on his operating table, her body the scene of unthinkable violence. Who would do this to you, little one? Will you update the fiancé, Dr. Jolly? Jolly nodded. Let me change my scrubs. He won't want to see her blood all over me. Take her to recovery, please, but be gentle. I don't know if that artery will hold. And if it bursts, then she won't stand a chance. 
Jolly scrubbed out and went to find Maceo Bartoli. The young man looked like a zombie. Mr. Bartoli. Maceo scrambled to his feet, his eyes searching the doctor's face. Dr. Jolly? Please tell me she's okay. Jolly steered Maceo into a seat. Mr. Bartoli, I have stabilized Ms. Roy as best as we can but she's not out of the woods yet. She lost almost half her blood volume, which is normally fatal, but I think the blood loss was slowed by the fact that she was motionless when she was stabbed, and you applied pressure nearly as soon as the incident happened. The medics who came to the scene started the blood bag, so I think that's what saved her. Maceo was listening intently, but when the doctor paused, he stared down at his hands dyed dark red with Ori's blood. He remembered the seconds after he'd realized she'd been stabbed, screaming, screaming for help, his hands automatically pressing down on her belly desperate to keep the precious blood inside her. Her stillness. Doctor, be completely honest. Will she live? I don't know, Mr. Bartoli, and that is the truth. We'll know more in the next few days. Have the police talked to you? Maceo nodded. They say they have CCTV from the gas station and are going through it now. Whoever stabbed Ori must have been following us. The doctor frowned. It wasn't a robbery? Maceo shook his head. No. Someone has been threatening her for months. I promised her I'd protect her and I failed her. The doctor didn't know how to reassure the devastated young man. He patted him awkwardly on the shoulder. I'll come find you when I know more. Can I see her? The doctor hesitated. She's in the ICU at the moment. I'd rather you wait, but if you insist. Maceo nodded. Whatever you think is best for Ori, doctor. Then perhaps you'll forgive me if I ask you to wait for a while at least until we have her settled and she's stabilized. Okay. Thanks, doctor. The doctor nodded and walked slowly back to his office. Why did these cases always get to him? The violence, the cruelty of it all. When he went home that night, he hugged his wife even tighter than usual. She was hovering on the edge of death. Ori knew that and yet she wasn't scared. She could feel people's hands on her body, could feel the excruciating pain of the knife wounds, but everything else was numb. Blood loss, she supposed. I'm dying. She could accept that if it hadn't been for Maceo. His grief had echoed through her unconscious mind, him begging her to live. I will try, my love. She could still recall the lethal blade running her through, the way all the breath in her lungs had been pushed out with the force of the blows. The killer's kiss. She tried to recall that kiss, tried to remember if anything about it was familiar. It was a tender counterpoint to the brutality of his knife. Why? Why would anyone who claimed to love her do that to her? Obsession. A scintilla of an idea floated across her consciousness, but was soon lost in the dark swirls of coma that took over her mind then and sent her spiraling down into the blackness. Benoit and Shiloh were the first to arrive in Venice, shaken and disbelieving, then Seth and lastly Alex and his half-sister Netta. All of them were pale and sickened by what had happened. Lucia arranged for all eight of them to fly to Florence that evening. On the plane, they discussed who should go to the hospital. Lucia was adamant. Ori was my friend, long before any of you met her. There was some anger in her voice, which Lysander, if no one else, understood. He nodded. Of course. Then perhaps Alex and I. Seth and Ben, perhaps you could go tomorrow? Benoit was texting. He showed them his phone. I've been talking to Maceo via text. He wants all four of us at the same time. I've told them Lucia is insisting, and he says that's okay. Seth sighed. Shiloh, Netta, do you mind if we leave you at the hotel? The two women shook their heads. Netta squeezed Seth's hand, we'll be the relief guard, and grinned at him. Seth smiled at her. Thanks, Nets. Two town cars were waiting for them on the runway. Shiloh and Netta got into one, headed for the hotel. The others piled in together to drive to the hospital. They sat in silence as the cab drove through the outskirts of the city. 
A nurse greeted them at the reception. Miss Fernando, you can go straight up to the ICU. Mr. Vo, Mr. Cantor, Mr. Duarte, Mr. Milland, Mr. Bartoli would like to see you alone. Please come with me. The men exchanged glances. What the hell was going on? They followed the nurse up to a conference room. Please wait here for Mr. Bartoli. They were left alone. Benoit frowned at his friends. What is all this? The others just shrugged and a moment later, Maceo came in. His clothes were still bloodstained, his t-shirt covered in dark brown splotches. His eyes were hooded, angry, grief-stricken. Wow. Lysander couldn't help the exclamation. He had never seen his friend so devastated, and yet so wild with anger, that his whole body seemed to vibrate with it. Maceo gripped the back of a chair for support, and seemed to be struggling to speak. How's Ori? Seth said gently. Alive. Just. Maceo's voice was gravelly, rasping from fatigue and despair. She was stabbed eleven times in the belly. They had to remove her spleen and a kidney. Her abdominal artery was damaged, so was her liver. She lost two liters of blood and she's in a coma. She may not make it. He looked up finally, lingering on each of his friend's faces. Eleven times. She survived rape, abuse, being physically and verbally assaulted, and someone decided she hadn't been through enough and stabbed her eleven times. A defenseless woman. I just have one question to ask you all. His face hard, his green eyes burning with fury, he studied the face of each of his oldest friends and asked the question that had been roiling inside of him for the last twenty-four hours. Which one of you tried to murder my beautiful girl? Benoit wrapped his arms around Shiloh's waist as she hugged him and buried his head in her hair. How did it go, darling? Did they let you see Ori? Benoit shook his head. No. We just met with Maceo. He told her about Maceo's anger, his utter conviction that one of them was responsible for stabbing Ori and killing Viola. Shiloh listened with growing horror. He can't mean it, surely? This is the grief talking, the shock? Benoit met her gaze. I don't think so, ma sure. I've never seen Maceo like that before. So angry, so sure. Shiloh was silent for a long time, just holding him. This is a nightmare. Yes. He sighed. And he won't let any of us near Ori except you, Kate, and Netta. But not yet, she's in a too delicate condition. Shiloh stroked his hair. It's not looking good, is it? From what Maceo said, I'm surprised she made it at all. He described what had happened to Ori, and Shiloh looked sickened. Gosh. Shiloh felt nausea rising in her throat. Unconsciously she touched her belly, the bump where their daughter lay sleeping. Benoit, is there any chance, I mean do you think there's any chance one of you could have done it? Benoit's eyes were full of pain when he looked at her. I don't even want to think about that possibility, but if I'm honest, yes. Yes, I think one of us could have. And gosh help me, I think I know who. The doctor finally gave his permission for Maceo to sit with Ori. She had stabilized overnight, but Maceo still had to have his vitals checked to make sure he wasn't carrying a virus before going to see her. There was so much risk of infection. His whole body trembled as he pushed aside the sliding door to her room. Ori, her dark hair spread about the pillow, was pale, her usually golden honey skin yellow and wan. Mio Caro, he whispered to her as he bent over her to kiss her cool cheek. The bleep of the machines reminded him what was keeping her alive, and the pain was intense. Maceo pulled up a chair next to her and stroked her hair. He let out a long breath. Since confronting his friends, the fight had gone out of him. The shock on some of their faces, the agreement on others. He knew who had done this, he was just waiting for him to confess. Viola. Ori. There was only one person in Maceo's mind, one suspect, but he wanted the killer to confess. He had no proof of anything other than that Ori was here, and she might not wake up. He laid his head on the bed and closed his eyes, his fingers interlocked with hers. A memory. The beginning of their relationship, 
the very beginning, that first heavenly weekend of making love, eating good food, wandering around the city. They'd been out in the sun all day, and Ori had offered to cook for him at her apartment so they could enjoy some private time. She'd made a sumptuous duck ale orange for their supper, and afterward they sat together on her tiny balcony, Ori leaning back against his chest, his lips against her temple. Tell me about your friends in this midnight club. Were you all really born on the same day? Maceo smiled. We were. When the other students found out about the weird coincidence, they were ones who gave us that name. We just took it as a badge of honor. Gosh, we were such kids. Ori laughed. So you were the kings of that campus? We thought so then. Well, if I'm fair, it was more me, Lysander, and Benoit who were the sluts and showmen. Alex and Seth were more reserved. Puritans, I used to call them. But really, they were just more mature. They're not from the romance countries of the world, Ori mused. Was it more a cultural thing? Maceo considered. I never thought of it like that. Maybe so. Smart girl. Ori grinned. I have my moments. Who are you closest to out of them? Maceo thought about that. Probably Alex. He laughed softly. He's the one who has the most patience with me. I get a little excitable at times. Ori sat up and turned around to face him. Don't I know it? Maceo grinned and pressed his lips to hers. You can hardly blame me, Mio Caro, when such incentive is before me. His fingers were at the buttons of her dress now, and she watched him slowly undo them, his gaze drifting between her own and the skin he was exposing. Your skin is like honey, he said softly. You're so beautiful, Bella, so lovely. His movements were slow and sensual, and Ori gave herself to him completely. They had no need for words now, the connection between them was so strong and full of trust. He could tell how turned on she was by his dirty talk and smiled. Bella, I love to watch you as I do you. Your lovely face, that blush in your cheeks, the way your mouth opens as you cry out. Ori moaned, and he knew that she was responding not just to himself but to his words. He loved having this power over her, but never before had he himself been so emotionally connected to a woman, to another person. He wanted her, just her, never wanted this night to end. I'm going to be with you until you beg me to stop, il mio dolce ori. My sweet ori. True to his word, he was relentless, taking her in every way he could imagine. Ori telling him that she'd never tried it before, and Maceo schooling her gently as they moved together. Finally, as dawn was breaking over Venice, they held each other and slept, exhausted and sated. Maceo studied the face of the woman he had known he was in love with that same night. If it hadn't been for her paleness, the machinery keeping her alive, he could almost have seen her as he did that night, sleeping peacefully. Except he would never get over the sight of her in his car that night, stabbed, bleeding, dying. The sound of her breath hitching and catching as she struggled to drag oxygen into her lungs. Maceo squeezed his eyes shut and willed the images to go away. What was worse was he imagined the killer stabbing her, her fear, terror, pain. Stop it, he groaned to himself. He couldn't change that. But he could do everything in his power to find out who did this to Ori. He was convinced, utterly sure, that he knew who Ori's would-be killer was. He was sure. Alex. Lysander and Kate had talked all night after Maceo's accusation. He's serious, Lysander said without rancor. So we should take it seriously. Kate nodded. They had ordered room service, and Kate had spent the night writing notes as they tried to figure out who and why. At one point, Kate had written Alex, Seth, and Benoit's names down and pinned them to the wall. Lysander, in a move which shocked her, wrote his own name down and Maceo's and added them. Seeing her expression, he half smiled. We look at all the evidence, Kate. Which means all of us need to be looked at. I know I didn't stab Ori or kill Viola, but we look at everything. For your own peace of mind, if nothing else. Kate smiled, her eyes filling with tears. She touched his face. I know you didn't do this. 
I know it in my bones. But you're right. Let's do this properly. Start with me. Hopefully, counselor, you can rule me out pretty quickly, Lysander grinned, but a few minutes later his smile had faded. The night Ori had been stabbed, he had been with a designer at a small gathering at the designer's studio, but had left and decided to take a stroll through the streets of Venice. He'd gotten lost, and ended up a long way out of the city. Still, there's no way you could have gotten a car, driven all that way just to stab Ori, and then made it back to me. Kate shrugged it off, but Lysander sighed. But you didn't notice I was back until the next morning. Did none of the hotel staff see you come back? Not that I'm aware of. Okay, so that's something to check. The hotel's security cameras would have picked you up and provided a timestamp. What about Viola? When was she killed? September 5th, last year. Where were you? Lysander nodded, sure of himself this time. Paris Fashion Week. Viola was apparently murdered during the daytime in New York. There are myriad photos of me that day in Paris. Kate wrote this down and pinned it under his name. See. We're making progress already. Now when you were in Paris, did you see Benoit? Lysander shook his head. No. Benoit at a fashion show? He was working, but I don't know where. We didn't meet that time. We'd just come back from a boy's trip to Crete, so we didn't bother arranging anything. Boy's trip, Kate scoffed, and he grinned at her. You betcha. Well, Kate stuck her last notes up. That's you. Plus, the whole you have no motive, etc. Who shall we do next? Lysander's brow furrowed. Maceo. It makes me feel nauseous even to consider him, but he'd feel the same as me. Get the whole picture. Kate nodded. Well, we know for sure he didn't stab Ori. Gosh, can you imagine? The gas station's security cameras show him talking to the owner when the masked man attacked Ori. But yeah, he had a fling with Viola. Lysander sighed. Which gives him the motive to keep her quiet. But, like when he was accused of killing Yannick, Maceo just doesn't have it in him. Hey, remember, no hunches, Kate reminded him. Where was Maceo when Viola was killed? I don't know. Okay, so that's another thing to check. There's another theory. Maybe he hired someone to kill Ori? Lysander rubbed his eyes. But why? He adores her. Absolutely worships her. To the point of obsession? Kate wondered, then shook her head. No, if that were the case, he would have stabbed her himself. No, I tend to agree. Maceo would never hurt Ori. But what if someone was seeking revenge on Maceo for Viola? Eye for an eye. Which brings us back to... Alex. They stared at each other, and then Lysander groaned. I don't want to think what I'm thinking. But we're all thinking it, Kate said softly. When you were in that room, when Maceo said what he said, I'm willing to bet you all thought the same thing. Alex has the motive. Is he capable? Do you think he is capable of killing his own fiancé, of trying to murder Ori, the woman who resembles her so much? Lysander stared at her with despairing eyes. God help me. I think he is. In the bar of the hotel, Alex Millen swirled the last of his scotch in the bottom of his glass then drained it. He felt a hand on his shoulder and looked up to see Seth and Netta. His friend and half-sister sat on either side of him. I don't want to talk, Alex said. Alex? Netta's lovely face was creased with worry, but Alex shook his head. Maceo thinks I did it. We all know that's what he meant. He thinks I stabbed Ori, he thinks I killed Viola. He looked at a silent Seth. You think so too? Seth shook his head. No. Alex gave a humorless laugh. Say that like you mean it, brother. He saw Seth and Netta exchange a look. Don't worry, I'm not freaking out. Yet. Just. I know it looks bad and I admit, Viola sleeping with Maceo did upset me. But who wouldn't be? Doesn't mean I killed her. And Ori? Why the hell would I hurt her? 
I am in love with her, Netta finished in a gentle voice, and Alex nodded, looking up at her with desolation in his eyes. I didn't want to be. I don't want to be. When Maceo called and said she'd been stabbed, I thought I would go crazy. Alex, Seth said, his voice quiet and calm. Just answer this. Where were you when Ori was attacked? Alex sighed, rubbing his eyes. In Venice. And no, no one can corroborate that. Hell, I almost wish I was guilty because I feel like I'm responsible. If I had found out who killed my Viola. Netta, tears dripping down her face, wrapped her arms around her brother. I'm so sorry, Alex. Seth put his hand on his friend's shoulder. Maceo will calm down. As soon as Ori comes out of the coma, as soon as she's back with us, he'll see sense. Alex sighed. Seth, what if she doesn't make it? Seth had no answer for him. Later, when they had persuaded Alex to get some sleep, Netta and Seth sat together in Seth's room. Netta was exhausted. She leaned into Seth, who put his arm around her. Seth, how is any of this going to be okay? Seth sighed. I don't know, sweetheart. I think we just have to concentrate on hoping Ori pulls through. Then we can deal with the rest of the crap. Alex is spiraling down, she said, her voice breaking, and Seth hugged her tightly. We'll get him through this, too. He pressed his lips to her temple. He had always been the closest to Netta out of Alex's friends, and she smiled at him gratefully. You are a good guy, Seth Cantor. He rolled his eyes but couldn't help grinning. Shucks. Netta chuckled. Irina is a damn fool for letting you go. Seth's smile faded and he gazed at her. You think? The atmosphere in the room had changed unexpectedly. Netta smiled slowly. I do. I really do. Their eyes locked and Netta leaned in and pressed her lips to his. Seth kissed her back but then pulled away, his eyes amused and wary. Netta, is this a good idea? She smiled, looking up at him through her lashes. I don't know. I just know I want this. The question is, do you? In reply, Seth pulled her into his arms. Netta slid her arms around his broad torso feeling the hard abs beneath his blue shirt, his mouth firm on hers. She got up and offered him her hand, and led him to the bedroom. She pulled the straps of her dress from her shoulders, and let it slither down her body to the floor. She knew she had a great body, athletic and strong, and she saw the desire ignite in Seth's eyes and smiled. Nat, seriously. We should keep this between us for now. Oh, I agree, Netta said, not at all stung. But we should keep it. Seth laughed out loud then. You are insatiable. He rolled her onto her back, shaking his head as he smiled. Where did you come from? Netta's eyes were suddenly serious. Seth, are you really telling me you didn't know I've had a thing for you for years? I really didn't, he admitted ruefully. I wish I had known. She kissed him. Let's not waste any more time then. And they began again where they had left off. New York City, five years previously. The Museum of Modern Art was packed with guests for the charity gala. Alex scanned the room for Maceo and saw him talking to a beautiful woman across the room. Alex grinned to himself. He nudged Seth who was standing by his side. Look. Alex nodded at Maceo and Seth rolled his eyes. Of course. They made their way over to their friend, who grinned widely when he saw them, embracing them both. Alex Seth, allow me to introduce Viola Redman. Viola Seth Cantor, Alex Milland. While Seth was talking to the woman, Maceo nudged Alex. I brought her for you, Alexander. She's 26, a Brown graduate, and a junior partner in a publishing firm. Alex sighed. Maceo was forever trying to fix him up, but he had to admit, Viola Redman was stunning with long dark hair that fell in waves to her shoulders and large brown eyes the color of honey. As Maceo very unsubtly steered Seth away from the couple, Viola smiled at Alex. He's quite a character. He's something all right, muttered Alex darkly, then laughed. Viola really was beautiful, 
her smile gentle, her eyes friendly. He found it easy to talk to her, and before long, he realized he had been chatting with her for nearly an hour. Viola, he said, snagging her another drink from a passing waiter, would you like to have dinner with me later? He took her to the palm, where they had lobster and talked late into the night. Alex was smitten. Viola was funny, erudite, and sweet. She gently ribbed him about his boys' club. There was no question that they'd spend the night together. The moment Alex unzipped her lavender dress and let it fall to the floor of his hotel room, he knew he had met the love of his life. Viola wasn't shy in bed. As he plunged himself into her, she cried out his name, raking her nails down his back, spurring him on. They screwed all night, and in the morning, she'd gone, leaving him a note with her phone number on it. He hadn't waited to call her. Viola moved in with him two weeks later, and everybody, everybody knew they'd be together forever. Until Viola was murdered, and Alex fell apart. Mr. Bartoli. Maceo looked up to see Ori's surgeon smiling at him. Maceo had been gently sent away from Ori while they did some tests on her, and now he was in the small relative's room, cold, exhausted, and drinking some very weak coffee. Mr. Bartoli, why don't we sit? He's going to tell me she's not going to make it. Okay. He steeled himself as they sat. The doctor nodded to him. We think Ori's coming out of the coma. Maceo's heart began to thump hard against his ribs. Really? Oh my gosh, I mean really. The doctor held up his hands. Now this is good news, but she still has a long way to go. It could take a while for her to regain consciousness, and we won't know until she does if she'll suffer any long-term effects. She lost a lot of blood a lot, and if her brain was starved of oxygen, well, we'll just have to see. But this is a step in the right direction. I've checked her abdominal wounds, and I think we're out of the woods as far as the abdominal artery is concerned. She's a fighter. Maceo tears in his eyes nodded, half laughing. Yes, she is. Lucia was waiting outside the relative's room when the doctor left, and she hugged Maceo as tightly as she could when he told her the good news. Oh, thank God, thank God, she kept repeating, and he laughed. I know, I know. Look, let's go sit with her and see if we can coax her awake quicker. Lucia laughed, but when she saw her friend lying so still in the bed, her smile faded. She doesn't look more awake. Maceo stroked the hair back from Ori's face his gaze taking in every detail of his lover's face. Her color is better, he said softly and bent to kiss Ori's cool lips. Come back to me, Mio Amato. Come back to us. Lucia's heart ached for her boss, her friend. At that moment, she knew the depth of his love for Ori, they truly belonged together. She began to cry softly and Maceo, noticing, came to hold her hands. It's not fair, Lucia said through her sobs. She had years of unhappiness and abuse, and now this. Just when you found each other. Maceo wrapped his arms around her. I swear to you, Lucia, she will come through this. I swear it, and when she does, I will give her the best, the happiest life anyone could ever have. Lucia hugged him back. I know you will. I know. Without her, I am nothing, Maceo said in a low voice. Nothing. If the worst should happen? He didn't continue, but he didn't need to. Lucia pushed him away and made him look at her. I never want to hear that from you, Maceo Bartoli. Ori would be furious and heartbroken. She's fighting, I know it, and if she loses, it won't be because she hasn't tried. So don't you give up on her, on me, or on yourself, Maceo. I won't permit it. Her voice was shaking so much he could barely understand her, but the pain in her eyes was unmistakable. Perdona me, Lucia, I'm so so sorry. She let her hold her before wiping away her tears. Ori would kick your ass all the way out of heaven. Maceo smiled, his green eyes tired but soft. Come on. She'd try, but then she'd look at all this hotness and forgive me. He exaggerated a swagger to make her laugh. Gosh, Bartoli, you never change. But she squeezed his shoulder. How about I go track us down some decent coffee? 
Outside, she slid her phone from her purse and called Benoit. I think Maceo's close to cracking up, I really do. I don't know what to do. Benoit listened to her patiently. Lucia, don't worry, we've got this. Lucia sighed. Thank you, Benoit. Listen, she hesitated, it may not be the best idea for. I mean, no offense to him, but. It's okay, Benoit's voice was soft. Alex won't come near the hospital. Thank you, Benoit. I'm so sorry. Maceo, standing at the door to Ori's room, listened as her friend ended the call. He felt conflicted, right now he needed his brothers, his rocks. But after what he'd said to them, he was surprised they were still speaking to him. His rage that day, he still felt it but only towards Alex. He had never been so sure as he was that Alex had done this to Ori. The police had called him in to watch the gas station security footage. Gosh, he would never get those images out of his head. The black-clad masked stranger getting into the car, or a surprise, then shock, the way the man had stabbed her so savagely without mercy. Maceo was grateful for the graininess of the video, that he couldn't see the stabbing in detail, but he saw the blade catch the light as the killer plunged it into Ori's belly again and again, her hands uselessly clawing at him, the man bending over her for a long moment, then leaving her to bleed to death. Oh gosh, Ori. I'm so sorry. He returned to her bedside and sat down, taking her small hand in his, raising it to his lips. Il mio amore, la mia bella amore. He wished he could go to sleep and join Ori wherever she was, hold her, kiss her, just the two of them, in a world without danger or fear. Ori's fingers twitched and Maceo froze. Ori. Nothing. He sighed and placed her hand flat against his cheek, trying to warm it. Her thumb moved, sweeping along his cheek. Maceo's eyes widened as he saw her eyelids flicker. Ori. Mio amore? Her fingers moved, cupping his cheek, and her eyes opened just a little, trying to focus on him. Maceo leapt up, calling for the nurse, but never taking his eyes off Ori's lovely face. Ori. That's it, try to focus on me, oh my love, my love. Netta was stepping out of the shower when Seth knocked on the door. She grinned at him. Why are you knocking? Get in here. Completely uninhibited she went to him, naked, and kissed him. You're smiling. Seth laughed, indicating her still damp body. Any red-blooded man would be, but for once you're not the only reason. Ori's coming out of the coma. Netta felt a rush of relief. Oh thank God, did Maceo call you? Seth nodded. He asked me to call Lysander and Benoit. Not Alex. Netta felt the sting but nodded. Seth studied her, reading her mind. Give him time, Netta. He'll come around. Netta swallowed the lump in her throat and nodded. Does he want us at the hospital? Seth shook his head. No, he doesn't want her overwhelmed with visitors. Lucia's there, of course, and Maceo said she would call when he thought it was a good time. Netta started to wrap a towel around her body, but Seth caught the end of it and pulled it away. I thought we could celebrate, he said with a lazy smile, and Netta laughed. She stood back against the cool tile. Then you had better strip for me, Cantor. Seth pulled his tie down with a flourish, which made her grin. Gosh, his body. As he undid the blue dress shirt he wore, she marveled at the planes of his chest, the firm abs, the slim hips. I love your body, I love the curve of it, the silky feel of it, the taste of it. Seth fisted the root of it. You like this? Oh yes. I like to watch you, I like it when you do that, and look at me just like you are right now. Why did we wait so long to do this? Seth murmured, his lips at her ear, then her neck, then biting down on her shoulder as they screwed. Netta laughed, gasping as he nailed her back against the wall. Hell knows, but let's keep doing it. Alex knocked at his half-sister's door. He'd been to the police, them having asked him to come in and talk to them about the stabbing, and now he just needed to vent to someone. He could hear voices from inside and frowned. Nets? Sis? You in there? After a beat, Netta, wrapped in her robe and definitely looking disheveled, answered the door. 
Hey bro, she said way too casually and Alex's eyes narrowed. What the hell's going on? Netta hesitated, then sighed, opening the door to let him in. Alex stepped into the room, only to rock back when he saw Seth, shirtless, standing at the far end of the room. Seth nodded to him. Alex. Alex stared at him, then Netta. Seth. Well, this is, um? Not at all awkward, seeing as I'm an adult, Netta said firmly. Alex felt an argument brewing inside of him, but suddenly felt exhausted and shrugged. Fine. He sighed and sat down as Seth found his shirt and slipped it back on. Alex looked up at him. Any news from the hospital? Seth and Netta exchanged a glance, then Seth said softly, Ori's coming out of the coma. That's good. That's good news. Netta sat down next to her brother. Alex? Maceo doesn't want me there. That's okay, whatever he needs he gets. Whatever Ori needs. Alex's voice was steady, but Netta could hear the heartbreak in it. Seth touched Netta's shoulder. I'm going to give you two some alone time. Netta nodded and smiled at him. Thanks, Seth. When they were alone, Alex nodded towards the door. How long has that been going on? Just since we came to Italy. It's kind of been brewing for a couple of years, though. Alex smiled at her, his eyes tired. I kind of guessed it might be, but then neither of you seemed to make the first move. Netta stroked his hair away from his temple. I'm sorry about Maceo, Alex. I can't blame him. If the roles were reversed, I would think I was the killer. After all, Viola cheated on me. I have the perfect motive for killing her, and to get revenge on Maceo, what better way than to take away the woman he loves? But I couldn't do it either to Viola or Ori. I don't expect anyone to believe me. I believe you, Netta said, leaning her forehead against his. I always will. Nothing could convince me you're a killer, Alex. Nothing. That helps so much, he said quietly. Thank God for you, because I don't think I have anyone else. New York, 18 months previously. Viola backed away from him. Please, please, you don't have to do this. The terror was overwhelming, as her assailant pointed the crossbow at her. She shivered, forced outside in her underwear by him, she stumbled over the tree roots. I do have to do this, Viola, and you know why. Opening your legs for Maceo? Tramp. Viola shook her head. It was a mistake, please. He fired the crossbow, and the bolt slammed into her belly. She buckled, gasping in agony, her legs giving way as she slumped to the forest floor. He gazed down at her as she struggled to breathe, and bending, he wrenched the crossbow bolt from her and reloaded it. Blood gushed from her wound. He fired the bolt into her stomach, and she vomited blood, her body jerking with the impact. Her lovely dark eyes were wide with fear, pain, and resignation. Why? She managed to whisper, as he pulled the bolt from her body, and prepared to deliver the killer blow. He smiled. Because this is the way I show my love, he said, and shot her again, the bolt burying itself deep into her slim body. Viola shuddered choked on her own blood and then finally was quiet, her eyes open but sightless, her beautiful body blood-soaked and still. He picked her corpse up easily and floated it into the river. The waters were high and fast today, and she floated down, her blood mixing with the fresh water. Florence now. She was waking up. He had failed. Which meant he would have to risk exposure again to ensure her silence. Orianthi Roy would not recover from this, he would make certain. Even if it meant his capture. Even if it meant killing Maceo to get to her, he hoped he wouldn't have to do that, because more than anything, more than anything in the world, he wanted Maceo Bartoli to see the woman he loved die. The doctor shone a light in her eyes, and slowly Ori followed the light. She could hear talking, hear Maceo's deep, silky Italian accent, but she could not quite focus on anything at the moment. Since opening her eyes, there had been a confusing blur of action in front of her that she couldn't make sense of. Someone crying. Machinery bleeping, 
the annoying hiss of whatever the tube down her throat was connected to. She wanted to rip it out, but her entire body felt frozen and numb except for the burning, tormenting pain in her belly. That was the one thing she could remember. The knife. The feel of the steel slicing through her. Someone wanted her dead. Someone had tried to kill her. A tear trickled down her cheek, and she felt Maceo's finger sweep it away. He came closer, and his face came into focus. So beautiful, Ori thought, I love you, I love you. Don't try and do too much, he said, his chocolatey voice sending warm comfort through her. You are doing so well, Mio Caro. Oh, she wanted his lips against hers, made impossible by the tubes. She wanted to curve her aching body into the sanctuary of his, to feel protected and loved. She tried to communicate that much with her eyes, and for a moment she thought he might understand. Instead he turned concerned eyes onto the doctor. I think she's in pain, doctor. A few seconds later, she felt the numbing warmth of morphine flood through her. She wanted to keep her eyes on Maceo's, but felt them closing again. So tired. So tired. The nightmares that came as she slept made the pain worse. Vivid, blood-drenched nightmares of being murdered over and over by the people she loved. Slashing knives torn skin pain above all else pain. When she woke, her whole body was drenched in sweat, and despite the tube in her throat she was screaming. Another sedative. In the morning, she awoke to the sunshine and to fresh air. The tube had gone. She almost wanted to sob with relief. She made her eyes focus on Maceo. His head was lying on the bed by her right hand, and she slid her fingers into his dark curls, feeling the soft hair on her skin so warm, so familiar. Maceo opened his green eyes and looked at her and smiled. Good morning, my love. He sat up, bringing her hand to his lips. She tried to speak, but her throat was tinder dry. Seeing this, Maceo sat up, pouring her a glass of water and helping her sip some through a straw. When she had drunk enough, she pulled away but kept her gaze locked on his. Kiss me, she croaked and smiling, tears dripping down his face, Maceo pressed his lips gently to hers. The soothing warmth of his mouth against hers was better than any morphine. Ori gave a soft moan, not wanting him to stop, and Maceo, chuckling, brushed his lips across her cheek, her forehead, her throat, kissing each of her eyelids. Ti amo, ti amo, ti amo, he murmured, and Ori leaned into him, wincing at the pain but wanting to be in his arms. Maceo wrapped his arms around her, cradling her head in his hands. Thank you for coming back to me, he said, his voice breaking. Thank you. Thank you. Lucia, exhausted and ready to go back to the hotel after such an emotional day, was walking out of the entrance when she saw her and stopped. Cassie. The blonde woman stopped, and Lucia was shocked to see how thin she had gotten. Cassie came over to her. Thank God, Lucia. I only just found out what happened. Lucia regarded her former friend coolly. It was all over the news, Cassie. Cassie looked uncomfortable. I've been away, Lucia. I came as soon as I heard. Lucia sighed. You should have stayed home. Maceo is not in the right headspace to deal with you, Cassie. Cassie flinched. Does that mean? I mean, is Ori? Ori is recovering, Lucia didn't care if she bit Cassie's head off. She was reviled by the hope in Cassie's eyes that Ori had died. Cassie obviously realized how she had sounded. I'm sorry, I didn't mean. You meant that maybe, in his grief, Maceo would finally lean on you and see you, finally. Lucia's hurt and anger had finally found a place to vent itself. That he would come to rely on you, and maybe in a few months, you could finally get him into your bed, Cassie, is that it? Well, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but Maceo's fiancé, the love of his life and my best friend is going to be okay. Ori's a survivor, she always has been, always will be, and she's worth a million of a sly skank like you. Cassie, her face pale, tried to push past her, but Lucia blocked her. You are not going into that hospital, she growled at her. You can't stop me, Cassie griped, then gasped as Lucia grabbed her and propelled her back towards the street. Do you really want to cross me right now, you revolting little sneak? Lucia was wild with anger. 
Do you know what Maceo would do if he saw you? Stay away, Cassie. Your worthless ass is not wanted around here. Lucia turned on her heel and stalked back into the hospital, leaving Cassie to stare open-mouthed at her retreating form. Shocked, angry, and humiliated, Cassie pulled her phone from her purse and dialed. Hearing his voice on the other end of the phone, she cursed softly. And hello to you, too. I can't get into the hospital, she said. That freaking bitch Lucia is blocking me. He sighed. That's unfortunate. Cassie grunted. Look, you've gotten to her before. You'll figure out a way to kill Orianthi Roy, right? Isn't that what you wanted? Of course. And yes, I will figure out a way to kill her, but you disappoint me, Cassandra. I thought you had more about you than to be bullied into retreat. You don't know what that bitch Lucia can be like. Look, I want out of this. If anything happens to Ori now, Lucia will look at me for sure. He was silent. Then finally, if that's what you want. But listen, I've been too hard on you. At least let me buy you dinner tonight to say thank you for trying. Cassie smiled. That's more like it. I'll send a car at eight. Cassie clicked off her phone and squinted up at the lighted windows of the hospital. Enjoy the time you have left with her, Maceo. Ori will be dead before the week is out. I'm sure of it. Smirking, she turned and skipped down the steps, hailing a cab to drive her back to her hotel. Kate was scribbling notes down as she tried to make times and dates fit the movements of the Midnight Club, but frustrated she threw her pad across the room, barely missing Lysander who came into the room just then. He grinned at her. Problems? Kate sighed. I give up. I might be a lawyer, but I'd be a useless detective. He helped her up off the floor and took her in his arms. Then let's leave the detecting to them, and let's do something we know we're good at. He began to kiss her, and she sank into the embrace, feeling his fingers slide under her t-shirt and lift it over her head. He bent his head to take her bosom into his mouth, and Kate closed her eyes and enjoyed the sensations he sent shivering up and down her body. As they tumbled down and began to strip each other, Kate wondered how she had ever thought that life before Lysander had been exciting. They made love until the sun set, and Kate was just falling asleep when she felt Lysander get out of bed. She grumbled but he laughed softly. I just have a couple of errands to do and I'll be back impatient girl. Get some sleep. She was already asleep by the time he left the suite. Tired from the testing her surgeon had put her through, Ori was finally glad to be alone with Maceo, despite barely being able to keep her eyes open. Maceo smiled as she mumbled to him. You know you're making no sense now, Mio Caro, he said fondly as he stroked the hair back from her face. Ori just gazed at him, drinking in every detail of his handsome face, the green eyes, the half-moon-shaped scar on his right eye, the beautifully shaped lips. I love you so much, she mumbled, and he grinned, brushing his lips against hers. As I love you, Bella. Her mouth curved up into a smile against his. I want to marry you, Maceo. I really want to be your wife, right now, this minute. He chuckled. Mio Caro, as far I am concerned, we can get married any time you want. I would marry you yesterday if I could. But surely you want to wait until you're out of here. Ori shook her head. No. I don't want to wait, Maceo. I'm tired of being made to wait. Maceo kissed her. Then I will make the arrangements, my darling. Just promise me one thing. Anything. He grinned. That when you're recovered, we'll marry again, in front of all our friends and family, that I'll be able to show you off to the world, tell them how proud I am to be your husband. Ori smiled. Maceo Bartoli, how do you always manage to say the right thing? Of course, of course. Maceo kissed her again. I can't wait, Mio Amore. When Ori had fallen asleep, Maceo went to find some coffee and found Lucia waiting outside. He looked at her in surprise. I thought you had gone home hours ago, Lucia. Lucia, tired and edgy, shook her head. I was on my way out, and I ran into Cassie. Maceo rocked back. 
Cassie, what the hell is she doing in Florence? Lucia gave him a grim smile. She came to see if Ori was dead yet. Maceo winced, shaking his head. Gosh. I'm sorry to put it so harshly, but there it is. I told her to stay away from the hospital, from Ori, from you. I hope I didn't overstep. Not at all. Thank you, Lucia. The last thing we need is Cassie. I just don't understand her thinking. That bitch has always had a thing for you, Maceo. She couldn't stand that you never made a move on her. Even when Ori was friendly with her, I knew Cassie was faking. Ah, Lucia almost spat then rubbed her eyes. Anyway, I thought I'd better both tell you and make sure she didn't sneak in. Maceo smiled at her. I'm going to put you in a cab now, he said gently. Thank you for being Ori's bodyguard, but you need sleep. So do you. Have you slept at all this last week? Better since Ori woke up, but not a lot. I'll catch up when she's better. Lucia pursed her lips but said nothing. She hugged Maceo goodbye before hopping in the waiting cab. Maceo drew in a deep lungful of night air and sighed. Cassie. Damn it. Why couldn't the rest of the world leave him and Ori alone? Just for one day. Doesn't work that way, Maceo. Yeah, I know, he muttered to himself. Inside, he found coffee and went to sit with Ori again, before pulling out his phone. As he gazed at his love sleeping peacefully, he smiled, and when Lysander answered his call he began to speak, to ask Lysander for help. Alex found Netta at breakfast, and told her that he planned to fly back to America. I've talked to the police, they're not asking me to stay in Italy. I can't be here, Netta, knowing what Maceo thinks of me, what he thinks I've done. I just can't bear it. Netta nodded sadly. I know, Alex, and I don't blame you. For what it's worth, none of the others think you did it either. Even to her own ears she sounded fake, and Alex tried to smile at her. I don't blame them, Nets. I just can't face them anymore. Netta was sad that he seemed to have given up, and said as much to Seth later. Seth sighed. I don't know what to say, Netta, he said softly. I think he should stay, but he's a free man. So, you think he did it? He took her in his arms, cupping her face in his big hand. I don't want to think that, but I can't honestly think who else it could be. Netta sighed and leaned against him. I can't bear it, Seth. I know. Seth told Maceo that Alex was going back to America, and was surprised when Maceo took it so well. Good, his Italian friend said abruptly, I want him a million miles away from Ori. How is she? Maceo's expression softened. She's perfect. The doctor says she's improving, although he has warned us not to rush things. She's still sick, very sick and exhausted. I think what with everything else that's happened as well as being stabbed, she's finally feeling everything. AJ's death, Yannick's abuse, it's all hit her. Seth hesitated, then smiled. Maceo, may I go visit with her? I know that out of all of us, I know her the least, but I would like to get to know her better. Maybe I could be your relief. You look like you could do with a good meal and a long sleep. I'd be happy to sit with her. Maceo nodded gratefully. I'd like that, Seth. I won't need long, just a couple of hours maybe. Ori was happy that Maceo was going to get some much-needed rest. Baby, take as long as you need, I'll be fine here with Seth. When Maceo had at last been persuaded to leave, Seth grinned at her. I hope you don't mind me offering to sit with you. Not at all. Maceo is about ready to drop, but he wouldn't leave me alone. Ori smiled at the thought of her lover. He's very protective. As he should be, Seth's smile faded. I'm so sorry this happened to you, Ori. Ori flushed. Thank you. But hey, I'm still here and, she said grinning at him, it'll be nice to spend some time with you. They chatted easily. Ori found Seth to be erudite and charming underneath his shyness, and they were soon laughing and ribbing each other gently. Maceo tells me you had a long-term girlfriend? Seth nodded. Irina. 
Yeah, that ended a few months ago after she cheated on me. Ori looked alarmed. Please tell me she didn't cheat with Maceo? Seth half smiled. No, it wasn't Maceo or anyone I know. She was very open and apologetic, but the trust had gone and the relationship just sort of petered out. I'm sorry. Seth smiled. Don't be. I think it may have been for the best, I really do. And besides, now that Netter and I... What? Ori interrupted him, her eyes wide with excitement and Seth couldn't help but laugh. Yeah, it's new, very new, but we've been friends forever and it just kind of happened. Ori grabbed his hand and squeezed. I'm so glad, Seth, I really am. Thanks. Look, can I get you anything? I'm just going to grab some water. I'm fine, thanks. Ori lay back as Seth left the room. Netta and Seth. Such an unlikely matchup. Netta's bohemian sensibilities with Seth's practicality. Ori couldn't imagine it. But she did think that, after Maceo, Seth was the hottest of the Midnight Club. His tall broad frame taller than even Maceo and Alex, his Roman god face, his kind hazel eyes. She liked him immensely. You chose the best companion for me, Maceo, she thought to herself. She closed her eyes, feeling tired suddenly, but her head seemed to whirl and she felt sick. What the hell? Her chest began to tighten and she suddenly found it hard to breathe. Jesus, she fumbled for the call button and pressed it, only to find it had come loose from the wall and wasn't connected. Damn it. She pushed the sheets aside to try and swing her legs over the side and saw the blood. Lots of it. Oh gosh, no, she tried to call out but her vision grew hazy. Please help me. She shifted to try and move but her legs gave way beneath her and she slumped to the floor. She could smell blood, her blood, and then she couldn't breathe and everything was going dark. Maceo woke when his cell phone buzzed. Seth. Maceo. Ori's relapsed. Man, you better come back, they've taken her back into surgery. Gosh, I'm so sorry Maceo, but it doesn't look good. Maceo heard the words, massive internal blood loss, but he was numb inside. The surgeon had updated him, as they struggled to save Ori's life, and when finally they had done all they could, the surgeon told him that now they would just have to wait. I'm not going to lie to you, Mr. Bartoli, her chances of recovery are small. Seth had been beside himself with guilt, but Maceo reassured him. None of us could have known. Ori herself didn't know. All Maceo could do was sit and wait and hope. He felt useless, hopeless. All of his wealth, his influence, couldn't heal Ori. He thought about finding the best surgeon in the world, but Seth had told him the surgeon here had done everything anyone could do. Please don't leave me, Miyokaro, he said to her now, bending to kiss her cheek. I cannot live without you. Maceo closed his eyes. If Ori died, he would spend the rest of his life hunting down the man who did this to her. Alex. Maceo gritted his teeth. It was a good thing Alex had decided to go back to America, he thought, because the way Maceo was feeling right now, he would have gladly ripped the other man apart with his bare hands. Run, Maceo thought. Run, Alex. Because when this is all over, I will find you. I'm going with Alex, Seth. I think he needs me. Netta waited for Seth's reaction. Seth sighed but nodded. I think it's probably for the best. For now. Which is not to say I won't miss you, but you need to be with your brother. Netta smiled at him gratefully. Thank you, darling. Look, this has all happened so quickly and I want to explore us more, but I think we may have to put things on hold for a while. He took her in his arms. You're right. It will be nice to have time for us, just us, but now isn't the time. When are you flying? In the morning, so we still have all night. Seth slid his hand under her t-shirt and stroked her belly. All night, hum, what shall we do? Netta grinned as he began to strip her, then dropped to his knees to bury his face in her belly. She stroked his dark hair. You're very easy to fall for, Mr. Cantor. He grinned up at her, then pressed his face into her. Oh gosh, Seth, yes, yes. His hands pinned hers to the wall. 
Netta shivered with pleasure, kissing him hungrily. Gosh, how am I supposed to leave you here after that? Seth laughed. It won't be a long separation, I promise, Netta. We'll be together soon. Despite the setback and her fragile condition, the doctors were pleased that Ori hadn't slipped back into a coma. Twenty-four hours after her emergency surgery, she opened her eyes and stared up at the darkened room. She heard Maceo's breathing steady and regular. He was asleep, and Ori decided to let him rest. He looked exhausted, dark circles under his eyes, his skin wan. She sighed, pressing the little button to release morphine into her system. She was getting way too used to it, and decided that as soon as she could bear it, she'd stop using it. Easier said than done, she thought now, as pain screeched through her body. She had no idea what had happened to her, but she presumed it had been a bleed, obviously. There were new dressings on her wounds, and even a new sight just above her navel. Maybe they'd had to open her up. Damn. She was so tired of feeling like this, so sick, so vulnerable and useless. She wanted to go out into the world, be with Maceo, enjoy their life, but at every turn something or someone stymied them. Was this the price she had to pay for finding happiness with him? She turned her head so she could gaze at his sleeping form. I could not imagine my life without you. But she felt depressed, run down and dirty from spending so much time in bed. Her skin still felt sticky with blood even though she knew she had been cleaned up. Her thoughts went back to the night of the stabbing. It had been so quick, so brutal, so cruel. Her would-be killer, kissing her. This is how I show my love. It was all so fucked up. She could still feel every inch of the steel slicing through her body, ripping her apart. Feral. Ferocious. She felt sick and pressed the call button, hoping it wouldn't wake Maceo. The nurse came in and asked her if she needed anything. I feel like I might throw up, Ori whispered, but I'm scared of ripping my stitches. I'll get you an antiemetic, honey. Just take some slow deep breaths. Maceo lifted his head as the nurse left the room, and Ori smiled ruefully at him. I'm sorry I woke you, baby. Maceo rubbed his eyes, looking like a lost little boy. Ori hid a grin. It's okay, Mio Caro, I'd rather be awake. Are you okay? Just a little nauseous. I sometimes have that effect. Ori laughed softly. Never. Maceo laced his fingers with hers. How are you feeling, Bella? She stroked his cheek as the nurse came back in. I'm okay. She gave a soft laugh. I'm sick of being asked that, and I bet you're sick of asking it. Maceo grinned at her. Then let's make a deal. I won't ask if you promise to tell me the second you don't feel good. Deal. Ori winced as the nurse injected her, but the relief was almost instantaneous. She relaxed back against her pillows. Do you want a sedative? The nurse, a middle-aged woman with thick black hair pulled up into a bun, smiled down at her, but Ori shook her head. No thanks. I think I'm tired enough to sleep for a year. He might need one though, she grinned and nodded at Maceo. I think he's trying to set a record for staying awake. Maceo shook his head, laughing. I'm good thanks. The nurse chuckled and left them alone. Maceo shifted his chair so he could sit closer to Ori. Listen, I was thinking, when you're a little stronger, we should move you to a private facility in Venice. Be closer to home. Agreed. Not that Florence isn't beautiful. What little I've seen of it, she said in a wry voice, gesturing out of the window, and Maceo laughed. I promise I'll bring you back when you're ready. Ori sighed. Going home does sound good. He stroked her hair. It does. But please, Mio Caro, don't push yourself. I won't. Say, is Seth okay? He called me earlier and kept apologizing for leaving me alone that time. Geez, he only went for some water. It wasn't his fault. Maceo nodded. He feels guilty. I've tried to persuade him otherwise, but he's very fond of you which reminds me two things. One, 
Shiloh says unless she sees you before she and Benoit go back to Paris she'll beat my sorry ass, her words. They both laughed. I want to see her. No problem. And the other thing. His smile faded. Alex is going back to America. Okay. Their gaze is locked. He won't come near you again, Maceo said softly, and Ori nodded. I know. He hasn't tried. How's Netta? Going with him, I think. Good. Good she should, maybe she can help him sort his head out. Maceo gave a disgusted snort. I don't give a fuck what that Figlia di Portana does, as long as he never comes near you again. Ori felt unhappy. We don't know for sure that he's the killer, Maceo. Maceo said nothing. He stood and sat on the edge of the bed, carefully not to jostle her too much. Ori ran her hand along his muscled thigh. I miss you, she said. I know that doesn't make sense. I mean, I miss being physically close to you. Maceo hesitated, then maneuvered so he could sit on the bed next to her. I'm not hurting you. He put his arms around her, and she leaned into them. Not at all. Her head was on his chest, and he buried his face in her hair. Ti amo, Orianthi. Ti amo, mio caro. Two boys playing at the edge of the river Arno saw what they thought was a mannequin at first. When they realized it was the body of a young woman, they ran away yelling, and soon a crowd formed at the riverbank. The body was caught in some weeds, and when finally they managed to fish her out, they laid her body on the cold stone and waited for the police. At the morgue, the pathologist confirmed that the unidentified woman had been murdered, her throat cut. From the water and blood in her lungs, he told the police she had been stabbed and pushed immediately into the river, where blood loss and drowning had finally taken her life. Horrific, he said, shaking his head. Police tried to identify the woman, but after a few days they had to rely on the public, releasing a sketch of her to the news stations. Lucia stared in horror at the television, then grabbed her phone. Yes, she said. I know who the woman is. Her name is Cassie. Benoit laughed at Shiloh as she struggled into a t-shirt which stretched over her burgeoning belly. Nothing fits. Benoit was watching her from the bed as she peeled off her top. When we get back to Paris, Mon Amour, we'll have maternity clothes made for you by all the best designers. I'm sure Lysander would be delighted. Shiloh laugh, finally deciding on a loose-fitting top. Lysander has better things to do with his time. Did you know Kate is going to move down to Buenos Aires with him? Already? Benoit looked surprised, then laughed as Shiloh gave him an incredulous look. Yeah, I guess we're not the poster children for taking things slow, are we? Shiloh grinned and came to sit by him. We are most certainly not. And you know Benoit, given what I've seen Maceo and Ori go through, I've never been so thankful that we weren't careful. I have never been this happy or excited about the future. Benoit kissed her, placing his hand over the bump in her belly. Me neither. Look, I think we had better go back to Paris and figure out what to do. You still have your work in Africa, and we have to discuss living arrangements. Shiloh, I'm not wild about heavy security, but I think that until the killer is caught, we need to be extra vigilant. Maceo knows he made a mistake blowing off his security coming here, leaving Ori vulnerable. He'll never forgive himself for that, and I'm not prepared to make the same mistake. He could see the doubt in her eyes. I know it's asking a lot for someone as independent as you. So I'm not telling. I'm asking. Please let me do this. Shiloh nodded slowly. Okay. Okay then, Benoit. Gosh, I hope they get him soon. Me too, ma sure, me too. When Lucia came to tell him that Cassie had been murdered, Maceo barely acknowledged it. I don't care. I really don't. The police want to speak to you. Let them come. They talked to him about his whereabouts the night Cassie was killed, but he answered them in a monotone and, realizing he knew nothing about the murder, they released him. Hey you. It was a week later, 
and Ori was getting really sick of her hospital bed. At least today, they had let her shower, albeit with a nurse present. She had sent Maceo home for his own shower, a good meal and some sleep, but now she was bored, having finished the stack of paperbacks on the nightstand. She looked up and saw Seth at the door and grinned at him. Hey you! Tell me you brought me some contraband. He laughed and held up a cotton bag full of books. Oh gosh Seth Cantor, you are a lifesaver. That's not all, he said, bringing up a paper bag. I have fresh bread, cheese and some peaches. Ori moaned. Gosh, that sounds good. Shall we eat? Hell yes. As they ate, he studied her face. You look brighter. More awake. Ori yawned immediately, and he laughed. Sorry. Ori grinned wryly, sipped her soda and looked at Seth now, suddenly shy. Can I ask you something? Seth nodded. Anything. Why aren't you married? Lord, that came out wrong. I meant to say, you never mention any partners or girlfriends apart from Irina. I don't even know what you do for work. I apologize for being so self-involved. Can we start again? Seth put his hands up. Completely understandable. No need to apologize. It's been quite a ride since I met you, what with, anyway. To answer your questions. There have been women. Just not for a while, and none of them really well they weren't around for long. I've never felt the inclination to marry. Never met the right woman. He held her gaze for a beat too long, watching as two spots of pink flushed across her cheeks. She looked away, down at her food. And your job? He bowed his head. I am lucky enough to be, let's say, independently wealthy. That is lucky, she teased, and he laughed. That's not to say that I haven't worked hard, I have, it's in my nature. I can't sit still. Ori smiled at him. I always thought of you as the calm one, the one who the others look to. I know Maceo does. He's a good boy, Seth laughed. Man, how old did I sound just then? Ori chuckled. Grandad. She shifted, suddenly uncomfortable, and Seth noticed. Are you okay? Should I get a nurse? Ori shook her head, smiling. Don't worry, just a little stiff. I'm fine, Seth, truly. Seth sighed. I'll never forgive myself, Ori. Never. There's nothing to forgive, she assured him. I didn't even know it was happening, until it did. Seth didn't look convinced. Well, I'll let you rest. When are you going back to Montreal? When I'm not needed here. He got up and kissed the top of her head. You'll be okay until Maceo gets back? Of course. Thanks, Seth. I really enjoyed this. And thanks for the books. You don't know how bored I was. Ori smiled gratefully, and he flushed a little. My pleasure. Later, sweetheart. Later, dude. Ori was soon asleep and didn't wake even when the nurse came to check her vitals. When the door opened silently later in the afternoon, Ori was so deeply asleep that she didn't even feel it when the visitor touched her cheek. So lovely. He stared down at her. I did this. I'm the reason you are here, my darling Ori, do you know that? You weren't supposed to survive my knife. He heard voices outside and slipped out of the room, regretfully casting a last glance at the sleeping woman. A doctor passed him and stopped. Can I help you? The man looked at him without speaking and then turned and walked away. He strode out of the hospital and into the inky Florence night. New York, one month later? Netta grabbed her keys just as her cell phone buzzed. She smiled when she saw his name on the caller ID. Hey you. Hey. Seth's voice was warm, how are you? Missing you. I'm just on my way to see Alex. How's he doing? Netta sighed. Not great. He's lost Seth, utterly lost. She heard Seth's deep breath. Look, I'm going to fly down. Nothing's happening up here. I think I'm needed there. Always, Netta smiled. Hey, did you hear? Ori's being moved to a hospital in Venice. 
I did. It's great news. I know Maceo is delighted, he called me last night. Did you know they got married? Right there in the hospital a week ago. Maceo promised they would have a proper wedding when Ori is well enough, but they didn't want to wait anymore. So sweet. I must call them. Look, when will you be here? Shall I wait? No, I'll be a few hours yet. I'll meet you at Alex's. Okay, baby. I'll see you soon. Can't wait, she said, dropping her voice, her meaning clear, and she heard him chuckle. Me either. Alex Milland had locked himself away in his Vermont mansion, torturing himself, remembering when Ori stayed here, remembering the night he kissed her. There had been something there between them, he was sure. At least, the half-empty bottle of whiskey at his side made him sure. Damn you, Maceo, if you think I could hurt that beautiful girl, you're beautiful girl. He dropped his head into his hands. I don't know, I don't know. Did I try and kill her? Was it something I blanked out? Why was everyone else so convinced he'd done it, everyone apart from the police? And Netta. Yes, Netta thought he was innocent. But I don't know. Alex despaired. There had been times when he had experienced such violent jealousy over Maceo and his betrayal with Viola, only to then meet Ori. Why did Maceo deserve all the good luck? Screw you, Bartoli. Screw you. He threw his glass against the wall and gave a feral howl of rage. Alex? He spun around to see a shocked-looking Netta watching him. How long have you been standing there? Long enough. Alex, this has to stop. You need to stop drinking, you need to talk to Maceo. Why the fudge should I? He won Netta, he won everything. She is everything. Alex. Alex stopped ranting, shocked by Netta screaming at him. She came to him, her entire body trembling. This is not healthy, Alex. This, this is why he thinks you stabbed Ori. The old if I can't have her thing. Ori is not a possession, Alex Milland. She chooses to be with the man she loves, Maceo. Grow up and deal with it before you do something you regret. Alex stared at her for a second, and then he crumbled. Gosh. Gosh, Netta. He slumped into his chair, his face in his hands. Netta still reeling from his outburst, hesitated before sitting on the arm of his chair and putting her hand on his shoulder. She made him coffee and put him to bed. Alex passed out almost immediately, and the sudden silence made Netta feel lonely and sad. She tried to talk herself out of crying but when Seth arrived past midnight and she saw his questioning face, she burst into tears. Seth let her cry herself out. Then, as she wiped her eyes, she told him about what had happened. Seth listened, then kissed her forehead as she snuggled into his arms. Sweetheart, I think we have to face the fact that Alex needs help. Serious professional help. Netta was quiet for a time. Seth. I am beginning to think that. He might have done it. Seth finished and she nodded tears in her eyes. If he did, then he wasn't in his right mind, Netta. We need to get him help first and then we'll deal with the repercussions of what happened in Italy. Netta closed her eyes. Seth, what would I do without you? You'll never have to know, darling. Later, after she and Seth had gone to bed, after they made love and Seth was asleep, Netta lay awake. After a few minutes, she got up and went to grab a glass of milk from the kitchen. She sighed. Maybe Seth was right. Alex needed help, badly. His reaction tonight about Ori, she would talk to him, she decided, and ask him to seek help. She poured the rest of her drink down the sink, and padded back to the bedroom. Sliding underneath the covers, she curled herself around Seth's sleeping form and closed her eyes. Ori was walking now, tentatively working with the new clinic's people. You were lucky that your spine wasn't compromised, they told her, but every step was agony. Still, the sooner she could prove to them that she was getting better, the sooner she could leave and go home. Go home to my husband, she grinned to herself, looking at the simple white gold band on her ring finger. Maceo had kept his promise. 
They had married in a simple ceremony in the chapel of the hospital with Lucia as their weeping witness. Simple vows, but the love between them had radiated throughout. Shame we have to put off our wedding night, she grumbled later as Maceo helped her back into bed. He grinned. Believe me, Mio Caro, I too am looking forward to the day I can take this beautiful body to bed. Ori giggled at his face. You're talking about your own body there, aren't you? Maceo laughed. Well, of course. No, I mean this body, and he ran his hand up her inner thigh so close to her sex that she sighed happily. Higher, she said, gazing into his eyes and smiling, Maceo began to caress her, his thumb stroking her button through her panties, then slipping inside them to stroke her. Ori wriggled happily, wincing when she pulled on her abdomen. SSSH, Mio Amori, just lay back and let your husband take care of things. His voice was a husky whisper. Ori closed her eyes and let Maceo stroke her into a mellow orgasm, endorphins flooding her system. Afterward, they lay together on her bed and slept, determined to spend their wedding night close. Now, Ori reflected on everything that had happened in the last year. So much pain but so much joy. New friends, old enemies, new enemies. She thought about Alex, unlike Maceo, she still wasn't convinced that he was her attacker. She kept returning to the killer's kiss. Alex had kissed her before, and she couldn't quite reconcile the two. It simply hadn't felt the same. You'll make yourself crazy thinking like that. She shook her head. Maceo had kept Cassie's murder from her for weeks, and it was only when Lucia let it slip that she had been shocked to find out about it. Maceo hadn't been pleased and had dismissed Ori's questions. No one knows who she was meeting that night. Whoever it was who killed her, Maceo said, had done them all a favor. Ori was a little shocked at his callousness, but when she asked Lucia about it, Lucia was equally hard. She came to here to find out if you were dead, Ori. She was hopeful. She was never your friend. She probably just got caught up with the wrong guy. But it bugged Ori. What if Cassie had known who stabbed Ori? Or was working with him? She asked the questions of her psychiatrist, but the doctor was more interested in how Ori herself was dealing with the trauma of being an almost murder victim. I'm fine, she told him. I've accepted it. The psychiatrist didn't seem convinced. You've been through more this year than most do in a lifetime. Give yourself time. Now Ori was desperate to get back to her life. She felt as if she could barely remember her home, her home with Maceo, their private hideaway. Too many people were in and out of her life here. She knew Maceo felt it too. She asked the doctor when she would be released, and they prevaricated until she thought she might break and yell at them. Ori knew her injuries would take months, years to completely recover from, but she was getting antsy. She asked Lucia to bring her some work, and although Maceo objected, she told him firmly that she was going to do it regardless. It made her feel as if things were settling back to normal. She also missed Seth's company. In a strange way he felt like an older brother, a confidant, someone she could tell anything to. He emailed her from Montreal with funny stories and pictures, and Ori knew Maceo was grateful to his friend. Three weeks after she had transferred to the Venice Clinic, the doctors gave her the good news, she could be discharged. Ori was overjoyed, and when Maceo came to pick her up she threw herself into his arms. Now don't get carried away, the doctor warned, grinning. You're still healing, so just take it easy. Ori rolled her eyes, but Maceo nodded, taking the doctor's words seriously. Ori sighed. Yes, but how long before we can? The doctor smothered a grin. You're good to um go if you take things slowly. Maceo was still laughing as he drove her home. You are insatiable. Ori was grinning. I want to have intimacy with my husband, is that so bad? Not bad, not bad at all, Maceo winked at her. The apartment did feel strange, but Ori couldn't care less. She dragged Maceo into the bedroom and started to pull his clothes off. Maceo took her by the shoulders. We're doing this slow, okay? She grumbled, but Maceo insisted, and to his credit, 
he made it one of the most sensual experiences of her life. Burying his face in her kitty. Ori moaned happily as they began to make love slowly, Maceo being careful not to strain her tender muscles. They drove each other to ecstasy, and then collapsed happily. At last, Ori breathed, and felt Maceo's deep laugh rumble through his chest. I know what you mean. Bella, nothing will ever separate us again, I swear it. Agreed. Agreed times infinity, she smiled up at him. I love you, Mr. Bartoli. Ti amo, Ori, ti amo. Kate told her employer that she was leaving, and he nodded sadly. I thought when you met Mr. Duarte that this might happen. Kate looked upset. I'm sorry, Jerry, but we just decided to live together in Buenos Aires. I've been scouting positions down there, it's just easier for me to move than Lysander. I know, Jerry said with a smile, and please don't apologize for being happy. It's too rare in this world. She told Lysander over dinner. I will really miss Jerry and everyone. Lysander took her hand. Don't think I don't appreciate the sacrifice you're making. One day I promise the roles will be reversed. She smiled. As long as I'm with you, I don't care. They chatted casually about the logistics of moving her life down to Argentina, then went to bed and made love. Afterward, Kate snuggled into his arms. Did you speak to Alex? Lysander sighed. He's a mess. Netta told me he's seeking help, but it'll be a long road. Whether or not we'll ever find who tried to kill Ori, I don't know. Kate propped herself up on her elbow. Did you check the website today? Lysander shook his head. It's gone, Kate told him and watched his eyes widen. Gone. The police called me today. I'd put in a query about tracing it, but they told me they were unable to help because it's gone. Wiped from the net every trace. Funny that should happen just as Alex seeks help, don't you think? Lysander was silent but met her gaze. Kate could see the pain in his eyes and she stroked his face. I'm sorry, my love. I know you didn't want to think of him like that. Lysander closed his eyes and pulled her closer, and they held each other for the rest of the night. Netta finished work and left her studio just after five. She had rented the small room in the local town, a few minutes from Alex's place in Vermont, so she could stay with him and keep him steady. The night was dark and cold, and she was glad when she arrived home. No lights were on, which she found strange. Pushing open the front door, she called out for Alex and got no reply. She walked through the dark house calling for him but found no answer. She could see the light on in the drawing room at the end of the corridor and walked towards it, but as she pushed the door open and saw what was inside, she gasped in horror, just as a hand with a cloth soaked in chemicals was clamped over her nose and mouth. Just before she passed out, she finally realized the truth about Alex. Shiloh had returned to Africa and to her work, but she knew her heart lay in Paris with Benoit. Regretfully, she gave notice and headed back to France, eager to start their life together. Benoit was overjoyed. Their daughter was growing and healthy, and he found himself preoccupied with his new life. He began to make changes at work, inspired by Shiloh's passion for environmentalism, and although his colleagues chafed a little, they soon discovered that their work and social responsibility could work to their advantage. Everything was working out great. There was just one loose end as far as Benoit was concerned. Marcella. Since everything had happened, he could not stop thinking about that night when Shiloh had left and he had turned to Marcella. The guilt he felt over how he had treated both women was eating him alive, and there was the fear that Marcella, out of jealousy, could still tell Shiloh what had happened. He called Marcella, and she invited him to coffee at her place. Benoit wondered at the sense of going to her place, but accepted anyway. Marcella opened the door to him, and to his relief her smile was friendly but not malicious. It's good to see you, Benoit. You look stunning, Marcella. She was wearing a dark red dress, her brown hair gathered in an elegant chignon. She inclined her head. As do you. Please come in. She made them both coffee, a rich dark blend, 
and they chatted idly before Marcella met his gaze. And how is your lovely Shiloh? She is very well, thanks. And the baby? Benoit nodded warily. Good, um, as far as the scan says, anyway. Do you have it with you? He hesitated, his eyes wary. Really? You want to see it? She nodded encouragingly, and he shyly brought his wallet out. He passed the scan to her, watching her face as she took it. She swallowed, then gave a little laugh. Okay, well, you're going to have to show me what end is what. He laughed too then, and pointed out the fetus, an amorphous thing at the corner of the scan. Marcella saw his expression change, a sort of awe in his voice. The realization at once made her sad for herself, and happy for him. It's a she, Benoit said, and she saw the love in his eyes. You want this child, don't you? she asked softly. He nodded, smiling sheepishly. I do. I didn't at first, but then gosh, seeing this. That's my little girl in there. Bewildered joy. She felt tears pricking her eyes and he frowned. I'm sorry. She shook her head. No, don't be, these are happy tears. I'm honestly happy for you, Benoit. She looked at the photo again, traced the outline of the fetus. You'll be a great father, the very best. I can't say I'm not a little surprised by the turn of events, but I really do congratulate you. You found her. You found the one. Like you told me to, he said gently, and she nodded. I did. And I'm sorry about before, Benoit. I admit I was jealous. Very jealous. She laughed softly. I had thought our arrangement would carry on forever. But it was not to be. I really do wish you and Shiloh a very happy life. And don't worry, our little meeting will never be mentioned by me again. Benoit walked back to his office slowly. Despite his gratitude at Marcella's words, he still felt uneasy. He tried to pin down why. Shiloh was back in Paris and healthy, they were happy and living together was working out, the baby was good, so why did he feel like something bad was about to happen? Shiloh noticed his strange mood when he came home from work, and at first he avoided her questions but then asked her to sit with him. Marcella's promise to keep their assignation a secret was good, but he could not start his new life with Shiloh with a lie. Haltingly, he told her about the night she had left for Africa, how he had gone to Marcella just to talk but had in fact slept with her. Shiloh listened, her face pale. After he finished, he studied her reaction. Shiloh? You know I would never cheat on you. Never. That night. I don't know what happened. I was mixed up, stupid. I wanted you to know, because I want to be totally honest with you, and that's new to me. I don't usually let myself become open to anyone. Shiloh nodded slowly. Thank you for telling me. I just need some time to process it. Of course. They lay side by side in bed that night, both of them awake until Shiloh suddenly turned to him and rested her head on his chest. Benoit felt a sudden rush of relief, and he wrapped his arms around her, thinking that everything was good and he could relax. He had no idea that he would soon receive some of the worst news of his life. Netta was tied to the chair, shivering and terrified, but determined not to show him how scared she was. He'd stripped her down to her underwear now, and his hands roamed freely over her skin. So soft, he cooed in a sing-song voice almost tender. She could almost believe him to be that caring, if it wasn't for the crossbow in his other hand. He saw her looking at him and grinned. He brought it up and leveled it at her. Point blank. Tell me you love me, he said tenderly, and she looked him straight in the eye. No. Her voice was strong and defiant. He smiled. What a waste of such beauty, he said, and fired the bolt deep into her body. The pain was unimaginable. Netta screamed as the bolt sank deep into her flesh, her blood beginning to flow. Tell me you love me. Panting for air, she looked up at him, her hatred radiating from her. No. You are not worthy of anyone's love. Not Viola's. Not Ori's. Not mine. He smiled. Viola's dead. 
Ori will be dead soon. You will be dead even sooner. Netta, despite her fear, smirked. Poor little lonely boy. You're pathetic. That got him. He ripped the bolt from her and used it as a knife, driving it again and again into her soft flesh. Netta felt her life slipping away from her as the blackness loomed. He pushed the chair she was strapped to onto the floor and Netta struggled to take one, two, three more breaths, and then there was just emptiness. Kate and Lysander were woken by a terrific banging on Kate's apartment door. Lysander opened it to see Seth, his usual tall frame bent over with grief, his eyes haunted. Seth, brother, what is it? Kate watched as Lysander pulled Seth into the apartment and walked him to the couch. Seth almost fell down on it. Kate and Lysander shared a look of concern. Seth, what's happened? Seth looked sick. Ned is dead. Alex killed her and then hanged himself. Jesus, Jesus. Lysander and Kate looked appalled as Seth began to sob. Seth hugged Ori and Maceo as they arrived at the funeral home. Both of them were startled by Seth's gray face, and Ori felt tears pricking her eyes. So much loss. Netta's funeral. The medical examiner had finally released her body to be buried. Alex was still being examined. He stabbed her to death and then hanged himself, Seth kept saying in an almost disbelieving tone. Why didn't he just kill himself? Why take her with him? Ori leaned against him. I'm so sorry, Seth. He put his arm around her. Thank you for coming, Ori. I know you must be exhausted. I'm fine, Seth, really. I'm worried about you. Seth looked at Maceo. Well, at least we can say it's over now. Maceo nodded. But what a price. What a price. Ori and Maceo held hands throughout the funeral service. Despite his rage at Alex and his certainty that he was behind Ori's attack and Viola's death, Ori knew Maceo was suffering. Alex had been his brother for so many years. What the hell had set him off? She knew Maceo blamed himself. If he hadn't slept with Viola, maybe none of this would have happened. They stayed with Seth at the home he had rented in New York, out of the city. I think I feel closer to Netta here, he said, as if in explanation. And Kate and Lysander are here for a couple more weeks. Maceo told him they would stay in New York too for as long as he needed, and Seth had grinned ruefully. I'm surprised your business is still up and running, but I'm grateful. It was in the second week that Maceo got the call from the police in Vermont. They had some questions and wanted to ask someone close to Alex Milland, could he come up? Maceo said he could, wondering why they hadn't asked Seth. The police office had hesitated and asked Maceo to keep his visit a secret. He told Ori that he needed to go see a client and she nodded. I'll go see Seth and keep him company. Good idea. He drove Ori to Seth's house and kissed her goodbye. I'll be back this evening, I love you. He took his private jet up to Vermont and talked to the policeman in charge of the investigation. We found a witness who spotted someone at the Milland house carrying a crossbow. Not this time, but when Viola Redman was murdered. Well dressed tall dark. The witness also claims he saw the same man in the local town the day Alex Milland allegedly killed his sister. We want you to talk to him. Maceo nodded. He realized they wanted him to be seen by the witness. He didn't care. He knew he hadn't been anywhere near the house when Alex and Netta died or when Viola was murdered. No problem. The police officers exchanged a look. Let's do it. The witness was an old Chinese man who shook Maceo's hand somberly. I don't know what else to tell you, I haven't seen the man much. Alex Milland? No, so I don't know if he is the same man. Maceo nodded. Do you mind if I talk to you for a while? He turned to the detectives. Could you find me something? I have an idea. Seth had taken her out to lunch, but Ori was uneasy. All morning he had been in a strange mood, almost hyperactive, his eyes darting everywhere. Ori wondered with a shock if he was on something. Netta's death had obviously hit him for six. Seth, 
Why don't we go back home and maybe you can rest a while? No, I'm fine. How's your crab salad? She looked down at her plate, she'd barely touched it. I guess I'm not hungry. Seth reached over to take her hand but Ori, not thinking, jerked it away. Are you okay, princess? Princess? Okay, this was getting weirder. Ori tried to smile. Yes, fine. He searched her face. You don't seem fine. You seem afraid. With a shock, Ori realized that was just how she felt, and she couldn't explain it. It was a gnawing feeling in the pit of her stomach. No, of course not. Even to her own ears she sounded fake. Seth laughed, but it was without humor. He glanced at her, his eyes searching her face. You can't possibly consider that I would harm you in any way? Ori couldn't help the thought that slammed into her mind. Yes. She drew in a sharp breath, and as his eyes narrowed she struggled to keep her face blank. Her hesitation was a beat too long. No, I... He let her hand go and sat back, hurt flashing across his face. You do. My God. Guilt flooded through her. No, of course not. I'm sorry. You think I'm capable of doing those horrific things? Incredulity, his voice rising. She shook her head, trying to meet his eyes. A couple on another table was looking at them curiously, and she felt her face burn. Seth. I please let's talk about something else. But we're not talking. You've barely said a word all morning. He leaned in, lowered his voice. Are you worried I'm going to stab you to death, Ori? It was a growl, his face contorted. Are you scared I might eviscerate you? Cut you open like Alex did? Icy drops of terror went down her spine. She couldn't look away from his gaze. The other couple was staring at them and Seth turned his head and glared at them. Something interesting. His fierce eyes bored into them, unblinking, the pupils so constricted they had almost disappeared. The couple looked away quickly, clearly disturbed. Seth continued to stare at them until they got up and left, the woman casting anxious glances at Ori. Ori was mortified. She got up and strode out of the restaurant, away from him, away from the violence of that moment. She walked blindly, automatically toward the parking lot. She had to get away from him. Her breaths came in short, sharp gasps, fear and embarrassment a churning mass inside her. Seth caught up to her. She wrenched her arm from his grasp, but he stopped her. I'm sorry, please, Ori. I'm sorry. He was breathing hard, his face red. I'm so sorry. I'm just so. I can't believe you'd even consider that of me. I'm just hurt. He stepped closer to her but didn't touch her. I'm hurt because you mean more to me than anyone ever has. I mean it. You are my family. I can't imagine what it would be like to lose you. Please don't push me away. Please. Look, let's go home and talk. Without waiting for her answer, he took her arm and led her back to his car. The detective came in and handed Maceo the photo. Maceo glanced at it. All five of them, every member of the Midnight Club. He felt sadness as he looked at them. Before all of this. Happy. Laughing. Brotherhood. He swallowed the lump in his throat. Mr. Wu, when you say you saw a man with a crossbow, is he in this photograph? He handed the man the photo and waited. With a sinking heart, he watched the man nod. Yes, yes. I do. He waved a shaking finger towards the photo. Maceo closed his eyes briefly, then said to the detective, There you have it. Proof that Alex was the killer. Good riddance to the son of a bitch. The detective focused on Mr. Wu. Mr. Wu, do you mean this man? He indicated Alex, standing in the center of the group, flanked by Maceo and Benoit. No, no. The man pulled on Maceo's shirt as he turned to him. Not this man, this man. Maceo's blood turned to ice as he saw who the man was identifying. Everything he knew was wrong. His heart banged against his chest and he felt lightheaded. Oh gosh no. Because the man Wu identified 
was the one person he could have sworn would never have done this. The one person who they all relied on. The person that at this very moment was with the love of Maceo's life. The man who had already tried to kill her. Seth. Panting for air, Netta looked up at him, her hatred radiating from her. No. You are not worthy of anyone's love. Not Viola's. Not Ori's. Not mine. Seth smiled. Viola's dead. Ori will be dead soon. You will be dead even sooner. Netta, despite her fear, smirked. Poor little lonely boy. You're pathetic. That got him. Seth ripped the bolt from her and used it as a knife, driving it again and again into her. He could hear her moans growing weaker, her life slipping away from her. Collateral damage, he thought. As he pushed the chair over and let her bleed out on the floor, he looked at her coldly. She'd been a good intimacy partner, a beautiful distraction from the nearly overwhelming urge to kill Ori. Nothing could compare to that night in the car, Ori's gasp of shock as he plunged his knife into her soft belly. He relived it every moment. Seth coolly watched Netta die, then settled into the armchair to await Alex. Poor misunderstood Alex. How he played right into Seth's hands. A half hour later, he heard Alex's car on the driveway and got up. Less than two minutes later, Alex's howl of grief when he found his sister dead, then as Seth, coming at him from behind, looped the rope around his neck, finally the understanding in his eyes. When Alex was dead, Seth had made it look like he'd hanged himself. More collateral damage. But Maceo needed to be sure Ori was safe, or Seth would never get to her again. And that wasn't acceptable. Ori was going to die, one way or another. They had driven back to Seth's in silence, Ori increasingly uncomfortable. You should have stayed in the city, stayed in public. Too late now. At home, as Seth followed her in and shut the door behind them, it sounded to Ori like a prison cell. Why? Why was she feeling like this? She turned to Seth. Seth, I'm going to take a nap, okay? Sure. It was the expression in his eyes, amused, malicious. She'd never seen him like this before. Okay, well, I'll see you later. It happened so quickly, but when it did, Ori felt like she'd been hit with a sledgehammer. She had turned her head just as Seth had leaned in to kiss her cheek. Instead his lips brushed hers and she gasped, a torrent of memories crashing back. Seth's head snapped back and their eyes locked. At that moment, he realized she knew. This is how I show my love. Ori couldn't breathe. Seth. Friendly, steady, trustworthy Seth had been the one who had stabbed her, who had killed Viola and Netta and framed Alex. And she was trapped here, alone with the killer. Maceo was beside himself. Seth. The police had jumped into action, working with their New York counterparts, and soon Maceo was in a police helicopter being flown back to Seth's house. He tried again and again to call Ori's cell phone, but there was no answer. Please, please don't let me be too late. Ori, please fight. Fight. Ori darted for the door, panicked, but he was too quick, too strong for her. Hush, he said now, locking his arms around her. Hush. This needn't be scary, Ori. Honestly, just resign yourself to it. Ori looked up at him, fear mixed with anger. You stabbed me. Yes. Why? Seth smiled and kissed her, she spat in his face. He merely laughed, easily holding her with one massive arm while he tugged the tie from his neck and started to bind her hands behind her. Because I wanted to, Orianthi. Look at you. He tugged her in front of the mirror and stood behind her. Look how beautiful you are. He ripped her dress open and ran his hand over her belly, the livid scars from his knife still bright pink and healing. Eleven. I like the symmetry of that. He put his mouth to her ear. And soon my darling Ori, soon number 12, 13, 14. He was going to kill her. Ori almost laughed. Of course he's going to kill you, you damn fool. Fight, you don't get to win this one, Seth Cantor. Blindside him. She turned in his arms and went into survival mode. She smiled up at him. 
You don't know me well enough yet, Seth. Why didn't you tell me you wanted me? Seth wasn't so easily fooled. Ori, I know you love Maceo, why else do you think I tried to kill you? I knew you'd never want me. She lowered her head, but looked up through her eyelashes at him. Like I said, she said in a soft whisper, you don't know me as well as you should. She stood on her toes and nuzzled his nose briefly before brushing her lips against his. If you're going to kill me anyway, you're right. This doesn't have to be scary. It could be pleasurable. Please, please fall for it, please. Ori knew she would do anything to stay alive, even if it meant having intimacy with this monster. She'd done it before and survived, after all. Seth, his expression blank, stared down at her, then cupped her breasts in his hands. If you're lying to me, Orianthi, I will gut you like a pig. Try me, she whispered. Seth gave a growl and tumbled her to the floor, tugging at her underwear. Ori slammed hard against the marble, but felt the tie binding her hands give. Her still healing abdominal muscles screamed with pain, but she played her part well, moaning sensually, kissing Seth. I'm still going to kill you, pretty girl, he grunted. Ori had no fear left, even at his words, his threats. She felt her hands free themselves as Seth came, and she winced at the feeling of his semen shooting into her. Gosh, I'm sorry, Maceo, I'm so sorry. At the moment of Seth's orgasm, when he was at his most vulnerable, when his eyes were closed, Ori made her move. She whipped his tie around his throat and kicking him out of her, she braced herself against his chest as she throttled him, using her body weight to tighten the cord. Seth struggled, roaring, and Ori didn't know if she could hang on but her anger, her fear, her love for Maceo and the desire to live for him, made her strong. She pulled and pulled, using everything inside her until she felt him weaken. She didn't let up, knowing he could be faking it, until his entire body went slack. She kept pulling even when he collapsed on top of her, his eyes bulging, his tongue protruding from his mouth. Then, finally satisfied he was dead, Ori kicked him off of her and scrambled to pull her underwear on. Running through the house, she began to sob, not for herself but for everyone who had died because of that monster. Poor Alex. Viola. Netta. Ori. Maceo's voice echoed through the empty house, and Ori stumbled towards the sound of his voice. Maceo. Ori. She could hear sirens now, so close to safety, so close to love. Then she heard Seth's roar and knew she hadn't killed him, and now he was coming for her. She heard him storming after her, and when the first crossbow bolt hit the wall beside her, she faltered. Don't give up, don't give up. Ori. This time it was Seth roaring her name, his voice bruised and gravelly. Murderous. If she stalled for one second, she would be dead. She heard Maceo's desperate shouts for her, and as she reached the front door finally and wrenched it open, she could see her lover running towards her, coming to save her, followed by shouting police officers. A sudden searing, burning pain hit her right kidney, and she knew she'd been hit, but staggered out of the door, throwing herself down the stone steps into Maceo's arms. He's coming, she managed to say to him, seeing the panic in his green eyes. Seconds later, Seth came raging from the building, dropping the crossbow and barreling into the couple. All three were sent sprawling to the gravel. Maceo shoved Ori away, before he set upon Seth again. Ori crawled away, groping around to her back and giving a scream wrenched the bolt from her flesh. She could feel sticky blood on her hands but ignored it. She heard shouting, more sirens, but all she could think of was getting to Maceo, helping to fight Seth, saving at least one of them. Maceo was pounding on Seth, but the other man managed to flip him and plowed his fist into Maceo's jaw. But Maceo was raging, his adrenaline flooding his system, and he once again got the advantage, yelling in Italian, then in English. Non sarai mai takari di nuovo il suo, figlio di una cagna. You'll never touch her again, you son of a bitch. Seth kicked him away and staggered to his feet, reaching into his pocket and bringing out the gun, leveling it at Maceo. Maceo stared at his friend, the friend who was aiming the gun at his chest, and he shook his head. So, this is the way it ends? His friend nodded. This is the way it ends. 
There was a long silence, as if his friend couldn't decide whether to pull the trigger or not. He decided to take the chance and ask the question he so desperately needed the answer to. Then why all this, old friend? I get framing Alex, but why kill Netta? Why did she have to die? Why stab Ori? She did nothing wrong except love me with her whole heart, and you butchered her. Seth smiled. You don't get it, do you? She was dead the second you touched her. And now I'm going to kill both of you. And he pulled the trigger. Maceo threw himself to the floor as behind Seth, a furious and desperate Ori tackled him. She leaped onto his back as lithe as a monkey and clawed at his face. Seth's gun went skittering across the ground as Maceo launched an attack from the front. Seth threw Ori to the ground hard, and Maceo yelled his anger, crashing into Seth with all of his strength. As Seth fought back, Ori managed to stand up and stagger towards the two men. Seth had Maceo's throat and was squeezing, his eyes bulging with the effort. Ori saw his fingers digging into Maceo's windpipe. Maceo choked, and Ori gave a banshee yell and threw herself at Seth, raising the bloody crossbow bolt he had shot her with. She brought it down hard, not caring where it hit him as long as he released Maceo. Maceo, freed, jerked away from Seth, and then pulled a bloody dory away from him too. Seth's limbs were jerking, spasming. Death throws. Ori had slammed the bolt through Seth's eye into his brain. It was over. Maceo wrapped his arms around her as the adrenaline left them both, and they held each other as the police arrived to help them. You and me, Bella, Maceo whispered to her as she was loaded into the ambulance, you and me forever now. And Ori smiled just once before she passed out. Two years later, Shiloh hoisted Lily onto her hip, ignoring the toddler's whining, and went out into the garden. Benoit, tanned and smiling from a week in Monte Carlo, came to kiss her and relieve her of their child. Lily giggled as her father threw her into the air and caught her. Tell me all kids are like that, said a heavily pregnant Kate as she moved her chair out of the Argentinian sun. Shiloh laughed. You wouldn't say that if you knew what the little horror was really like. She sat down with her friends and looked at her watch. I hope Ori and Maceo won't be too long, lunch is nearly ready. Lysander rolled his eyes. You know what they're like probably stop to have intimacy along the way. Even now, they're rolling around in a field of pampas grass. They all laughed. Good grief, what a pair of kids. About time they had themselves some kids. Kate nodded sagely, but a grinning Shiloh poked her. You just want everyone to suffer along with you. I don't blame you, I was the same. She was, she almost broke my hand in the delivery room. Benoit put his arm around his fiancée, who poked her tongue out at him. Mr. Duarte, I think your guests are here. The maid smiled at him, and Lysander thanked her. Ori and Maceo joined them, smiling, happy, holding hands. The friends greeted them. Then Kate, ever watchful, started to laugh. What is it? Ori looked confused. Do I have something in my teeth? Kate shook her head and reached to pluck something out of Ori's hair. She held it up. No, sweetheart. You just have some pampas grass in your hair. The End We hope you enjoyed this audiobook.